Chapter 201. Return. Part 4. For a brief moment, it was as if the whole world was burning. It lasted only three seconds as the light descended from the heavens. However, its destructive ability was beyond imagination. The blast created from the center of the bombed area extended out for a radius of several kilometers. Everything within its range was burned. Moreover, the heat wave affected a much larger area as it shook the forest. The sound, vibration and heat wave probably reached the western border fortress. From the moment Azel confronted the tree god, his party members had run away, but they weren't able to escape the aftereffect of the explosion. What would have happened if Laura hadn't put a dimensional distortion field around them? My god, Laura became overwhelmed at what she had just done. The weapon of destruction was the chalice holding the tear of the heavens. If their initial plan hadn't worked, Laura had been tasked to buy some time, so she had prepared the heavens tier beforehand. After she started being tracked down by her enemies, she started experimenting with this technique. She had used it in small scale to increase her proficiency. The technique worked best in the day when the sky was clear. This was the first time she had used ample power through this technique. The result made her blood run cold. I see why Azel said that we can't hand over the Vitans' chalice to our enemies. This really explains a lot. Chiron spoke with a trembling voice. It wasn't just Laura. Her comrades turned pale when they saw the great destruction caused by Laura. If such an attack was used against a large army, a single blast could kill several thousand troops. If such an attack fell in middle of a city, they didn't want to imagine such a scenario. The more scary part was the fact that Laura hadn't used the Heaven's Tear at full power. If she waited a little bit more, she wouldn't have needed to focus her attack in one place. She could have destroyed everything on a grand scale. It would have been several times stronger than the current attack. Light shot into the air from within the boiling heat. Several fragments of light created by the Heaven's Tear gathered in one place, and they split into countless streaks of light. It was as L. He was trying to manifest the sun lightsaber using the sky splitter. He was able to easily withstand that attack using the unyielding fortress. Leticia expressed her surprise. When the party started running away, Azel remained. He stayed behind to find out the true nature of the tree god. When the attack started, he had left behind only his clones. He had used the storm dragon's wings to fly into the sky. The sky was safer than the ground but he couldn't avoid the aftereffects of the explosion. However, the dragon weapon called Unyielding Fortress had kept him completely unharmed. Leticia spoke. We should move closer now. I'll lead. Her dragon's soul twitched as cold air was emitted into her surrounding. The heat, which had been boiling like magma, cooled in an instant. The party charged forward. It happened at that moment. Suddenly, Yuren's eyes turned round. Ah! What's wrong? Chiron was puzzled as he turned around. His confusion deepened when he saw Yuren's expression. Yuren. Yuren's face had turned pale. It was strange. The whole party was on high alert, yet they couldn't feel any danger. Azel was preparing the sun lightsaber, and he caught sight of the tree god, who had taken critical damage from the heaven's tear. Since the location of the regenerating tree god was located, he had to use the extreme extinction before the tree god recovered. The business here would come to an end. So why was Euron making such an expression? Euron looked anxious, but it was something more. He looked afraid. Ah, no, Euron, please explain what is going on. Azel, run away, Chiron asked in a calm voice, but his voice didn't reach Euron. Since the moment Euron had joined up with their party, Euron had never shown panic before. Azel, Euron was desperate as he tried to contact Azel with his magic. However, his actions were fruitless. The aftereffects of the heaven's tear had completely messed up the nearby flow of magic. Euron looked like he was about to pass out. Laura grabbed his shoulder. A desperate voice leaked out of him. Laura, you have to immediately use your dimensional distortion. You have to save Azel, or you can send me towards him. Wait a moment. Let's calmly. Laura was taken aback, but she couldn't finish her words. In that moment, the light that had been streaking across the sky stopped. Thunder exploded, 
and the sound of thunder shook the nearby region. Then, Azel, from within the dispersing light, a smoking Azel fell from the sky. Laura didn't hesitate as she used all her power to use the dimensional distortion. In a flash, she jumped a distance of one kilometer. She didn't rest as she used the dimensional distortion again. When she approached Azel, she pulled Azel towards her using the dimensional distortion. Then she used another technique. Vitten's maze. Space rippled, and a strange sight was seen. It was as if a space was isolated by piecing together countless tiles of glass. As the user of the Vitten's chalice, the technique allowed her to create a stage where she held an absolute edge. However, when she was about to finish making this space, she heard a sound. It was a clear sound. It was as if a glass had been broken. Laura's eyes widened. The Vitten's maze was unraveling. How? This had never happened before. Azel had broken the Vitten's chalice, but it was done through the special property of the sky splitter. However, he hadn't destroyed the dimensional distortion itself. Currently, someone had used magic to interfere with the Vitten's chalice dominion over space. Moreover, someone had been successful in cancelling the Vitten's maze before it could be completed. Another dimensional distortion was placed in the same place to cancel both dimensional distortion. Laura's Vitten's maze hadn't been meddled with. However, someone had read the when and where her Vitten's maze would be completed. Another dimensional distortion was placed in the same location to block her from finishing her technique. We have to run away. Larua immediately came to that decision. In the past, she couldn't use dimensional distortion while she was using the Vitten's maze. However, her skill had improved markedly. She was able to use the countless dimensional distortion-related techniques imbued within the Vitten's chalice. She was able to use them at the same time. Laura used the endless planes as she tried to retreat. Once again, someone interfered with her technique. The endless plane was broken. What a ridiculous ability. Who's doing this? Laura despaired. Laura was probably one of the best magicians of this era. After joining Azel's party, her abilities had rapidly progressed. Her increase in skill mainly dealt with the techniques used with the Vitten's chalice, but she had exchanged many information with the magicians within the Alberton forest. She had received Carlos magic tome. She had grown as a magician. Even if one put aside her battle capabilities, her abilities as a magician exceeded the skills of the survivors of the Dragon Demon War, who resided within the Plane of Darkness. She was sure of this. Azel was of the same opinion. However, her skin crawled when she witnessed this unknown being's skill. Her dimensional distortion had been dismissed. It was such a sophisticated way to use to use one's magical energy. As a magician, she wanted to someday be able to use magic like that. There wasn't a single waste of magical energy. It was the pinnacle of efficiency. I'm being watched. The endless plane was broken but she was successful in leaping across space. She had moved a distance of one kilometer, and she immediately sensed the gaze of her opponents on her. Laura went cold all over when she witnessed what occurred next. She couldn't block it. Her opponent had identified where she would appear, and he had prepared an attack. It didn't matter how fast her reaction was. She couldn't respond. At the very least, I have to. She had to protect Azel, who was in her arms. With such thought in mind, she was about to use her magic. Let's stop being so boorish towards her. She remembered that voice. Sir Ragus, thank you for remembering me, miss. Ragus was descending from a faraway distance. He must have jumped from a high elevation. When he landed on the ground, an explosive sound rang out as the ground shook. He sauntered out of the hole he had created. He hadn't taken any damage from the fall. Afterwards, Two more figures descended from the sky. Unlike Ragus, they descended in a controlled manner. Sir Almeric. Laura mumbled her words as if she was groaning. One of them was Almeric. His one remaining red eye was looking at her. There was an unknown figure next to him. He wore a black coat, and a hood was placed over his head. A magical power created a curtain of darkness, so one couldn't see his face. Laura's eyes couldn't penetrate that darkness. A voice flowed out from beyond the darkness. I don't plan on killing him. What the hell is it? Laura was taken aback. She couldn't tell the gender of the voice. 
When she heard the voice for the first time, she noticed the calmness of the voice. However, she became confused afterwards. She couldn't tell if it was a voice of a male or a female. She couldn't tell if the voice was high or low. He is messing with my senses. How can this be? It wasn't just his face. He was somehow stopping her from identifying his voice. How could he do that when Laura was a high-ranked magician? Regus spoke. You've always been a lout. After several hundred years, a possibility of a dramatic reunion was set up. You messed it all up by sniping him. Your aesthetic is lacking. I'm sorry. It couldn't be helped since the situation was dire. It was an inevitable sacrifice. I could stop him. So I did. If I didn't, wouldn't that have been more foolish? There must have been another way. A. I shouldn't have said anything. Regus expressed his annoyance. The other being sounded embarrassed. I'm sorry for not respecting your aesthetic. I'm pretty sure I did something similar in the past. I'll be careful in the future. Will you forgive me? You say such hopeless things. Regus grumbled as he kicked a nearby boulder. A loud sound rang out as the boulder was broken into pieces. Afterwards, the other members of Azul's party arrived. Everyone had a stiff expression as they surveyed their three enemies. Amongst them, Yuran had a pale face, and his body was shaking a little bit. The hooded being showed interest in the dragon souls of Chiron and Leticia. What are those? Laura, how's Azel? Chiron ignored the question as he asked Laura a question. Laura, who had been frozen, became alert. He is still alive. She quickly assessed Azul's situation. Something had penetrated his body. It was smaller than a finger. Fortunately, it had missed the heart. Also, the damage caused by the thunder was comparably minor. However, this didn't mean he was in a good state. It didn't simply penetrate his body. The item, which had passed through Azul's body, had been infused with a powerful curse. At the same time as it penetrated Azul's body, the curse had invaded Azul's energy pulse. It made it so that Azel couldn't properly regulate his magical energy. It was dangerous. As a high rank spirit order practitioner, Azel was able to get through life threatening wounds by intricately controlling his body. However, this technique relied on magical energy. In Azel's current situation, any more shock might end his life. The hooded being spoke I didn't plan on killing him, so I avoided hitting any vital organs. If you are worried, I'll allow you to perform first aid on him. I'll allow that. Who the hell are you? Chiron glared at the being as he asked the question. The being's words sounded arrogant. His attitude indicated that the life of Azel's party was within the palm of his hand. Azel had been focused on completing the sun lightsaber. This was why he was taken unawares by the attack. However, Azel should have noticed someone trying to snipe him from afar even if he had been distracted. What method did this guy use? Chiron was trying very hard to assess the situation with a cool head. At the same time, he called for the guardian shadows using the staff given to him by Carlos. Already, several thousand guardian shadows were moving towards this location. It'll take them ten minutes to arrive here. Shit, I have to buy some time. They had planned on exiting this place as soon as possible. Moreover, they had planned on occupying the attention of the their enemies by attacking the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. This was why he hadn't stationed any guardian shadows nearby. Basically, he had been caught with his pants down. I know who you are. At that moment, Euron suddenly opened his mouth. Chiron turned to look at the source of the trembling voice. The hooded being tilted his head. Him, you know me. Who are you? Euron Rizesta. You are Azel Kazark's comrade and you are a traitor to the worshippers of the Dragon Demon King. When one takes in your upbringing into account, you possess an unusually high amount of magical energy. You also possess an unconventional technique that allows you to merge with a demon. Euron flinched when the hooded being started to list information about him. The hooded being asked him a question. Am I right? You were right. But. You were truly able to merge with a demon. How surprising. Moreover, you are a young human. Was your teacher someone exceptional? Him. This isn't the time to ask such questions. First, let's finish our conversation. You know me. Yes. Euron was letting out cold sweat as he nodded his head. 
His party members became puzzled as they looked at him. Of course, it was a tense and terrifying situation. Azel had fallen under a surprise attack, and he was in a critical situation. Regis and Almeric was in one place. The unknown being possessed a presence that was on par with them. However, Yuren's fear seemed to originate from a different place. It wasn't about the current situation. The hooded being was amused as he asked the question. Who am I? Speak. You are. Yuren took a deep breath then he spoke. You are the dragon demon king Atain. Chapter 202. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 1. Kaalia was an existence that had escaped the restriction of space and time. She could be anywhere she wanted to be, and nothing could restrict her movement. Even Atain was incapable of doing that. It was proof that Kaalia wasn't really part of this world. She belonged to a world called the Great Darkness. She watched this world from a vantage point that was out of this world, and she was merely projecting a shadow into this world. This was why she could appear anywhere she was viewing, and she could intrude into any place she wanted. This was why it hadn't been strange for her to disappear from Regus's side in one moment, and appear in the middle of the dragon demon palace in the next moment. It has been a while, Uni. Kaalia, I heard you made an appearance in this era. Ain Sarah had been in her room, but she showed no signs of surprise when she suddenly saw Kaalia. She already knew that Kaalia had been awoken alongside Regus. On the other hand, Kaalia was taken aback. It was as if Ain Sarah wasn't a living creature. Her eyes were dead, and she was completely different from the, the Kaalia she remembered. I welcome your return. The time when we'll able to carry out the king's great work is nearing. Ain Sarah was unperturbed as she spoke in an emotionless voice. Kaalia felt an extreme sense of foreignness. I already knew about this, but you are really a giving me the chills. What do you mean? I'm talking about Ani's attitude. In the past, Ain Sarah had held extreme hatred for Kalia. She didn't even bother hiding her enmity during official events. The reason was simple. Ain Sarah had been in love, and she had been tormented when Atain showed interest in someone else. She hated the second wife Tedron for the same reason. However, if one compared her hate for Kaalia to her hate for Tedron, it looked as if Ain Sarah liked Tedron. Kaalia was in a special situation. She was the third wife, but at the same time, she had made a contract with Atain. She was also placed in similar regards as the dragon demon general. She was a comrade that could help Atain finish his great word. This made Ain Sarah insanely jealous. However, such emotions could no longer be found in Ain Sarah. Are you talking about my past emotions toward you? Yes. A lot of time has passed. I don't think that is the problem. It might not be. Ain Sarah was still emotionless. Her current face superimposed with the face of Kaalia she remembered. It was the same face. She looked as if time hadn't touched her face. She had kept the same appearance, yet how could she be so different? Kaalia held back a sigh as she spoke. All right, Uni, I'm here, because I'm curious about something. You are more deeply linked to the great darkness. Why would you feel the need to ask about our current work? It isn't about that. I'm just curious about the king. You know it, right? What are you referring to? I'm asking about the king's goal. I know it. For a brief moment, Kaalia was surprised. There had been a faint smile on Ain Sira's lips. For the first time, she had revealed a human emotion. It was as if life had been breathed into a stone. This was why Kaalia was surprised. Kaalia asked her a question. I see. Regus Opa and Sir Almeric doesn't know about it, but I knew Uni would know about it. Please tell me, what is the king trying to do this time? He is. Kaalia didn't know if she wanted to laugh or cry when she heard Ain Sira's answer. Silence spread into the surrounding. For a brief moment, the members of Azul's party thought they had heard wrong, so they turned to look at Yuren. That being is Atain. Yuren didn't answer that question. He looked as if he would faint at any moment. He just glared at the hooded being. The hooded being spoke. You are an interesting human. How were you able to recognize me? Everyone stopped breathing. The hooded being admitted to being Atain. He raised both his hands towards the hood. Then he slowly lowered the hood. Laura stopped breathing when she saw the, the face that was revealed. King. Naturally, 
she unconsciously mumbled her words. It was inevitable. He possessed long black hair. It was as if one would be sucked into his dark blue eyes and dragon demon stone. He was a dragon demon youth with thick black horns. He looked to be carved out of marble, and he always seemed to have a faraway look as if he was constantly looking into the distance. Countless portraits of him had been placed all over the plain of darkness, and he looked exactly like the portraits of the dragon demon king Atain. It is as you've said. I am Atain. Atain let out a soft smile as he spoke. This was fulfillment the prophecy that had propped up the dragon demon king worshippers. Their belief had become reality at that moment. Atain had returned from his death after 220 years. Chiron bit his lips. I never expected you to be revived already. It feels as if I've been hit squarely in the back of my head. If it wasn't for you guys, I would have revived at a later date. What do you mean by that? Chiron furrowed his brows. In his heart, he was struggling. He didn't know what they should do. Should they attempt to flee? Maybe, they should buy time until reinforcements arrives. A decisive battle, which would end the conflict, wouldn't be waged here. If Azel was fine, it might have been a possibility. However, Azel had been ambushed and he was at death's door right now. They had no chance of winning. We'll buy some time for now. They had to last until the arrival of the Guardian Shadows. The fact that they were at the mercy of their enemies until that time made his insides boil. However, they had no choice. Atain spoke. Since you guys destroyed the pillars of the great darkness, my revival was pulled up a little bit. Him. Chiron groaned. Atain's words could be interpreted in multiple ways. Did he awaken in haste because the great darkness was threatened? Or was this part of his plan? Was the destruction of the pillars a prerequisite for his revival? If it is the former, there is a possibility that the great darkness is unstable. Even if that is true, it doesn't mean much now. Just the glimpse of the ability shown by Atain confirmed that he was too much for them. Even if the fact that Azel was at death's door from the ambush was put aside for now, the timing of the attack had been devilish. Atain's attack had been outside of every possibility that had been considered by Chiron. They had been taken unawares. Chiron shuddered, because it meant that Atain had escaped the attention of the information net cast by the Guardian Shadows. He had mobilized over half of the Guardian Shadows to surveil the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. If their enemies were moving long distance, they would use the Road of Emptiness. No one using the Road of Emptiness would have escaped the notice of the Guardian Shadows. Atain, Almeric, and Atain had suddenly appeared in this place, so that left only one possibility. Is it the White Fire Phoenix? Correct. Atain gave an affirmation. Azel possessed thirteen dragon weapons, and he possessed a dragon weapon called the Crying Phoenix. It was very similar to the White Fire Phoenix. The White Fire Phoenix was like the Crying Phoenix in that it was a dragon weapon capable of high-speed flight and battle. Azel had told Chiron about it. The Crying Phoenix was created by copying the design of the White Flame Phoenix. Chiron queried him. You came here to stop us from destroying this pillar of darkness. No. What? At Atain's sudden denial, Chiron was taken aback. Atain's gaze headed towards Azel, who was receiving emergency care. In truth, I assumed the pillar here would have already been destroyed, so I had given up on it. However, I found out that I still had a chance to stop it, so I did. At the same time, Atain's dragon demon magic flowed out. It was like a tsunami. It was an enormous power that exceeded the power of Almeric and Ragus. The party flinched for a brief moment, but they weren't overwhelmed by it. Atain was amused by the party's reaction. Have you met someone that has comparable amount of magical energy to me? Aside from those that were sealed, there shouldn't be anyone. Him. It might be possible if it was Alberton. Or did someone reach this level during my sleep? At his words, the party members furrowed their brows. Atain's words were off for some reason. It was hard to pin down, but there was a sense of incongruity. There was simple reason as to why the party members were able to keep their cool when faced with Atain's wave of dragon demon magic. Azul's dragon demon magic was stronger. Surprisingly, the amount of momentary power generated by Azul's eight jewel banded rings of life exceeded Atain's power. 
Hazel had indifferently admitted that his power exceeded what he had possessed in his prime. This was limited to the power generated by Azel's body. If he used an outside vessel like the dragon weapon to amplify his power, it was hard to believe that he was human. Of course, Atain could also display enormous amount of power if he started using his dragon weapons. However, Atain's power wasn't outside the realm of possibility to the party members. Almeric, may you take care of the tree god. I want to talk to them for a little bit longer. You'll be able to seal it using this. Since he is in such a state, it won't be too hard to seal him. I'll do so. Atain handed over a staff to Almeric. Almeric received the item. Then he shot towards the tree god. Fierce winds erupted behind him, and thunder rang out. The tree god finally regained function from the attack of Azul's party, but it started to go under when faced with repeated attacks from Almeric. I'll be able to easily seal the tree god thanks to your efforts. Atain treated the massive power shaking the heavens and earth behind him as background noise. He calmly spoke. What shall I discuss first? It had truly been a long time since he felt fear in front of an enemy. Of course, he had been living on the knife's edge as a warrior, so he was familiar with fear. It was the fear of not knowing when his life would end. He was afraid of the consequences that arose from his own death. These fear had always been with him. However, it had been a very long time since he had been afraid of an enemy. Regus and Almeric had been unable to make him feel this way yet he was afraid of Atain. Was it because he was the dragon demon king? No, that wasn't it. It wasn't Atain's legendary reputation that had caused it. Atain, who was in front of him, was causing this fear. Atain didn't show any hostility or murderous intent. He simply wanted a conversation with Azel's party. On the other hand, he had ambushed Azel, and Azel was so a critical condition. Almeric was in the background and he was suppressing the tree god with frightening display of power. It was as if Almeric was going to flip this world on its head. Chiron didn't understand why he was feeling this way. Maybe, it was the fact that he couldn't predict what Atain was going to do. This might be the cause of his fear. Atain spoke. I am curious about you all. I have a lot of questions. You can continue to be curious. At Leticia's retort, Atain spoke. Do you want to fight me right now? My goal is to take away Azel Kazark. There is no need for me to take all of your lives right now. What? Anger infused into Chiron's expression. Atain's words implied that they weren't even being considered to be worthy foes. Anger surged as it overshadowed Chiron's fear. It happened at that moment. How come you don't know about it? Euron suddenly asked his question. He truly had an odd expression on his face. Chapter 203. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 2. How come you don't know about it? Euron suddenly asked a question. He truly had an odd expression on his face. What do you mean? Atain tilted his head in puzzlement, and Euron continued speaking. You are the dragon demon king Atain. I'm sure of it. I still don't understand what you are getting at, Euron Rizester. How come you don't know about the dragon soul? Dragon soul? You mean those things? Atain showed interest. He had been showing deep interest in the dragon souls of Chiron and Leticia. It was a truly odd occurrence. The creator of the dragon soul said that he was working with you. Euron purposefully didn't mention Rishu's name. He wanted to see Atain's reaction. By the way you are phrasing your words, it seems the dragon soul was developed pretty recently. However, you mentioned the creator. Who are you talking about? He joined hands with you after the great darkness, yet you don't know about the dragon soul. That makes no sense. Why don't you know about it? Did Rishu lie to them? There was no reason for him to do so. Or did he not inform Atain about the dragon soul? It was possible. Atain hadn't been revived yet when Rishu made contact with Atain through some unknown means. Rishu might have agreed to work with Atain but he might not have exposed the existence of the dragon's soul to Atain. This might be why the revived Atain might not have any information regarding the dragon's soul. Something is off. There was a logical explanation that could explain the current situation, but Euron couldn't easily dismiss this discrepancy. He doesn't know about someone that possesses more dragon demon magic than him. 
That doesn't make any sense too. According to Azul's words, Rishu possessed an enormous amount of dragon demon magic, and it exceeded the raw power possessed by Atain. Rishu might not have told Atain about the dragon soul, so it was a plausible excuse for Atain's ignorance. However, how could he not know about a power that rivaled his own? It would be understandable if Atain didn't know Rishu. However, he had fought against Rishu during the Dragon Demon War. Even then Rishu possessed more Dragon Demon magic than Atain. Are you really Atain? You ask the strangest questions. Didn't you identify me as Atain? That's right. You are Atain. There is no way you aren't. Uran bit his lips. Uran had known this fact when this being approached them. He was Atain. Uran had studied the signature of Atain's energy. The guide had informed Uran about what it would feel like if Atain came in proximity to him. The feeling was exactly as described. Moreover, the sight in front of him was definite proof. The white flame phoenix was known to be one of Atain's dragon weapons. The existence of this weapon was wiped from the history of humans, but they had heard about its existence through Azel. Uran thought for a moment, then he seemed to have an epiphany. He let out an exclamation. I see. Did you find something out? Atain looked to be enjoying this exchange as he asked Uran a question. Uren's comrades didn't even understand what he was talking, but Atain looked amused. Uran spoke. It is as you said earlier. You revival was hastened when we destroyed the pillars of the great darkness. I did say that. Isn't that the cause? The magic ritual was hastened, so it is incomplete. I'm not sure which part became defective, but I'm sure you suffered a loss in memory. Your revival isn't complete yet. Chiron had laid out two possibilities, and Uran became sure which of the two possibilities was true. Who? This guy is pretty smart. Ragus. At Ragus's unprompted words, Atain looked at him. Ragus laughed. We have to fight them anyways. Nothing changes if they know the truth. Isn't it so? Atain. Geez. It seems you are still very mad about what I did. Atain let out a bitter laugh. When they heard the exchange between the two, Uran and Laura started to feel that something was off. What should we do? At the time of the Dragon Demon War, Atain had named himself the Dragon Demon King, and he had accepted the four Dragon Demon Generals as his vassals. Basically, they had to treat Atain as their king. There wasn't any deference in Ragus's attitude towards Atain. He didn't talk like a vassal talking to his king. Ragus was talking to Atain as an equal. It was an attitude seen between comrades. Is it because they aren't in a formal setting? Maybe, they treated Atain as a king in official events. It might be a different story in a private setting. However, this didn't seem to be the case from the stories told by Azel of the Dragon Demon War. Laura's thoughts were cut short when she heard Atain's voice. Ragus is right. Uran Rizesta. You saw through to the truth. However, this knowledge won't change the outcome of what is going to happen here. What is your goal? It is as I've said earlier. I want Azel Kazark and the Vitans Chalice. If you let me have both, I'll let you all leave this place alive. However, I can see you won't agree to such a trade. Humph. It seems you know us well. I may be a bit dense, but I at least know that much. Him. What shall I do? Which option will be easier for us? Atain was mulling over his options. Geez. Suddenly, he furrowed his brows. I wanted to see why you guys were stalling for time. It seems you were waiting for them. Are they the guardian shadows? His gaze headed into the distance. His eyes landed on a location where the forest hadn't been destroyed. White phantoms were rushing forward like a wave. Several dozen guardian shadows were rushing towards them at terrifying speed. Atain let out a sigh as he spoke. Unfortunately, we'll have to end our conversation for now. It is regrettable, but I'll end this through force. A tsunami-like dragon demon magic erupted forth in front of them. It was greater than what had been shown until now, and the power was rising. Come dragon weapon. Compendium of pitch darkness. Atain brought out a new dragon weapon. It was a black book that contained completely black pages. In a flash, everyone's eyes widened. What is the dragon weapon? They had heard about Atain's 13 dragon weapons from Azel. White Flame Phoenix. Sky's Fortress. Dream's Apostle. 
Sun of Earth, Frost Forest, Breath of Wind, Volcanoes Giant, Chain of Thunder, Moon of Wrath and Rest, Gatekeeper of Emptiness, Brand of Paradise, Darkness Engraver Sword. The last dragon weapon was the Darkness Incarnate. It was the main dragon weapon used by Atain. The compendium of pitch darkness didn't exist in Azul's stories. Did Atain already acquire a new dragon weapon after he was revived from death? Instead of attacking the flustered party, Atain spoke. In truth, I think I made a big mistake. What nonsense are you spouting now? Azel Kazark found a way to destroy immortal beings. Even if I had to sacrifice the tree god, I should have witnessed this method. I was in too much of a hurry that I acted out in haste. Your arrogance knows no bound. Chiron grinded his teeth. At the same time, he took a step forward as he swung his sword. Gale erupted as enormous force shot towards Atain. When Atain blocked it with a barrier, Chiron shouted as he raised his twin sword. Winds. Roar. Pressurized air was discharged. The green dragon encircling Chiron's body roared, and wind accelerated around them. In a flash, powerful winds capable of ripping normal humans apart swirled around Chiron. Ho oh, oh, your control over the element of air rivals that of a storm dragon. Atain's eyes had been blank until now. It was as if he had a faraway look in his eyes, but his eyes shone with inquisitiveness and intelligence. Ragus spoke. It seems this aspect of your personality remains the same. It seems he has acquired a power equal to a dragon weapon. He isn't an opponent that should be taken lightly. I'm warning you. In their previous battle, Almeric and Ragus expressed their regret when they saw Chiron's power. If he had possessed a dragon weapon, Chiron would have been able to make a name for himself even during the Dragon Demon War. It had been several months since that battle, and Chiron still didn't have a dragon weapon. However, he had acquired a strange power, and he was facing them using this power. In the middle of the accelerating gale, Chiron's dragon demon magic kept growing. He had been comparable in power to the strongest amongst dragon demons, but now he rivaled Almeric. Chiron accelerated as he ran forward. Chapter 204. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 3. It was the first humiliation he had suffered since his revival. His chest voice exploded forth. How dare you, you little gnat. The dragon weapon looked like a sword made out of clear glass. The storm's scream let out a fierce blue thunderbolt. The overwhelming power ripped away at the gale assaulting Almeric. He fought for control over the air. You should have come out like that in the first place. You are too different from the description written in history. You were so calm that I was wondering if you were a fake. Chiron let out a fierce laughter as he charged forward. When he clashed with Almeric, sounds of consecutive explosions could be heard. At the same time, Chiron's eyes became cold. Everything is going too well. If I let my guard down, I might be killed in a single moment. Events were progressing better than he had expected. It was the best out of the worst situation. Chiron had fought several hundred mock battles with Almeric in his mind. Even if his enemy possessed enough power to make him despair, Chiron had to defeat him only once. He had fought this enemy before, and he had memorized the techniques used by Almeric. He just had to use all of his efforts in finding a way to defeat Almeric's technique. Chiron was well informed in regards to Almeric. Azel had given a detailed report, and Chiron had experienced Almeric's power for himself. He used these information as basis for his practices. He had practiced for this fight until he was sick of it. On the other hand, Almeric didn't know much about Chiron. Almeric had defeated Chiron in a fight before, but it wasn't an exaggeration to say that Chiron was a completely different person after gaining the dragon soul. He had grown a lot. The discrepancy in information would allow Chiron to take Almeric unawares. Chiron, Leticia, Laura and Euron had attacked Almeric in the last fight, and they lost in mortifying fashion. Chiron had tried to objectively assess the fight, and he came up with three reasons why they had lost. For a short amount of time, I can generate almost equal power as him. I can do this. First, the problem was power. The difference in power was too burdensome to overcome with technique. The swords clashed, and the sounds of consecutive explosions rang out. 
Almeric's sword technique was exquisite, yet heroic. However, Chiron matched him. His explosive sword technique was being supported by the dragon soul. He stopped the flow of Almeric's sword strikes, and Chiron was starting to gain the advantage. I'm sure of it now. My control over air is superior. The second reason had been the absence of a dragon weapon. Almeric possesses the storm's scream, which held dominion over storm and thunder. His dragon weapon was akin to a calamity. However, the dragon soul was holding up against the storm's scream. The dragon soul acted as an armor against thunderbolts, and Chiron's control over the air was superior. He was pushing Almeric into a corner. At the end of the consecutive explosions, Almeric was pushed backwards. He slid across the ground. However, Chiron chased after him using instantaneous movement. Chiron continued to attack relentlessly before Almeric could right himself. Do you think I will give you the time to make a move on me? I'll end this right now. Chiron knew that the advantage he had gained could be overturned. It was a matter of time. He was making sure his opponent couldn't display his true power. This was the golden rule when fighting someone with superior power. He would be begging for a defeat if he allowed his opponent to do what he was best at. It would be foolish and arrogant for him to do so. I can't allow him to make clones. I have to keep pushing until I kill him. The third reason for Chiron's past defeat was the clone technique. If he could fight one-on-one -on -one against Almeric, he had a chance. However, it was an entirely different story once Almeric used incarnation. It was the same as when Azel used his Dance of Shadows. He could exist and act through multiple clones of substance. He was capable of producing power that was on a different class compared to fighting only one real body. Let's see how long you can laugh. At Chiron's shout, Almeric's eyebrows rose sharply. Laugh. I am. He was in a dangerous situation where a knife was pressed against his neck. He had thought he could overwhelm his opponent with a single attack. He had underestimated Chiron. He had thought Chiron was a whelp without a dragon weapon. However, Chiron was scarily well informed about him, and Chiron was exploiting all his weaknesses. At this rate, his head would be severed without him being able to use half his power. So why was Chiron claiming that he was laughing? I see. I. Almeric realized that Chiron's words were correct. I'm having fun. Since he was revived in this era, this was the first time he felt alive. After he was revived from death, everything had been boring. The passion and heat that had been present in his era was all gone. This era had been desolate. Those that fought on the same side as him in the past had all turned mad and sinister. They had twisted a Tyne's image to create a society of fanatics. He had been incognito as he observed them for several dozen years. He despised them. This wasn't it. He hadn't fought with his life on the line to create this world. Even what he considered to be right with the world was gone now. Since martial techniques were lost to the humans, they could no longer stimulate his heart. However, a foe that could heat up his heart had appeared right in front of him. Good. You whelp. If you are confident, you should make me weep. I don't buy it for a second that you can pull that off. The feeling of old came alive within Almeric's chest. It was a feeling he felt when he faced fate each day with his life on the line. Regus and Leticia was fighting a battle with each other. Unlike Chiron, Leticia didn't insist on fighting a one-on-one -on -one battle. The Guardian shadows were densely packed around them, and they were like a white wave. They supported Leticia. Humph. If you are going to massage me, would you mind hitting me harder? Regus let out a belly laugh. It didn't matter if his opponents were hitting him. Regus's style was to charge forward like a freight train until his enemies were dead. Several dozen guardian shadows were focusing their attack on him, yet they couldn't stop him. A gale infused with frost started to rise, and the situation changed. The ground beneath Regus's feet froze, and large ice fragments started to beat against him. In a flash, his body was surrounded as if he was in an ice prison. It was Leticia's attack. After releasing her dragon soul, she gained dominion over cold air. Her abilities were on par with an ice dragon. Even if Regus was an undead, he couldn't ignore the cold. He didn't have any vital functions that could be slowed down by the cold. However, 
His body was being battered by the ice storm, and his body was being frozen in an instant. However, it was useless. Even if Leticia created a pillar of ice, it took him only a moment to bash through it. Leticia and the Guardian Shadows alternated their attack. It was enough to stop Regus's movement for a short time. This opportunity was used to strike Regus with an enormous ice pole. Regus was sent flying backwards, and he was planted into the ground. His momentum was so high that dirt exploded into the air as he rolled across the ground. Leticia didn't let her guard down. Immediately, the wave of guardian shadows attacked Regus. Regus dashed out of the debris. He had suffered under the attack, but the only physical distress one could see was the slight dent in his armor. He looked fine as he heroically swung his soul hammer. The earth screamed. An explosion started to spread in a conical shape and it reached several hundred meters. Leticia moaned. The upper edge she had gained with superior numbers had been swept aside with one move. Fortunately, the guardian shadows quickly dodged to the side, so the damage was minimal. However, Regus laughed as he walked out of the dust cloud. How refreshing. I love it. I hate those that typically try to freeze me. I find it a bit annoying and petty. However, I really like the aesthetics of your plan. You don't think it is cheap. I take responsibility for my words. I don't care if it is several hundred or several thousand. They can all attack me. I'll fight with all the power in my body. You are quite dashing. If you were on our side, I might have fallen for you. Cold sweat was running down her body. Regus was basically a walking fortress. She knew this, but she had thought her previous attack would be able to impart significant damage. However, she had only confirmed that she had been very wrong in her estimation of him. Do I have to apply a direct blow? Regus's defensive technique was perfect. His power was compressed into an extremely dense energy, and it was used to strengthen his body. His defensive capabilities were akin to a fortress, yet he was skilled enough to slip attacks. In a momentary notice, he could change his energy into the optimum form needed to avoid suffering serious damage from attacks. He was boorish in his fighting method, but it was backed by his almost miraculous senses and techniques. It was impossible to overcome his reaction speed with long-distance attacks. She had to get close to him, and she had to focus her power using perfect timing. That was the only way she would be able to breach his defense. Or I can mow him down with overwhelming force. However, our side doesn't have the number to accomplish this. She needed much more guardian shadows. A focused attack by the Guardian Shadows could restrict Regus's movement. She needed more time. She needed enough Guardian Shadows to gather, so their party would have a chance to escape. At the same time, she couldn't waste too much time. It was apparent that the Plane of Darkness would also send support. These contradictions tormented Leticia. Well, are you well rested now? We should start this again. I was in a very bad mood, because of Atain. However, I'm starting to have some fun thanks to you, miss. You don't act like a vassal talking about his king. He isn't my king. What? Oh, my tongue slipped again. Well, I guess I can say that much. Regus snickered. He suddenly looked at his surrounding as he spoke. The second wave is coming. It'll take some time for them to assemble. Shall I wait? Leticia was at a loss for words. It was as he said. More guardian shadows were coming towards them. Their numbers were much larger than the advance party. This was apparent, yet Regus said he would wait for them. If Chiron heard your words, he would have gotten angry. Oh ho, you are quite level-headed. I'm the type to thankfully accept the arrogance displayed by the strong. If you wait without going through your transformation, I might fall for your manliness. If we weren't enemies. No, it is quite unfortunate that my body is like this. If I was like my past self, I would have tried to seduce you with a passion. At Leticia's cold attitude, Regus laughed. Leticia snorted. There was another reason why she couldn't waste too much time. It was Regus's transformation. Regus was already a foe that was hard to defeat. If he was allowed to transform, they wouldn't be able to handle him. However, the transformation took a very long time. Regus had started the process of his transformation when the battle began. His magical energy had been going through an amplification. However, 
When he offered to wait, he had paused his transformation. I'll do as you wish. If it is this many, it might be worthwhile. She used her mind to assess the number and location of the guardian shadows. Leticia only called for those that were capable of long-distance attack. The rest were dispatched towards Azul's side. She decided those that could only fight up close would be useless against Ragus. Chapter 205. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 4. I'll do as you wish. If it is this many, it might be worthwhile. She used her mind to assess the number and location of the Guardian Shadows. Leticia only called for those that were capable of long-distance attack. The rest were dispatched towards Azul's side. She decided those that could only fight up close would be useless against Ragus. This was all possible, because Leticia possessed the staff that controlled the Guardian Shadows. If one possessed the staff, it was possible to control the Guardian Shadows even if one couldn't communicate with them. Chiron had given the staff to Leticia before the battle had started. In terms of coming up with an overall strategy, Chiron was best suited for the role. However, when a battle started, Leticia was the one most capable of bringing out the best in the Guardian Shadows. Leticia was like Hazel. She was talented in using clones. While she was entirely focused on the battle, she was able to split her will into multiple threads. She was able to maintain a constant link with the Guardian Shadows. I'll attack them all at once to separate the three of them. The goal of their tactic was extremely simple. It was to separate Almeric, Ragus and Almeric as far as possible from each other. When enough Guardian Shadows arrive, the Guardian Shadows would swarm and distract the three of them. Azul's party would use this opportunity to escape from the battlefield. It wasn't the time to resolve the conflict with Atain. They had to find a way to exit this place. Here I go. Leticia had around 200 Guardian Shadows that were capable of attacking from afar. They split into three groups, and they attacked Ragus all at once. That's the spirit. It feels like I'm getting hit now. However, I still think you are short on numbers. It was as if several hundred magicians were focusing their attack on him. The three group attacked, retreated and attacked. It was an endless cycle. Despite the continuous attack, Ragus was walking forward at a rapid pace. If the Guardian shadows let up even a little bit, it seemed Ragus just charged through their lines. Cold sweat ran down Leticia's back. During the Dragon Demon War, 400 men were gathered to defeat him. Ragus had been killed when he was lured into a trap. Spells, which had been prepared beforehand, had bombarded Ragus. When he was injured, it was said that 400 men had attacked him all at once. It was the perfect trap, yet by the time Ragus had died, over half of men were killed. Moreover, this guy is stronger than before. She found out something after fighting him. He was stronger than the time he fought Hazel. It seems he finished getting used to being an undead. Hazel had faced Ragus when he hadn't been an undead for too long. Ragus had lost all of his dragon demon magic, so he hadn't adjusted to his power as an undead. However, a warrior of Ragus's caliber made adjustments quickly. He was fully adjusted to being an undead now, so he was basically a walking calamity. He was capable of swinging the outcome of a battle by himself. Ragus was one of the four dragon demon generals, and he was a nightmare to humans. Would she really be able to defeat him? Doubts started to form in her mind. Also, will they be able to last against Atain? Urin, Laura and Arietta were protecting the injured Azel as they fought against Atain. Will they be able to hold up against Atain? She was well aware of the critical flaws in her plan, but Leticia had no choice. She had to fight with all her might. Atain didn't get involved in the fights being fought by the dragon demon generals. He had other things to do. Him. I just have to wrap this up, yet I never expected it to be so hard. Almeric hadn't finished the job. He just cut off the head of the tree god, and he had abandoned the task. Atain had to continue the work of sealing the tree god. However, the seal itself was a great magic of epic scale. Both of you are quite skilled. It has been a while since I've fought such a fun magic battle. He was creating a seal, and at the same time, he was fighting a magic battle against Azul's party. The sound of explosions rang out. 
thunderbolts raced across the sky, and a strong gale swirled around them. Flashes of light was accompanied explosions as they appeared everywhere. On the other hand, this wasn't a one-sided phenomena. It occurred around Atene and Azul's party. A massive amount of power was being shattered around them. The surprising part was the fact that each side hadn't casted half the spells they were capable of casting. Despite this fact, the power being displayed could kill several hundred people. As expected of the king, Laura despaired. Euron and Laura were the top magicians of this era. They were powerful magicians. The two of them were attacking Atain, while he was trying to seal the tree god, and they weren't having any success. It just slowed down the sealing process by a minute amount. At some point in the battle, Laura and Euron started being pushed back. Atain's spells started to push past the interference caused by the two, and his spells started to manifest little by little. Once the balance of power started to tilt, it started to tilt all the way. It was as if a blocked dam had broken open. A storm of magic flew towards the two. Ha! Huh, for a moment, Atain was taken aback. The magic, which had been sweeping towards the two, changed its direction. It was coming back towards him. Is it the Vitten's chalice? She was aiming for this. An explosion erupted. Atain had manifested a lot of spells. It was piled up as big as a mountain. Laura used dimensional distortion to send back the spells to its owner, but there were too many spells to turn back all at once. This was why a clash of magic occurred afterwards. It is a shame that Onsaurus isn't here to see this. You have great ability. Atain was truly impressed. He wasn't merely talking about her sending back his spells. Laura's plan hadn't ended there. There had been a clash of magic but the explosion seemed very small compared to the number of spells he had sent. The reason was quite simple. Dimensional distortions appeared around Atain. Laura had created numerous dimensional distortions, and she had directed the shockwave and heat from the explosions onto Atain. The spells he had sent forth were returning towards him. The aftermath of the explosions was pouring out from all directions through the dimensional distortion. On top of that, it was as if Laura and Euron had been waiting for this moment. They started pouring out their spells towards Atain. Their timing was truly exquisite. This was a dire situation even for Atain. Basically, the spells of three superb magicians were stacked against him, and these spells were being poured towards him all at once. Come dragon weapon. Even if her opponent was Atain, Laura thought. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Sky's fortress. They could inflict significant damage to Atain. Ah, Laura was shocked as she saw a circular ball of energy appear in front of Atain. Its diameter was 20 meters. How can this be? Most of the spells were sucked into the ball, and it disappeared. A great explosion occurred a distance away. The ground shook, and their eyes were filled with burning light. Laura was mesmerized as she pieced together what had occurred. It has been almost a 100 years since I've faced such a situation. Atain's voice could be heard from within the cloud of dust and heat. He sounded as if he was truly enjoying himself. The gatekeeper of emptiness was a dragon weapon that had been used as template to create the road of emptiness. It couldn't freely distort dimensions like the Vitten's chalice, but it was capable of creating a space that connected point A to point B it could create a dimensional door. The sky's fortress was the archetype of Azul's unyielding fortress. Unlike the unyielding fortress, it had a special property of the sky. In this aspect, it was more like the sky splitter. It was a dragon weapon that boasted overwhelmingly high defense, yet it could gather light from its surrounding to strengthen itself. It became almost impenetrable. It also was capable of absorbing any light-based attack. Atain used these two dragon weapons to get out of danger. As a magician, this is embarrassing. I had to completely rely on my dragon weapons to get out of trouble. On this exchange, it's your victory. Laura was at a loss for words. She wondered if he was patronizing him, but Atain was sincere. His expression told the veracity of this truth. He isn't wrong, but he was right. They weren't able to kill Atain, but they were able to cause him harm. They had distracted him from the task of sealing the tree god. He would have to redo many parts of the sealing process. 
He also had to divert his magical energy as he sent away the attack to a different location using the Gatekeeper of Emptiness. He couldn't recover that magical energy. High-ranked magicians were capable of recovering some of the magical energy invested in spells after they were cast. This was why it was important to assess how much a magician could recover magical energy invested in a spell. It was part of making a judgment on how skilled a magician was. If one took that into account, Atain had lost a significant portion of his magical energy. Something is off. Atain was showing surprising amount of power and ability. It was as if he was three great mages rolled into one. He had fought Laura and Euron while he was sealing the tree god. Even if one was a powerful magician, one was at a disadvantage in terms of power, speed and scale of the spells when facing numerous opponents. This was why one had to defeat multiple opponents all at once or defeat them one by one. However, Atain's method was different. He truly was capable of fighting Laura and Euron at the same time as if it was a one-on-one -on -one battle. How is this possible? It was as if he was using incarnation. During the Dragon Demon War, Atain was one of the few users capable of using incarnation, so maybe, it wasn't strange that he was capable of fighting this way. So why didn't he just use incarnation in the first place? Wouldn't there be a more effective way to fight? King. No. Atain. Do you have something you want to say to me? You seem very confident. Him. Atain tilted his head in puzzlement. He spoke when he had a thought. From my point of view, I don't feel the need to kill all of you right now. It isn't a priority. So it is hard for me to show killing intent towards you guys. I also think it would be a loss to kill you guys considering your potential. There is no room for negotiation. I know that. Still, I'm just trying to use my power to accomplish my goal. I would like to avoid killing you all in the process. Laura's expression hardened. She wasn't angry, because Atain had looked down on her. The difference between them was so large, so it was hardly an insult. Atain was the first dragon demon and he was the first magician. He created the dragon arts. Moreover, he reset the relationship between the humans and dragons by creating the dragon slayer's ritual. If she ignored the fact that he was part of the plane of darkness, Atain was a main character from a legend. If she consolidated all the information she had gathered about him, she knew that he was at least 3,000 years old. Maybe, he lived for over 10,000 years. It was strange to see that type of figure show human emotions. Despite this fact, he isn't infallible. When she had that thought, she realized that the ability displayed by Atain was subtle. He possessed enough ability to squash Laura and Euron. If he wasn't trying to seal the tree god, this would have been a much more difficult situation for them. However, she became confused the more she interacted with him. Chapter 206. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 5. He possessed enough ability to squash Laura and Euron. If he wasn't trying to seal the tree god, this would have been a much more difficult situation for them. However, she became confused the more she interacted with him. First, it is his magic. Atain's ability to apply his magic had risen to an unbelievable level. Atain used his magic with speed, precision and efficiency. He was the embodiment of magic, and he was what all magicians strive to be. However, the spells he were using wasn't surprising at all. Laura and Euron had expected Atain to use spells that they didn't know about. However, they could discern the final product by how he was using his magical energy. They were able to cope with the spells. Moreover, part of his magic is outdated. Was it because Atain was a figure from 220 years ago? While time passed, the plane of darkness had diligently progressed in the study of magic. It didn't matter how much magical energy was possessed by Atain. His spell's effectiveness had fallen behind. For some reason, it was hard to accept that fact. Atain, Ornsaurus and Baldazark were magicians that had transcended the standard of their era. Atain was the founder and the pinnacle of magic. It had only been 220 years, so why did his magic feel so outdated? This is odd. The Great Darkness and the Road of Emptiness. Then there were the numerous other miraculous artifacts left behind in the Plane of Darkness. If one analyzed each of them, one would have a hard time grasping how these items were created. 
They were on an entirely different level. She could say this with certainty. No other magicians in the past 220 years within the plane of darkness had been able to come close to the techniques developed by Atene. Suddenly, Arietta spoke. Atene. Atene turned his gaze towards Arietta, who had spoken his name. Arietta had become marginalized in this fight. It wasn't, because she didn't have enough power. She still hadn't acquired her dragon soul. But she would be an asset fighting in concert with Laura and Euron. The problem was Azel. Azel was close to death, so someone had to look after him. Moreover, if an opportunity presented itself, she had to run away with Azel. When facing a strong opponent like Atane, the weakest amongst the three had to take on this assignment. Naturally, Arietta had to take on that role. Arietta continued to speak. I am Arietta Vile Rulan. It is said that I am your descendant. I've read about your information. Why are you bringing up that fact? Of course, I'm not expecting you to go easy on me for being your kin. From what I've heard, there are over several thousand beings that is of your own flesh and blood. Is that correct? It isn't. Him, if we are talking about bloodlines propagated by me, the number should be in the ten thousands at the very least. There are bloodlines that continue to this day, but there are also the broken bloodlines. My life is too long to be measured by everyone else's standard. I've directly sired many, and several hundred generations of descendants had resulted from it. Isn't it an obvious result? Atain sounded amused as he spoke, but it was truly a shocking information. For a brief moment, she was at a loss for words. Arietta spoke. This is. I knew Azel was a pretty big playboy, but you are on an entirely different level. Ha ha ha. My enemy, Azel, must have left behind a lot of descendants. However, the process of me leaving behind descendants probably differs a bit from what you are imagining. How? This era accepts certain actions and knowledge to be common sense. It would take me too long to explain how they became to be common sense, but you should try imagining it. It was an era where humans separated by a mere mountain didn't communicate with each other. It was an era where humans killed other humans, and people practiced cannibalism. The dragons were a calamity, and they prevented the humans from expanding their territory. His words drove home the large span of history he was talking about. Everyone listening to his words knew that Atain had lived through that era. Arietta furrowed her brows. It sounds like an excuse made up by a man that had no self-restraint. You used your nether region as you please, and your explanation is such a reach that it makes me feel faint. I asked you why you touched so many women, yet you are going to blame it on history and legends. You truly are a great being. For a brief moment, Laura and Euron looked at Arietta with a stupefied expression on their face. Atine's eyes widened as if she had scored a point against him. Arietta smirked. Well, all right, I brought up being your descendant as a self-introduction. The fact that I'm your descendant gave me trouble in the past from your followers, so I brought it up. Is it something I have to apologize for? Atain tilted his head. Arietta spoke. I might feel a bit better if I heard an apology. Then I will apologize. In terms of a human's sense of time, it is an action too far in the future to assign blame. For me, it is within the time frame to be sufficiently be called as being part of my life. Atain elegantly bowed his head. Arietta laughed. You are my ancestor. All men praise you for being a legend, so it is an honor that you've lowered your head. I want to ask you the question I'm most curious about. However, before I do that do you mind me asking you another question? I don't feel any affections for my descendants, but I'm willing to acquiesce to that request. I heard from your son that you were the one to create the Dragon Slayer's ritual. My son, for a brief moment, Atine's eyes widened. He tilted his head in puzzlement. It didn't take him too long for him to realize what she was talking about. Him. If it is right now. Tida and Glacian is dead. So are you talking about Cybane? That's right. I see. He is still alive. Atain nodded his head as he spoke, and his words made the party feel uneasy. In the beginning, it was as if Atain hadn't known he still had a son. Next, his attitude indicated that he didn't care much about not knowing about his son. During the Dragon Demon War, Atain had three queens. 
The first queen was Ain Sera. The second queen was Tedran. The third queen was Kealia. Ain Sera had a daughter named Rebekah, and she bore Atain two sons. Tedran bore him two sons named Teda and Glacian. Kealia had no children. Amongst his children, only Sibain was still alive. All the others were killed in battle. That is why Atain should have naturally thought about Sibain. So why did he react like that? As Atain spoke more, the sense that something was wrong grew stronger. There were too many holes to this situation. Atain spoke. That's right. I created the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Did you want to confirm that fact with me? No. Arietta quickly broke out of her thoughts as she shook her head from side to side. Atain queried her. What are you curious about? It is a question I just had when I heard your story. Atain, were you perhaps behind the legend of Babel? The legend of Babel was the reason why the world was using a single language. It was a legend. It had been hard to believe that a single figure could be responsible for such a feat. Atain spoke as if it was no big deal. I also did that. As expected, Arietta had received an answer she had expected, yet she shuddered. Both the Dragon Slayer's ritual and the story of Babel were stuff of legends. However, humanity had forgotten about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. The story of Babel held a different weight compared to the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Arietta gulped as she queried him. Why did you do that? I did it, because I can. Are you satisfied with that answer? It isn't enough. Then I'll expand on my answer. It isn't too different from the story you know. At the time, I thought many of the tragedies suffered by humanity was based on having different languages. If everyone could speak the same language, I thought these misfortunes would disappear. I thought everyone would understand and love each other. I carried out my work believing in this. I worked at it for a truly long time even by my standard. Atain had been considered a legend well before humanity had written history. At the time, magic was much more primitive. That is why I took on disciples when I needed talented individuals around me. I researched with them as if my life depended on it. I gathered those that wanted to realize the essence of magic. I gathered those that harbored desire to change the world. I gathered a lot of them, yet it took around 1,000 years. Atain spoke in a calm manner, but the party was overwhelmed by his words. Atain had tried to change the world through good intentions. This wasn't on the same level as placing rules and a societal system, so humans could live as a group. What he tried to accomplish was like the process of union and birth. It was considered to be the natural order of the world. In order to accomplish his goal, he had taught magic to countless people, and they had worked collaboratively. None of the people around him lived to see the work to the end, yet he continued to work hard to achieve his goal. Above all else, he had finally achieved his goal. He worked for a long period of time. It was a thousand years. He was able to make the whole world speak a single language. It didn't take me too long to realize that I had failed. I had to accept that fact, and I accepted this fact much faster than the time I had invested in this venture. Humans didn't love and understand each other, because they spoke the same language. I was naive and foolish. It was like the time I created the Dragon Slayer's ritual. He let out a bitter laugh. Arietta realized that she was shaking. She was terrified. This man was talking about legends yet it was the story of his life. He had changed the fate of countless individuals, yet he was talking about it like a normal frustration in his life. The being in front of her was the main character in the legends. She could now understand why the dragon demon king worshippers worshipped him as a god. Atain continued to speak. Is that answer acceptable? It is enough. However, if it is as you've said, you keep repeating the greatest failures of your life. You unified the language of the world. You reset the relationship between the dragons and humans. Then you tried to conquer the world with your army to create an ideal society. Yes, they were all failures. However, I cannot stop. I know it won't work, but how can I give up? I'm still alive, and there is work to be done. I usually like an iron wool, but I think it would have been okay if you gave up along the way. On that point, we clearly differ in opinion. I see failure in my future, and I accept that. However, I have no plan on stopping. 
The failures are just burdens that I will have to carry in my life. Atain shook his head from side to side. Arietta asked him a question. That means you know your plan will clearly fail. But you will still try it out. I didn't say that. Him. I think I might have misspoken. However, it doesn't matter. Atain mumbled to himself before he spoke. It has been fun conversing with you. But I should start doing my work. My descendant, Arietta Vile Rulin, ask me what you are truly curious about. I will answer it. You said you don't plan on killing Azel. Arietta realized that Atain had made a firm statement. Half the reason for the conversation was to buy some time. Atain knew this, yet he had indulged her request. However, that was at an end. We know that you cursed Azel, so you could make him into a dragon demon general. I don't know how you found that out, but you're a correct. Why did you do that? Chapter 207. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 6. Arietta couldn't understand it. Azel was the hero that had defeated Atain. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel possessed power that no one could measure up to. Did Atain want to subordinate Azel, because Azel was stronger than him? If so, why weren't there more subordinates under him that had their free will restricted? Atain had linked a very small number of beings to the Great Darkness. Moreover, all these beings shared Atain's vision for the future. They followed him out of their own free will. This wouldn't be the case with Azel. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that question. What? Arietta's eyes widened. Was he making fun of her? However, Atain's expression was too serious for this to be true. It is unfortunate, but I cannot give you that answer. I really don't know the answer. Didn't you make this decision in the past? It is as Euron Rizester surmised not too long ago. My revival wasn't complete. If we use the Demon King Atain as the measuring stick, I am incomplete. There was an odd nuance to his words. However, it seemed Atain no longer wanted to continue this conversation. I am sorry that I cannot answer your question. Let's end this. In front of Atain, the compendium of pitch darkness rose up into the air, and flames of darkness started to erupt around him. Euron took a deep breath, then he spoke. He's coming. Atain was still showing a tepid attitude. There were countless uncertainties, but it was clear that Atain hadn't been using his full power. We are in a bad spot. Euron still hadn't used his trump card. He hadn't fused with a demon yet. And even if he did, he could maintain the fusion for only a short amount of time. He had thought it would be sufficient to use the fusion when Atain started using his full power. Laura was using her full power as a magician. However, she hadn't used the full power of the Vitten's Chalice. Vitten's Chalice was a dragon weapon that made countless people shake in fear during the Dragon Demon War. In terms of battle capability, Ornsaurus was seen as being superior to Atain. The difference was the fact that Ornsaurus possessed the Vitten's Chalice. If Laura used the power of the Vitten's Chalice, she would become much stronger. However, Will we be able to pull it off? If Euron merged with a demon and Laura was able to use the full power of the Vitten's Chalice, would they be able to contend with Atain? Their situation was getting worse by the second. The Guardian shadows continued to gather, but the party's goal was moving farther away. Euron looked through the magic eye in the air, and he bit his lips. Atain was almost done sealing the tree god. Leticia was continually deploying more Guardian shadows, yet she was slowly being pushed back by Ragus. In the end, Chiron had allowed Almeric to use his incarnation. Chiron had learned how to deal with incarnation from Azel, and he had worked very hard in trying to prevent Almeric from using it. However, there was a limit to what he could do. When the incarnation was used, Chiron was quickly being pushed back. Dangerous. It really is the worst. From the beginning, they had a tactic put in place on how to deal with Ragus and Almeric. Azel could face either of them in an one-on-one -on -one battle. If one of his party members supported Azel, he could easily beat Ragus or Almeric. Even if Azel was missing, there was a chance that they could win against Ragus and Almeric. A warrior and a magician just had to team up to deal with each of them. Azel's party had gotten much stronger. However, everything turned into a mess when Atain showed up. Their strongest card was in critical condition before the battle even started. 
Euron, Laura and Arietta was tied up, since they had to face Atane. At this rate, we cannot run away. Euron came to a bleak conclusion as he started his attack on Atane. Come dragon weapons. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Dreams apostle. Three dragon weapons were summoned including the compendium of pitch darkness. At the same time, all kinds of spells started to pour out from the compendium of pitch darkness. This is. Euron and Laura realized something at the same time. It was apparent that the compendium of pitch darkness was similar to the dragon weapon called the Book of Darkness. It was capable of boosting the magical energy of the user, and at the same time, it gave free control over massive amount of spells to its user. However, they had made a mistake. Their assessment was completely wrong. It is a dragon weapon capable of independent action from its owner. It can fight a magic battle on his own. It was a dragon weapon similar to the White Flame Phoenix and the Crying Phoenix. It could move in an autonomous manner. Moreover, the amount of dragon demon magic stored within exceeded the power of Laura, and its ability to manifest spell was on par with Euron. There is two magic tomes that are like the Darkness Incarnate. This is unbelievable. A Tyne's main dragon weapon was called the Darkness Incarnate, and it was truly a terrifying dragon weapon. It was basically another version of Atane. It was different from the incarnation technique. This other version of Atane could work separately from the real Atane. The dragon weapon could was basically an exact clone of Atane. It could use all kinds of spell, and it was capable of summoning and using Atane's dragon weapons. The compendium of pitch darkness wasn't on the level of the darkness incarnate, but it was still a ridiculous dragon weapon. By itself, it could face off against Euron or Lauren. It isn't the time to hold back. Euron no longer hesitated. He was going to merge with a demon. It happened at that moment. Ah, he was about to call out a demon to merge with it. However, his summoning spell was blocked. He immediately realized what had happened. It was the power of the dragon weapon called Dream's Apostle. I forbid the beings of hate from invading into this world. Atane recited those words in a low voice. The dream's apostle manifested itself in the form of a staff, and there was a sun and moon hanging off of it. It was capable of mastery over the world of mind and soul. It didn't even need to manifest any complicated spell. The dragon weapon was capable of blocking a demon from entering into this world. A. Impossible. Euron was taken aback. He once again tried to fuse with a demon, but it didn't work. It didn't matter what method he tried to use to summon a demon. The dream's apostle blocked him at every turn. Magicians were capable of interfering with each other's spells. It was like blocking various paths. It was possible to reach the same destination through different paths. It wasn't impossible to block all these paths, but one needed significant amount of effort and sacrifices to do so. The dream's apostle was simply blocking all the paths Euron could take. He couldn't overcome it no matter what methods he used. This was the power of the dragon weapons. Dragon weapons possessed transcendent power. It defied the logic followed by the magicians. They were miraculous tools that allowed one to take shortcuts. This. Euren's complexion turned white. He was merely a human magician. He possessed enough power to be called an archmage but he fell well short of being able to contend with Atane. Even if he possessed excellent technique, there was a limited number of cards he could use. If there was a limit on how many cards he could use at one time, he had limited options. If he didn't have the option to fuse with the demon, he possessed the least amount of magical energy in his party. He didn't possess any dragon weapons or a dragon soul. Suddenly, Atane spoke. Him. Nope. This isn't it. He shook his head from side to side, and at the same time, he unsummoned the dream's apostle. The power blocking Euren's fusion with the demon disappeared. Euren was able to activate his demon summoning spell. Try it. I don't want to blow the opportunity to witness such a rare technique just because it might pose a danger to me. It was such an arrogant statement to say. It made him shudder. At the same time, Euren understood that Atane was a magician to his bones. There was a common saying. Curiosity was the shortcut to destruction. As a magician, Atane was basically a pioneer. He called the demons into this world, because he was curious about their existence. He didn't even hesitate to make deals with them. 
I'll do as you wish. An extremely ominous wave of magical energy emanated from him, and Yuren's brown hair fiercely blew in the wind. His blue-gray eyes burned as black smoke appeared behind him. Evil spirits were gathering behind him. Atine's eyebrows rose. Very cool. You were able to quickly and safely use this technique. This means that this technique is fully formed. I am very curious as to who had developed this technique. I am also curious about that. While he spoke, Yuren's magical energy was wildly surging upwards. However, Yuren's mind was calm. His thoughts became stable. The signs of inexperience that was displayed in the fight against Niberus was nowhere to be seen. Unlike before, his skill in fusing with the demon had been refined. His magic was boosted beyond the amount of magical energy possessed by Laura. The senses needed to control magical energy was boosted several folds. His thought process became faster. However, this didn't mean the technique wasn't taxing him. His control had increased significantly, but he couldn't do anything about the increased load on his body and mind. He once again started the magic battle. It was different than before. Each side was now showing their true skills. Yuren and Laura worked in sync with each other. The communication spell allowed him to quickly exchange their intent, and they started apply pressure on Atain. The storm of magic raged. It was more fierce than before. The fight was still quite even. Atain was terrifying since he was using his full power. However, it wasn't at a level where Laura and Yuren couldn't cope with it. The reason was simple. The Vitten's chalice is amazing. It didn't perform like this in the past. It was as Azel had said. The Vitten's chalice was a dragon weapon tailored for a magician. It could create dimensional distortions, but only a magician could bring out the countless spells stored within the weapon. Laura and Euron leaned on the power of the Vitten's chalice, and they were opportunistic and focused in their attacks. In terms of the amount of spells that one could use, Laura and Euron was at a disadvantage. It was a 1 versus 2 battle, yet Atain was using more spells than the two combined. His current skill couldn't be compared to what he had displayed before. However, most of the spells were being diverted elsewhere using dimensional distortions. Atain knew about the big techniques like the Vitten's Maze and the Endless Plane. However, Laura continued to use the lowly skill called the Dimensional Distortions. Atain couldn't go through the tedious task of stopping every single use of the Dimensional Distortion. Laura was also shrewd in choosing which spells she should divert or confront. She used Dimensional Distortions to let the spells flow to a different location or she sent it back towards him. It was causing significant trouble for Atain. Atain used the Gatekeeper of Emptiness to oppose the Vitten's Chalice, but the Vitten's Chalice was much superior in dealing with space. The Gatekeeper of Emptiness could only connect one point to another. On the other hand, the Vitten's Chalice could expand, twist and terminate space. It was constantly changing, so Laura was able to play with that power. This won't work. Yuren's face was dyed with despair. They were able to stand on equal footing with Atine's overwhelming magic. However, that was their limit. There was no way they could turn the tide of battle against Atain. In fact, they were slowly losing ground as time passed. Moreover, an explosion rang out from afar. Something flew towards them, and it crashed near them. Duke, half of his armor was blown off, and Chiron's body was a bloody mess. He was barely able to right himself before he hit the ground. He slid across the ground. Chiron wanted to immediately get back onto his feet, but he swayed as he fell back to the ground. From the other side, Almeric was approaching them. A strong gale was wrapped around his body. It has been a while since someone made my blood curdle. If you were a little bit more proficient in your technique, I might have lost my head today. Almeric didn't look untouched. Various parts of his armor were ruined, and there were wounds on his face. Chiron had fought hard until the end. He hadn't allowed Almeric to use incarnation. He went all out from the beginning with the intent of killing Almeric in the initial salvo. However, Chiron didn't have the power to end the fight. After Almeric was able to use incarnation, Chiron was barely able to hold on. In the next moment, a thunderous roar rang out from across the forest, and a big cloud of dust rose into the air. It was obvious, 
but it was a roar that was formed when Regis used his soul hammer. Someone surged in the sky. It was Leticia, who was surrounded by her blue-white dragon soul. It has been a while since I had this much fun. Miss. Suddenly, Regis appeared in front of them using instantaneous movement. He had finished his transformation, so he was wearing his pure white armor. He was also emitting a massive amount of dragon demon magic. While off balance, Leticia tried to counterattack. She tried to attack with a do or die spirit, but Regis's speed had become too fast. An explosion rang out as she fell from the sky. She was somehow able to avoid a direct hit, but her arm was broken. She lost her grip on her spear. It seems nothing worked out as planned. After falling to the ground, Leticia shuddered as she lay on the ground. It seems we are done. During all of this, Atain had finished sealing the tree god. The spells that had been pressuring Laura and Euron rose in intensity. It was as if the tense fight up until now had been a lie. The battle had shifted in Atain's favor. Laura and Euron was filled with desperation and despair. Atain asked him a question in such dire situation. Do you want to continue this? Chapter 208. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 7. This was the last question. Euron realized this fact. It seemed Atain really didn't want to kill his party. If they were spared, Atain knew that they would meet again as enemies. So why was he averse to ending them right now? If they gave up Azel to Atain, they would be spared. Why was Atain expressing his intent with such candor? Why, did he think it would be a shame to kill the rest of the party? Euron didn't think Atain had such romanticized reasons. The party was too strong for that to be true. It was true that they had lost, but depending on the situation, Azel's party could have flipped the result. If Azel hadn't been sniped in the beginning, would Regus and Almeric have been able to defeat Azel's party? No, there was enough reasons to believe that Azel's party would have won. Euron became sure of it after their party had fought the dragon demon generals. Unlike what he had worried about, their party was plenty strong enough. There was no way Atain didn't know this either. Why does he want to leave us alive? Even Almeric and Regis was agreeing with Atain's desire. It wasn't as if they weren't capable of killing Chiron and Leticia. They just chose not to kill the two. Euron desperately churned his brain. It was a situation where a knife was pressed up against his throat, yet he kept thinking over it. Shit. I have no idea. I have too little information. In the end, Euron gave up on answering the question. You definitely have a reason for doing this. Him, you are trying to subordinate Azel into the great darkness, and you are going out of your way to spare us. You have your reasons for doing this. Of course. Moreover, our life can be preserved if we hand over Azel to you guys. Our lives are in immediate danger, so we should take advantage of your arrogance and generosity. It would be prudent to fight another day. What are you trying to say? Atain tilted his head in puzzlement. Euron let out a weak laughter as he spoke. I'm scared. Euron ignored the question as he said what he wanted to say. I'm not afraid of losing my life. I might be satisfied or dissatisfied with the way I die, but I'm not afraid of death itself. That is an interesting speech. So what are you afraid of? Atain showed interest in Euron's story. Almeric and Regis showed sign of being bored, since this was another rubbish exchange between two magicians. Atain and Euron didn't pay any attention to them. Euron spoke. I am most afraid of finding out who I am. Him. You want to talk about your identity? That topic came out of nowhere, and I'm not sure this is the time and place to talk about it. I think you are in similar yet different situation as me. What are you afraid of? Atain. According to Azel, you were fearless. I guess so. What are you so afraid of? What makes you want to change this world so desperately? Atain flinched. The first question didn't elicit much of a response, but Atain's attitude changed this time. Maybe, for a brief moment, Atain mulled over his answer before he spoke. I think I'm most afraid of being the last one left. Are you talking about loneliness? I am. A truly odd atmosphere was forming. Almeric, Regis and the rest of Azel's party looked at the two of them with baffled expressions on their faces. However, the two of them were serious. 
I believe that fear arises from the part of me that is part demon. Or maybe it might be a fear all intelligent beings feel including humans. Atain continued to speak. I'm afraid of being alone. I started walking the surface of this world without needing parents. It didn't take too long for me to realize that I was living in a different time frame than other beings. Did you feel this as you watched the humans? In the beginning, it was as you described. However, when others of my race started to show up, I realized that they were no different. It was extremely rare to find a first-generation dragon demon that transcended their life expectancy. Even if they were able to transcend above their life expectancy, they eventually died in some form or fashion. Everyone was born later than me, yet they died faster than me. At first, I was hurt by that fact. However, I became numb to it at some point. Those that I became interested in and those that I cherished disappeared within the flow of time. I became used to it. As these experiences accumulated, Atain's perspective on the world continued to broaden. He looked beyond himself. He saw the towns, cities, countries then. He finally looked past the species called humanity to look at the entire world. Life is given when someone is born. It is natural to get old and weak. Death is inevitable. At times, one becomes happy or sad. In the end, it is necessary to confront it. For a time, Atain had wanted to keep the people he treasured by his side. He tried all kinds of methods, but in the end, he was humbled. He had to accept their deaths. The problem was the fact that the four phases of life wasn't limited to individuals. It also applied to communities. Humans died when they got wounded, sick or old. It was the same with communities and civilizations that were built by humans. Nothing was eternal in this world. A country possessing illustrious history had a lifespan, and from a time's perspective, it would disappear one day. As history continued to unfold, Atain saw more examples of this, and his fear grew. Euron Rizester, do you know that there are many intelligent beings in this world aside from humans and dragon demons? That, the one that immediately comes to mind are the orcs. Humans were the most numerous in this world. Humans had thrived but they weren't the only intelligent race in this world. Atain spoke. In the olden days, there used to be an intelligent race that had flourished as much as the humans. They were a race called the Arps. They might be mentioned in the legends of humanity. Are you talking about the children of Mother Earth? They were also called that, and they went extinct during the era of the Five Star Kingdom. At one time, they had occupied a large territory, and they had developed their own civilization. They went extinct thanks to my error. What? Euron had never even imagined such a story. Atain had a faraway look as he spoke. It happened all because of the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Atain had used the Dragon Slayer's ritual to reset the relationship between the humans and dragons. It had drastically changed the world. The humans had been scattered up until that point. They started to band together, and they quickly expanded their territory. In the end, humans and the Arps clashed. They were called the children of Mother Earth, and they lived in coexistence with the dragons. The power generated when they were in a group provided vitality to the territories of the dragons. This was why the dragons hadn't assumed a hostile attitude towards them. On the other hand, the Arps were small and scarce in number. They were almost equal in population with humans before the dragon slayer's ritual. That was how much the dragons had been keeping the numbers of humans in check. On the other hand, the Arps were more long-lived than humans. Once the humans started gaining power, their greed was endless. Moreover, Arps were also greedy. At the time, Arps were using humans as slaves. Aside from intelligence and ability to feel emotions, Arps were much stronger in battle than humans. The slavery was a natural consequence of this. A comparable analogy was dragon demons ruling over humans in a closed society. On the other hand, the Arps had been more numerous than the dragon demons, and they couldn't procreate with humans. They were of completely different race from humans. The two greedy races clashed against each other, and one was wiped out. Atain tried his best to salvage the situation, but in the end, the Arps were wiped out. Atain brought up a different topic. Euron Rizester, you knew about the true identity of the Great Darkness. 
That is why you guys were destroying the pillars. However, do you truly know what is within it? Maybe. I know why you are trying to hide information from me. But it might be more beneficial if you talked about it. Do you know about Reginor? You don't know about him. Who is he? He is the last of the Arps. The race of Arps were wiped out, but a single survivor did exist. He had transcended the common sense of magic, and he had transcended the lifespan of an Arps. His name was Reginor. If one used this era as the standard, he has been sealed for about 1,500 years. Thankfully, you guys didn't find him. Why? If you awakened him, the world would have turned into paradise. What? Urin couldn't understand Atain's words. Atain laughed as he spoke. You saw what kind of transcendent beings I sealed within the great darkness. They all possessed power that transcended logic. You did do that. However, they don't seem so scary now. You have a way to defeat them. And since they've been sealed for a very long time, they've fallen behind time. Don't you think that's the reason why they don't seem so scary? I acknowledge that you have a point. It had been the case with the god of death, Belrun. In his era, he was an archmage that had been considered a natural disaster. If half a year was given to him, Belrun would have been a natural disaster once again. There was a chance that no one could have opposed him if he had been given that time. Atain spoke. The power acquired by Reginor was, time. Does that mean he can manipulate time to his liking? That's right. Reginor was the last survivor of the Arps race, and he was an archmage that controlled the power of time. He could accelerate, decelerate or stop time in a very large region. He could also assign different flow of time to different beings. Even without the power to manipulate time, he is an unstoppable force. The world he dreams about is. Originally, Reginor wanted to go back in time to his past. Even if he acquired the power to manipulate time, it was impossible to turn back time. He spent a very long time trying to do the impossible. He became tired, and he despaired. He gave up on his life's long wish to restore his race, and he melted into the world. He lived amongst those he had once hated, and amongst them, he was able to find those that he could love. Then he came to a similar conclusion as me. He didn't want to be alone again. For a very long time, Reginor had been lonely. Hate had been the only thing that had sustained him through the loneliness, but there was a limit to that method. He had given up on his earnest wish, yet he had once again found love again. He became afraid of repeating his own tragedy. It was akin to his race going extinct. Those that he was interested in were dying, and they were running into misfortunes. He was part of a community, and he was afraid of that community disappearing. He couldn't stand the feeling of loss and the loneliness of being alone. He feared it. That was why he decided to make the world into a paradise. It would be a paradise where no one suffered from loss. There would be no fights in this place. There would be no hunger or sickness. Since it would be a place that had left behind mortality, no one would get old and weak. It was the paradise everyone dreamed about. At the same time, it was agreed that such a world couldn't exist. However, Reginor thought he could do it, and he had the ability to do it. How? Time. Everything occurred within the flow of time. Humans starved and became weak, because time flowed. That was where all the problems arose. The flow of time is the root of all evil. The correct answer was to stop time. In a world where time was perfectly still, no one would be born, yet no one would die either. If he stopped the perception of time in the material world, all problem would be eliminated. He'll allow the members of his society to be connected through dreams. It would be a mental world where everyone could live a satisfied life. Forever. All possibilities would be killed and only those that exist could live in eternal peace and satisfaction. This was the paradise that Reginor had devised and wanted to bring about. Chapter 209. The Return of a Legend 2. Part 8. Euron looked sick. He's lost his mind. I guess it is to be expected. Every being sealed within was like that. That is why I sealed him. Of course, there was a part of me that sympathized with his feelings, and I agreed with his plan to a certain extent. However, I came to the conclusion that a world where no new possibility could be born couldn't last forever. 
The mind world and the material world are two sides of the same coin. If new possibility cannot be provided on one side, I worried the other side would become starved. Yuren's expression turned peculiar. Atine's reason drastically differed from what he would have come up with. Does that mean you wouldn't have gotten in the way of Reginor, if a true eternal paradise could have been created? I think so. His method had the possibility of transcending the many problems of this world. He might have created a utopia. Amongst the twelve transcendent beings I sealed, Reginor's goal was the most realistic and idealistic amongst them. The others were like the beings you guys put down. They were trying to fulfill inadmissible ideas. You call that idea realistic. You are crazy too. If seen from the perspective of a human, I won't deny that it looks that way. However, Atain continued to speak in a calm manner. Every one of them had come to the same conclusion as me. They wanted to create a paradise. I guess you started the dragon demon war to create your ideal nation. No. I'm talking about something that is much more fundamental. Each and every one of them thought they would someday be alone. Humans died. Nations made by humans perished at some point in time. Then, I believe humanity will become extinct someday. If a person he loved died, it was sad. However, he could accept it with humility. However, what happens if there weren't anyone that he could sympathize and communicate with? What happens if no one was left? He couldn't accept the fear caused by this idea. It wasn't just Atain. Every single being that was sealed possessed the same fear. They all knew that humanity would become extinct someday. If left alone, the unending malice of humans would cause them to kill each other. They all wanted to stop that. They all thought their own method could ensure that the future would be perpetuated through eternity. They were all sure that their own method was the only method that could guarantee success. I like the fact that the things I made was passed down and improved on. I like that my story was told. I'm fine even if I become a distorted version myself. I don't mind if humans repeat their foolish mistakes. I'll tolerate anything if I'm not the only one left in this world. Atain lived for a very long time, and he remained a stranger to everyone. No one could exist in the same time frame as him. The dragon demon generals were like children to him. Countless meetings and partings repeated itself. His interests and attachments dimmed towards individuals. He now saw everything as a whole, and he watched everything at a distance. His goal for humans. His goal for all intelligent beings was survival and happiness. Euron spoke. You are. You are egotistical at a really grand scale. I won't deny that fact. I changed the world for myself, and I'm trying to change it again. However, I think I can understand how you feel by a very minute amount. You are human, yet you are saying that. Atain tilted his head. From his perspective, the human youth was like a mayfly, yet Atain didn't express anger or ridicule. He just looked puzzled. Euron spoke. It happened because of you. You probably already know this, but I grew up under the care of the fanatics that worship you as a god. I know that. That place was a factory that created more fanatics. The dragon demon king worshipper fostered numerous children, and they were crammed with madness. They were created to be fanatics in this factory. Each children's thought process was separated from the common sense of the world. Anyone that wasn't a dragon demon king worshippers were great sinners. They could be killed with impunity. No, it was righteous to kill the non-believers, and one shouldn't feel afraid of sacrificing one's life to kill them. Everyone was made to think the same, and Euron had awakened to his own sanity thanks to the guide. He became a loner from that point on. Everyone that breathed and occupied the same space as him spoke the same language, yet he couldn't empathize with them at all. From Yuren's perspective, they were all monsters in the visage of humans. I couldn't share joy or sadness with them. It wouldn't have mattered if it was something inconsequential. It would have been great if I could laugh with them, but there was no way I could do that. He could pretend to be like them on the outside. However, that was just a necessary attempt at survival. He had to act. Fear and loneliness was the two emotions that had ruled over Euron for a very long time. That is why I can understand your feelings a little bit, Atain. I see. Atain let out a bitter laugh. 
Atain didn't deny Yuren's claim that he understood how Atain felt. For a moment, the two of them shared a small portion of each other's loneliness. Yuren spoke. Shall we go back to the beginning? That is why I'm scared. I still don't understand what that has to do with your identity. I don't know who I am. I am Carlos Rizester's descendant, and I was grown to be a human weapon by the hands of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. It still leaves many unanswered questions. Didn't I tell you earlier? I was awakened by an unknown being called the Guide. You did. I really am curious to know his identity. You might be able to find out soon. Anyways, someone planned out my destiny. Still, I am thankful for being allowed to understand freedom. I'm thankful for being able to choose my own fate. Then why are you afraid? I've been lonely for a very long time. However, I'm no longer lonely. Yuren turned to look at his comrades. He did not elaborate any further. The words he had spoken right now was so embarrassing that it was hard to bear. I no longer feel lonely thanks to them, and I'm afraid of hurting them. Yuren spoke those words as he took out something from his pocket. It was nondescript. It was a fist-sized steel box. Carlos had given it to him. It was called the Box of Hope. Yuren had been warned that he would face irreversible destruction when he opened it. Azel. Yuren's gaze remained on Atain as he spoke. I know you are awake. So do you mind answering me? Yuren. You. Azel answered him. It was clear that Azel was flustered. He didn't care that Yuren realized that he was awake. However, he cared about the fact that Yuren had went out of his way to reveal his consciousness to his enemies. Azel had received help from Arietta. She had given him emergency treatment to his wounds, and he was waiting for an opportunity to go on the counteroffensive. He was severely injured, but he was able to use incarnation. He would time the move with an all-out assault by the Guardian Shadows. He judged that it would allow them the opportunity to escape from this place. From just that single phrase from Yuren, his plan became useless. Yuren knew this, yet he continued to speak calmly. You spoke about me with Carlos Nim, right? I know that you know a secret, and it is something that you are having a difficult time telling me. I picked up on it. In truth, it was quite apparent from Carlos Nim's attitude when he gave me this item. Unlike the other party members, Yuren couldn't be trusted. Carlos had made this judgment, and this was why Yuren wasn't given any items that increased his overall capabilities. Moreover, Carlos had made sure that Laura was the only one that could look into the magic tome left behind by Carlos. Yuren wasn't an idiot, so he easily realized what was going on. It would be a lie to say he wasn't hurt by their actions, but he also understood why they had decided that course of action. I'm afraid, because I cannot trust myself. Therefore, how can I ask others to believe in me? Azel let out a bitter laughter as he looked at Yuren. Azel's gaze rose to meet Yuren's eyes. I am thankful. Yuren's gaze was directed towards his comrades. Azel, Laura, Chiron, Leticia and Arietta. By meeting you all, I was able to like myself just a little bit. Yuren, please tell me about Carlos Nim's conjecture as to what my identity is. I want to hear it from you. For a moment, Azel read a familiar emotion in Yuren's eyes. He had seen it so much that he was sick of it. These emotions were something Azel no longer wanted to see in the eyes of others. Yuren was ready to die here. When Yuren realized Azel's plan, he messed it up, because he had made up his mind. His sacrifice would bring about a better result than Azel's plan. That was what he determined. Carlos surmised that you might be the reincarnation of Kealia. Kealia, isn't she a Tyne's third wife? How? Yuren couldn't understand how this could be possible. In truth, Yuren had expected Azel to name Ornsaurus or Baldazar. Carlos had fought in the Great Darkness to stop the revival of those two, so Yuren believed that one of those two had been reincarnated as himself. Azel spoke. It isn't well known, but Kalia is an existence that knows the technique of reincarnation. Before she became a Tyne's wife, she had her own kingdom and she was continuously born again through her descendants. She had lived for a very long time, and she was very powerful. Ah, that's why. He accepted the explanation. It lined up too well with the theory he had about his own identity. At the same time, 
he was sure that they were wrong. I'm not Kaalia. If Regus possessed a living body at that moment, Euron might have felt something was off when he saw Regus's expression. For a brief moment, Almeric had flinched, but he had schooled his expression. Unlike Almeric, Regus would have had an odd expression on his face. However, Regus was an undead now. He was also in his transformed state, so his expression couldn't be viewed by anyone. That is why Euron could only trust in what he felt in his guts. Azel spoke. According to the information gathered by Carlos, Kaalia lived as a completely different person until she is awakened. At some moment, she awakens to become Kaalia once again. Carlos worried that we would face an archmage that rivaled the dragon demon generals when you awakened. He was afraid you would become our enemy. Azel had spoken to Laura about this. He believed there was no way Euron would become their enemy. It wasn't a lie. If Euron became conscious of his identity as Kaalia, his sense of self as Euron would die. Kaalia would take its place. Thank you. When he heard Azel's answer, Euron let out a bright smile. The regrets. If I'm to be truthful, I still have many left. However, I think I can leave them behind. He still didn't know what his identity was. If he continued on this path, his fear might be realized. He might awaken to become the enemy of his party. That was why this was the right time for him. He believed in his ancestor Carlos. Carlos had been suspicious of Uren's identity, so Carlos had given him this item. There was no way this item would cause harm to Azel. I don't care what my identity is. The only important thing right now was the fact that he would never turn against his comrades. The truth might destroy his soul, but if it was the cost to saving his comrades, he would gladly accept it. Thank you for waiting, Atain. You still have something you can do. I'm happy to say that I do have something. Euron grabbed the box of hope. Azel, Laura and Arietta. He laughed as he turned to those that were still conscious. Please give my thanks to Leticia and the Duke. He opened the box, and black darkness started pouring out. Chapter 210. Past and the Future. Part 1. Maybe, he knew it at an instinctual level. He knew that he was a mirage-like existence. Euron was an outsider. He had always questioned his origin, and the only time he hadn't been tormented by this question was when he was being brought up as a fanatic by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. After being awakened by the guide, it felt as if he was traveling on a boundless ocean. He had been able to see the world through his own will, and he had been able to choose his own fate. He had feared the truth, yet he still questioned his own identity. He had been afraid of the moment when that question would be answered. That ended now. Who cares? It was different now. He could laugh with relief. In the end, he would die here. This was why he could easily accept his long-awaited answer even if it was cruel. I see. Soon, Euron realized what Carlos had arranged for him. Carlos had prepared a spell that broke the restrictions placed on Euron. If Euron was a being that continuously reincarnated, the guide was his subconscious mind. The spell allowed him to bring out all the memories stored in his subconscious. Euron would be able to use his latent potential all at once. In the process, Euron's sense of self would be destroyed. However, his life was already forfeit, so this was a last resort move. He wouldn't worry about what would happen next. This wasn't the only method he would use to achieve his goal. He had prepared a trump card. In this place, Euron would be able to become invincible. I can use the Guardian Shadows as a source for magical energy. For a short time, I'll able to use magical energy that transcends what my body could hold. There are over 600 Guardian Shadows gathered here, and their number is increasing by the minute. If I can combust the magical energy that constitutes the Guardian Shadows, I can become an invincible magician. From this point on, very few beings would be able to contend with Euron in terms of the amount of magical energy he could use. As a price, Euron would lose his life, but he didn't care about that. So this is how I die in this life. Suddenly, Euron heard a familiar voice from the corner of his mind. It was the voice of the guide, which he had always heard within his dream. It is an end that I hadn't expected. I woke up before I greeted death. Has it always been like that? Euron asked the question. 
At the same time, the memories that answered his question came to mind. For over 200 years, the guide had been reincarnated 14 times. He had always been born as someone on the lowest rung of society. It had been very difficult to overcome the fate he was born with. At times, he died from starvation. At times, he died from a disease. At times, he was murdered by someone else. The dreams about the guide only appeared when one's sense of self was clearly established. It usually occurred from ages 12 to 15 years old. This was why many reincarnated versions died before the guide could approach them. They died when confronted by their harsh fate. The guide always awoke at the end of their lives. He was the first one to start this chain of reincarnation. For a short amount of time, the guide was able to regain his sense of self. He reconciled any lingering regrets, and he went through the process of getting ready for his next reincarnation. That's right. However, it's different this time around. It seems this will truly be my end. I agree. Let's end this disillusion. For some reason, Euron was sure of it. This would be the guide's last reincarnation. You don't have any regrets. I do. I'm overflowing with it. He still had a lot of things he wanted to do. He wanted to fight with his friends, who had healed his loneliness. He was invested in the fight, and he wanted to see the end to this fight. He also wanted a life afterwards. However, I'm fine now. This is all I can do. I'll leave everything here. Euron spoke his true feeling, then he asked the guide some questions. So who are you? Isn't it time to tell me? You still don't know. The guide sounded odd as he asked the question. He sounded amused, yet he also sounded bitter. Great darkness. Atain felt confused. The stuff that was pouring out of the box opened by Euron was the great darkness. As if to prove that he was right, darkness rose from the ground like wildfire. The great darkness that had pulled around the sealed tree god responded to the darkness that had poured out of the box. From a far away distance, the sound of a song started to resonate. Regus spoke out in surprise. What the hell? Something is wrong with them. The guardian shadows, who were clustered in a faraway distance, started to sing. They started to swell like a white wave. It was as if many children were whispering at the same time, and the sound of their singing kept overlapping each other. It shook space. It was such an overwhelming amount of magical energy that it made one shudder. It surged forward like a tsunami. The amount was larger than the combined magical energy of Atain, Almeric and Atain. Then the darkness split. It feels like I'm about to perish. Euron walked out of the darkness with a massive frown on his face. It was as if he was suffering under a splitting headache, and he wanted to throw up immediately. Darkness poured out from his surrounding. It was as if pitch black waters were pouring out of a bowl. At the same time, the guardian shadows started to swarm in. An explosion rang out. When Euron showed signs of changing into something dangerous, Almeric had ran in. However, Almeric was bounced off by Euron's counterattack. For some reason, I have a very good idea as to how you fight. Euron mumbled to himself. When Almeric had jumped forward, Euron knew what method Almark would be using. Euron had read the signs given by the magical energy, and he knew what would be coming. Euron attacked with a magic that formed three times faster than the one being used by Almeric. I'm overflowing with magical energy. You guys should play with me to the end. Euren's eyes shone. At the same time, countless spells were activated at once. The spells assaulted Atain, Almeric and Ragus. Hurry up and go. The overwhelming firepower pushed back the three dragon demons, and Euron shouted his words. He yelled towards his back where his comrades stood frozen. Hurry up and go while I occupy them. Euron felt pain. It was as if his head was about to be crushed. He didn't know who owned these memories, yet they kept pouring out like a flood. It was hard for him to maintain his concentration. If he let go of his mind, he would be swept up by the torrent of memories. His thoughts would become paralyzed. Tears were flowing down his face. Euron hadn't experienced these memories, yet the sadness opened up a fountain of tears. Then he felt a surge of anger. The memory of someone's pent-up anger made his heart pound. Ha! Is this it? The amount of memories flooding into him was massive. 
Too many fragments of memories were assaulting his mind, so he couldn't make sense of most of the memories. Before he became conscious of the details, only the echoes of the powerful memories were left. The fragments of memories were sent to the other side of his consciousness, and it started to stack. If he was a normal person, his mind would have broke. However, Uran was maintaining his sanity. He was familiar with this work. Whenever he fused with a demon, his mind was assaulted with an endless amount of evil thoughts. He had trained to protect his mind, and this was why he was able to endure this mental assault. You play very hard. However, I don't think this is enough to stop me. Ragus charged through the hail of spells. He had finished his transformation, so he was pushing off the ground at incredible speed. In a flash, he was already in front of Euron. Endless plane. When Ragus was about to swing his soul hammer, he was suddenly very far from Euron. Euron had copied the ability of the Vitten's chalice using his magic. You still only know how to charge forward like a boar, Ragus. What? Euron's tone of voice was full of meaning, and it surprised Ragus. However, it didn't matter if Ragus was agitated. He continued to move. He struck the ground with all his strength. The soul hammer overturned the earth. At the same time, the dimensional distortion was broken. The soul hammer had the power to destroy mind and soul. It destroyed the magical energy that was forming the dimensional distortion. Ragus wondered if he had heard wrong. When the soul hammer hit, the sound of an explosion rang out. Since he was at the epicenter of the explosion, the sound should be the loudest near him, and as the sound travels, it should fade away. So why did he once again hear the sound of an explosion near him? He soon had his answer. The ground should have overturned, and the shockwave of his attack should have spread in a cone-like fashion. However, the shockwave had come back towards Ragus. It defied the laws of nature as the shockwave was focused on him. It was as if he was being enveloped by his own attack. Was this also a trap? This bastard. It seemed Euron hadn't attacked as hard towards Ragus. It had been an attempt to bait Ragus into an attack, and the endless plane was placed there as a trap. Euron had predicted Ragus's moves. He had created a second endless plane to return the shockwave towards Ragus. Even if one was successful in replicating the ability of the Vitten's chalice, it didn't mean one could freely use the endless plane. The second plane of darkness was placed there in advance and it would have only been effective if Euron had predicted his opponent's moves. Euron had sent in an additional attack with the intent of ending Ragus. However, the attack was stopped. Atane had gotten involved in the fight. Who are you? Atane was taken aback as he asked the question. Euron answered him. I still don't know. However, I'll find out soon. Euron and Atane performed a magic battle at high speeds. In between the explosions and lights, there were the sparks of unrealized spells. The after-effect of the unrealized spells twisted the flow of magical energy. This, then Atane started being pushed back. Euron and Atane were in a tight magic battle. In the beginning, Euron had assaulted Almeric to a point where he couldn't intervene in the fight. Ragus's weakness was exposed, and he had been flung far away in distance. Hmm, even if you are receiving magical energy from an outside source, I can't believe this is the skill level of a young human. In terms speed and efficiency of using magical energy, Atane was above Euron. In all other terms, Euron was above Atane. In fact, Euron was superior in forming multiple spells at the same time. Atane, why is your magic so outdated? Euron felt the same sense of incongruity felt by Laura. The spells used by Atane were outdated. Atane was the creator of magic and he had always been ahead of his era. Even if he was trying to cover it up using wondrous techniques, he couldn't hide the fact that his spells were woefully outdated. Also, why can't you use incarnation? For some reason, he was sure of this fact. Atane wasn't choosing not to use incarnation. He couldn't use it. At that moment, a lightning flowed backwards as it rose into the sky, and a fierce magical storm ripped the sky apart. Almeric shot out from within the storm, and he used incarnation. It was a mixture of clones. Some possessed presence, and some didn't. Several dozen forms of Almeric moved in irregular patterns as they attacked Euron. 
I'm fighting three of you. It seems our roles are reversed from our last fight. Euron snorted. At the same time, more of him started to form. They weren't being formed through Euron. Massive amount of power was being produced by the Guardian Shadows by combusting the magical energy that had been forming them. Now multiple Guardian Shadows were clumping together to form clones of Euron. Incarnation. A human magician is able to do this. Almeric was taken aback. In a flash, his cloning technique had been seen through. Euron could differentiate between what was real and what was false. Euron was opposing Almeric as he fought with Atain and Ragus. It was all possible, because Euron had used incarnation. Incarnation was the pinnacle technique of the dragon arts, yet a human magician was using it. Dragon arts and spirit order is just different facet of magic. Do you really think I can't recreate your techniques using magic? You've lived so long, yet you are looking down on magic too much, Almeric. As he spoke, Euron continued to increase in number. At the same time, his spell continued to expand as it approached its zenith. Chapter 211. Past and the Future. Part 2. Incarnation was frightening, because it truly was a way to, increase oneself. Incarnation could only be learned by those that could manage numerous threads of thoughts all at once. If one made a clone with presence using incarnation, it wasn't as if one's mind was controlling two bodies. In a flash, the user's mind was copied to make a clone. Even if it was Azel or Almeric, there was a limit to how many thread of consciousness one could maintain all at once. When one used a secret technique, one had to use all of one's concentration to manifest it. When there were over 30 bodies, it was impossible to have fine control over those bodies. However, what if these independent clones were given one common root? What if they interlocked to form a form of hive mind? This was the secret to the reason why Azel was able to display enormous power after he created numerous clones. It allowed him to transcend the limitation of human thought process and senses. It was the same for Euron right now. Moreover, Euron possessed enormous magical energy that was supporting this move. If he was like a flood before using incarnation, he was akin to a tsunami now. Eight clones were formed through incarnation. The spells made by them raised the forest, and it swept away the three legendary dragon demons. Kook. This reminds me of the old days. Ragus pushed to the front to become a barrier against the attack. From behind him, Almeric used his incarnation. He poured out his thunder and storm winds to blunt the spells coming towards them. Then, I see, it really has been a long time since the three of us fought against one opponent. Atain created a breach. All the spells that were falling from above was sent back to Euron using the Gatekeeper of Emptiness. The Sky's Fortress defended the three of them, and the Compendium of Pitch Darkness amplified Atain's magic. It allowed him to act as support. Then he summoned another dragon weapon. Come dragon weapon. Chain of Thunder. The thunder erupted from the ground, and it was several dozen times stronger than a regular thunderbolt. This was the result of Atain connecting his magic to the chain of thunder and the compendium of pitch darkness. When the overwhelming destructive power pushed back Yuren's magic, it created a vacuum. Almeric put away his incarnation, and he activated his dragon weapon's power. Persevere, storm scream. He shouted his command, and thunder swallowed up his sword. The transparent blade burned white hot, and in an instant, it turned into a massive sword of thunder that pierced the heavens. Thunder God's sword. He was using an archmage's magic alongside the magic of the dragon weapon. Then he made a connection with a different dragon weapon to concentrate the thunder. He gained explosive power. Atain and Almeric were connecting each other's power to create the ultimate sword of destruction. It could burn everything in its path. The light emitted by the Sword of Destruction stretched into the horizon. Everything in the path of the sword's magic was sliced like butter. Even the ground was split open. Unimaginably enormous heat and pressure exploded on the surface and the underground. It was a calamity. Everything evaporated when it was cut by the sword. Everything perished at its mere touch. The after-effect of the sword caused earthquake and explosions to form. The shockwave extended outwards, and scalding winds whirled around them. At that moment, the three dragon demons were in the fiery pit of hell.
If they didn't possess massive power, they wouldn't have been able to survive even a second in such conditions. Come dragon weapon, son of earth. However, Atain didn't end it there. After he dismissed the chain of thunder, he summoned a new dragon weapon called son of earth. The earth was being burned, and it was being broken. The dragon weapon gathered the power of the earth. It was as if the still remaining quake and heat was flowing backwards in time. It became focused in one place. Are you sure he isn't dead? Ragus immediately swung his dragon weapon, soul hammer. Maybe. Humph. All right. It had been a while since we've overtaxed ourselves. Soul hammer. This closely linked moves were something Atain and the dragon demon generals used against transcendent beings. It was their trump card. This was a calamitous attack that required the power of the dragon demon generals. When Almeric's storm screamer and Ragus's soul hammer was used, they would suffer temporary reduction in their power for a while. This was a testament to how burdensome this attack was to them. Let's go, you little brat without an identity. If you are alive, this strike will. You are causing too much trouble. From beyond the swirling fire and smoke, Uren's voice could be heard. It cut off Ragus's words. Euron had intentionally formed his words through magic, so his words were delivered to the three dragon demons. I want to thank you for showing me something that is so impressive. It was a close thing. If I hadn't remembered it, I would have been dead. I know it now. What? The soul hammer was letting out a light that was bright enough to burn out one's retinas. Ragus became puzzled as he held his vibrating hammer. At the same time, the hellfire split open as Euron appeared. Come dragon weapon. A powerful wave of dragon demon magic shook space. Almeric became shocked. He has a dragon weapon. Darkness engraver sword. It was a sword made out of complete darkness. It didn't reflect any light. Since it was absorbing all light, it didn't look real. A very alien sword showed up. It was. How are you able to use a Tyne's dragon weapon? Almeric was shocked so he asked the question. Ragus was also surprised, so he missed his opportunity to attack. He came to a stop. It's because. Euron laughed. He snickered, and his face was filled with pain and madness. It's because I am Atain. After Euron had yelled at him, Azul's party had escaped. It was pitiful and vexing. However, it couldn't be helped. They could have stayed behind to fight with Euron, but his last words took away that option. While I'm still Euron Rizester, you are my comrades. Run away. If Euron Rizester dies, someone else might take over this body. It will be the end if that happens. However, the act of escaping wasn't easy either. Chiron and Leticia were close to death. Azel had regained consciousness, but he still had a serious injury. Laura used her dimensional distortion, and it allowed him to skip a long distance. However, it didn't take too long for a great explosion to occur, and their surrounding turned into hell. It didn't allow any living beings to exist in such an environment. My god, Laura was shocked. If she had been a second too late in creating the Vitten's maze, her party would have been wiped out. Atain and Almeric had combined powers to form the Thunder God Sword, and its power was beyond imagination. In terms of physical destructive power, it might be stronger than Azul's sun lightsaber. Arietta, please be in charge of carrying everyone. Understood. Arietta nodded her head. When the Vitten's maze was dispelled, Laura would have to cast all kinds of protective and survival spells to withstand their current environment. While she was doing that, she would have to use dimensional distortion, so it would put a lot of burden on her. As expected, Scalding winds were swirling around them when she cancelled the Vitten's maze. If she breathed in this air, it would burn her from inside out. Laura had used her spell, so it was possible for her to breathe the air. Laura. A voice spoke to her from within the heat. Laura was startled, and she turned to look at the owner of the voice. It was Euron. Laura was like a doll. Her face had been expressionless, but a very faint disturbance appeared on her face. She had been taken by surprise. She couldn't sense the person that was walking through this hell-like condition like it was nothing. Euron shook his head. Stop it. I'm not your enemy. If you became our enemy, would you tell us that you became our enemy? Euron's own warning made Laura feel tense. Euron laughed. 
He was laughing, but his expression looked as if he was crying. I guess you are right. However, I'm really not your enemy. Not yet. Not yet. Also, this isn't my true body. Laura became surprised at his words. She just realized that the urine in front of her was a clone made through incarnation. What is he? He couldn't use the dragon arts or spirit order. He had used incarnation through magic. Even with her knowledge of magic, Laura couldn't make sense of how he had done it. Euron spoke. I'll be spare with my words. There isn't much time left to me. I'm trying to use this time to fulfill my most important task. Most important task. The one to ask the question was Azel. Soon, the party became shocked at the story told by Euron. You are Atane. Almeric was shocked as he asked the question. Euron had dark circles under his eyes as he snickered. That's right, Almeric. Come dragon weapon. At the same time as he dismissed one dragon weapon, he summoned others. Breath of wind. Volcanoes giant. From the thirteen dragon weapons possessed by Atane, Euron summoned those that had dominion over fire. A half-transparent blue cape appeared, and a ten-meter-tall fire giant appeared behind him. Their power took care of the hell-like environment. The fire and hot air quickly died down. Is this enough proof? Or maybe. Euron glared at them with bloodshot eyes, and clones started to appear next to him. The Thunder God's sword had destroyed all the clones, but there was still a lot of guardian shadows left. Moreover, more guardian shadows were arriving by the minute, and they were burning their own power for Euron. Frost Forest. Dream's Apostle. Moon of Wrath and Rest. Euron's clone continuously summoned the dragon weapons. In total, five dragon weapons were summoned. At this point, they had no choice to believe in Euron's assertion. Him. I see. Suddenly, Atane opened his mouth. Unlike the shocked Almeric and Regus, Atane looked interested. So you are the future me. That little brat is. Almeric asked in surprised. Euron looked at him. I deduced this from the attitude you treated Atane with. You knew he wasn't the dragon demon king. The reason why Regus and Almeric had acted insolent towards Atane was simple. The Atane in front of them wasn't the Atane they had served as the dragon demon king. It was the archmage Atane, who had adventured with them in the past. The compendium of pitch darkness, and the very old magic. I was wondering about it. Now I see. Euron couldn't hold back his laughter, so he chuckled. His memories were coming back. The fragments of memories had been pouring into his mind, and the memories relevant to the current event acted as a focus. His memories were starting to arrange themselves. This is driving me nuts. No. Am I already mad? I'm Dragon Demon King Atane. That is too much. In the end, Euron let out a laughter. Tears were streaming out of his eyes as he laughed. He looked mad. However, his laughter suddenly came to end. Euron wiped his tears with his sleeve as he spoke. You possess a Tyne's body. Atane had analyzed Reginor's power to create a technique. He left behind a copy that possessed all the information about himself. However, this was unlike a normal copy. This technique perfectly captured and recreated the version of Atane that had used the technique. It was as if time had been frozen, and now you were allowed to resume in time. As the final Alps, Reginor had the power to manipulate time according to his will. Atane had researched the power for several hundred years, and he was successful in analyzing the power. Through the great darkness, he was able to create a magic that controlled time. The result was the Atane in front of him. It was a version of Atane from a thousand years ago. If I'm to quibble over it, it is something I did, yet it really is baffling. My word, I revived a body from 220 years ago, and a copy of myself that had been frozen in time for a thousand years was placed within. No, let's leave it at that. Anyways, the form of the dragon weapons returns to its past forms depending on the user. Isn't this a new discovery? Isn't it? If we are to talk about new discoveries, I've been encountering them constantly. I'm experiencing it through you and your comrades. However, it seems you are right. The function, appearance and name of the dragon weapons had changed, yet it returned to its past forms when I used it. It really is interesting. Atane laughed as if he was amused. Chapter 212. Past and the Future. 
Part 3. Atain laughed as if he was amused. He didn't plan on contradicting Yuren's words. As soon as he woke up, he knew he wasn't the real Atain. He knew he was a fake. When the body was completely revived, the dragon demon king's mind hadn't returned to the body. Was it because the revival was rushed? No. It was because Atain's reincarnation was still alive. Even if the body was revived, Yuren hadn't died yet. At the very least, an awakening had to occur for the mind to return to the body. Yuren let out a sigh. I never expected it to be like this. It seems this plan was done in an overly complicated manner. I never expected him to be able to stop the time of a specific target. I also hadn't expected him to succeed in turning back the time. The mind within Atain was one from a thousand years ago. To be precise, it was a copy of Atain's mind at that moment in time. Atain had stopped a moment in time, and he had preserved that copy within the great darkness. It was a backup that would wear his body in case of emergency. Of course, the spells he used was outdated. At the time of the Dragon Demon War, Atain had progressed in his magic, and it wasn't something that the other magicians could make up in the past 220 years. The gulf between other mages and Atain had been that enormous. This version of Atain was using spells from a thousand years ago. Large portions of his spells had been spread to the masses throughout the years, so his overall level of power was lagging behind. The Compendium of Black Darkness was basically the prior iteration of a dragon weapon called Incarnation of Darkness. Since Atain lived for a very long time, he was able to advance the abilities of his dragon weapons. He was successful in changing the form and nature of the dragon weapons. However, when a user from a thousand years ago returned, the dragon weapons had acted accordingly. They had turned back into their prior forms to match its owner. Suddenly, Atain spoke. However, it is strange. Will you answer my question, my future self? From your perspective, I'm a being from a thousand years in the future. From my perspective, I belong to this time. I am of this era. For the sake of differentiating ourselves, you can call me Euron Resester. I'll do as you say. What are you curious about? If it is as you've said, this body is from 220 years ago. It was during the time of the Dragon Demon War, and it is yours. Reginor had failed to turn back the time of the world, but he was successful in turning back time for special targets. Reginor had wanted to rewind the time of the entire world. He had wanted to bring back his race, but Reginor had given up on that idea during the research phase. On top of that, he was an immortal even if he didn't manipulate time. Therefore, there wasn't much benefit for him to continue the research. However, the research held significance to Atain. Atain had sealed Reginor in the Great Darkness, and he analyzed Reginor's power. He researched on ways to use Reginor's power, and he found a way to recover his body. It wasn't making a body through an artificial process. Time could be turned back to a set point in time, and the body from that time could be recreated. The result was the Atain in front of his eyes. Why did it take 220 years? Even if it didn't occur as you intended, Almeric was able to revive several dozen years before you. The ritual had not only been for Atain. He had made it so that all four dragon demon generals would revive too. However, the result of his plan was failure. Ornsaurus and Baldazark hadn't been able to revive thanks to Carlos' interference. Regus had lost his body, so he had been revived as an undead. Euron smirked. You'll know it soon, yet you want to know it right now. I understand that I am merely a silhouette that doesn't belong in this era. When you awaken fully and take over this body, I'll be gone. Only my experience will be left behind. You still want to satisfy your curiosity knowing that. All right. First, the technique that turned back the time was a success. However, Atain's body was completely destroyed when he lost against Azel. If a corpse had existed, the revival would have occurred about 100 years faster. Is that the reason why Almeric had been revived faster than this body? Almeric's corpse still remained, and the guidelines left behind by Atain was adhered to. The body was thrown into the center of the great darkness, and the prerequisites to form the magic was completely fulfilled. On the other hand, 
Azel had completely destroyed a Tyne's body just in case. There wasn't even a single hair left behind, and the body perished far away from the heart of the Great Darkness. Basically, the revival had to overcome space and the retrograde of time. Of course, it would be difficult. So why was Regus revived as an undead? It's simple. It is unreasonable to expect perfect result for others. It was a worry Atain had when he made this technique, and his worry was proven true. Tisk, if I still had a corpse, I would have been able to eat meat and play with pretty ladies. Probably, you ran right into a trap like a boar, so you have only yourself to blame. Euron shrugged when he heard Regus's words. Atain asked a question. I think I understand now as to how I was formed. It's possible to revive the body by turning back the time. It is the same for the mind. However, the continuity of the memory is broken. The current Atain was a prime example of this. It was possible to use a technique to recreate a mind from a certain point in time. However, is that really me? Atain had that question. Would his past self, which had never experienced defeat, really be him? Would his past self, who hadn't experienced the sadness of someone near him die, really be him? That is why he wanted Kealia's secret technique. He knew Kealia's secret technique wasn't complete. Kealia had used a technique over the long years to reincarnate in the body of her descendants. However, this didn't guarantee eternal life. That is why Atain tried to remedy the shortcomings after learning the technique from Kealia. If it was only Atain and his magic, it might have been impossible. However, he had sealed twelve transcendent beings within the Great Darkness. It was a support system he could use. Depending on how he used the power of the Great Darkness, he could turn back time. He could recreate his past self in the current era. If he had the power of the Great Darkness, he was sure he could solve the problem of Kealia's technique. That was what he believed. However, it didn't work. What? When Euron gave a plausible explanation, Atain had assumed that the experiment was a success. Yet it was a failure. He was able to maintain continuity with the memories of his past. The problem was the fact that he couldn't avoid deterioration or changes in his memories. If he truly wanted to avoid these problems, he had to perform the ritual right before his death. He had to store it and call it up later. Nothing is easy in this world. He had to transcend time. He had to store his memory, so he could call up his past memories. It wasn't an easy task. He put in massive amount of time and effort into solving the problem. He found out that he had to go through a massive ritual to achieve his goal. The first couple times were fine. He had the great darkness, so he had great protection over his mind. However, suddenly, Atain brought up his question again. I didn't get revived through such a process. Also, you turned into Euron Rizester. What happened? Atain knew it would take a very long time to revive. On the other hand, Atain knew there was another method. There was the method of stealing the fate of his descendant to revive. It was possible for Niberus to become a Tyne's host. However, Atain hadn't chosen that method. He chose not to do that. He wanted to use his time wisely until his body's reincarnation was at hand. He had a reason for doing this. What was the reason? That is, Euron suddenly smirked. At the same time, he used a powerful curse spell. He ambushed them. Hmm. The three dragon demons had been on guard, so they immediately reacted. They blocked the attack. However, Euron had already finished making preparations for the battle. He used incarnation to make fifteen clones and he kept summoning his dragon weapons in succession. Why are you continuing this meaningless fight? Atain couldn't understand Euren's actions, so he asked the question. Euren was Atain. He hadn't completely awakened, yet he knew his own identity. Euren should know what he should do. So why was he trying to continue this fight? There is a meaning to this fight. You are a false image of the past. It is a meaning that you don't know about. Azul's party was moving quickly. They were riding Azel's dragon weapon called Crying Phoenix. Suddenly, Azel spoke. Euron, your body. In the beginning, Euren's clone was so well defined that it had been indistinguishable from his real body. However, Euren's clone was steadily fading away. 
It was proof that the magical energy making up this clone was thinning out. Euron spoke. It seems I've moved away too far. Since I don't have the incarnation of darkness, there is a limit to using a guardian shadow as a vessel. The clones made through incarnation couldn't move too far away from the original body. Even Azel had to create and dismiss his clones within a radius of several hundred meters. Euron had used the great darkness. He had used the guardian shadow as a vessel to make his clone last this long, but he was at his limits. Thankfully, I was able to do all I set out to do. Euron had achieved his goal in searching him out. It was an unexpected gift for the party. Azel, Euron spoke. From now on, a bitter fight will start. It will be completely different from now on. They will pressure you from all sides. Until now, they thought it would be enough to bring down the plane of darkness. Since Atain had revived, everything would change. Euron had found out about Atain's plan. Atain wouldn't move in the way that the plane of darkness had hoped for. Everything that'll happen from now on would shock those that reside within the plane of darkness. Still, I believe you guys will be able to win in the end. I have faith in you all. Thank you for everything. Azel knew that the time for a true goodbye had come. He was revealed to be the reincarnation of Atain, but he was Euron. His last act made Azel's party believe in this fact. Euron laughed as if he was embarrassed. That isn't necessary. Maybe, the fact that you are able to do this is part of Atain's design. The guide's identity was Atain, so it was possible. They had no idea why Atain had acted in this fashion, but in the end, everything was part of Atain's plan. It was part of his enormous destiny. It wasn't unfair to say that Euron was merely a puppet with strings attached to him. Still, I don't think of think you are a figment of the imagination made by Atain. You are our comrade. We believe in you, Euron Rizester. You chose to travel with us, and you chose how to use your life. I don't think it was done through Atain's will. It was done through your will. Euron was at a loss for words for a brief moment, so his mouth moved silently he felt like crying when he saw the trust in Azel's eyes. Thank you, this is why I want to confirm this for the last time. Euron, you know that you are the reincarnation of Atain, yet you chose us. Euron had tried his best to relay as much information as possible in a short amount of time. He told them about the identity of Atain, who had ambushed them. Moreover, he told them the true goal of Atain. The party had a clear idea as to what Atain was seeking through their conversation with Euron. Atain was trying to better the world. He had solved the language problem in the world by unifying the world's languages into one. It was an attempt to get rid of the tragedies from this world. It was the same reason as to why he had reset the relationship between dragons and humans through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. On top of that, he had tried to make the ideal nation through the Dragon Demon War. It was all for the same purpose. Atain, who had revived in this era, would do the same thing. His goal remained the same. It was his methods that differed each time. Azel, do you remember it? Chapter 213. Past and the Future. Part 4. Azel, do you remember it? What are you talking about? It happened at the time of the Dragon Demon War. Do you remember the last words spoken to you by Atain? Of course. How could he forget? Unfortunately, this experiment was a failure. I was still too ignorant. I have no choice, but to accept this truth. Atain's death had been imminent, yet he had calmly admitted his failure. Moreover, he had admitted that the war that had swept over the entire world was for an experiment. At the time, the goal of this experiment had been unknown. Atain's words had stuck in his mind. It haunted him like a vengeful spirit, and it created the fear he had towards Atain. Euron nodded his head. That is exactly Atain's view. Atain had tried to create the ideal society for the humans and the dragon demons. However, he found out something in the process. He didn't have a good understanding of the humans and the dragon demons, who were supposed to make up his ideal society. No, it would be more correct to say that he had understood them in the past, but he no longer understood them. He no longer understood them. What do you mean by that? Atain had lived too long. While living for a very long time, he got sick of seeing humans go through the four phases of life. 
This was also true for the rise and fall of nations. In the beginning, he had tried to make personal relationships with people, but as time passed, he gave up on that idea. As he did so, his view started to shift towards a macroscopic view of the world. He started seeing the world from an overly macroscopic view. He no longer loved individual humans. His love was transformed to the love of humanity. From this point of view, humans were like mayflies, and he could no longer understand humans. He communicated with the beings in front of him, and they shared the same space as him. However, Attain was having difficulty assessing the essence of a person. This was the reason why Attain started the cycle of reincarnation. It was an extremely hard-headed reason. He no longer understood what it was to be a human. He had to know the essence of a human if he wanted to create the world in the right way. That is also why he had honored my free will. Him. So what you are saying is. He wanted to understand the complete human experience. That is why your free will wasn't restricted. Yes. That is why I was able to be urine resistor. I remained human. A vague direction of how to live his life was given. And he was given enough power to overcome his fate. However. His free will hadn't been manipulated. This was how Attain engaged with his reincarnated selves. Attain took on the form of the guide. He let me keep my sense of self as he observed my life. Attain had taken a measure to protect his own sense of self. The reincarnation technique was incomplete, and he couldn't fix it. That is why he stored his sense of self within the great darkness. Then he decided to observe the newly formed personalities live their life. Until now, the relationship was unilateral. However, the barrier put up by Attain was brought down thanks to Carlos Nim. I was able to gain his memories, and I was able to see him from the opposite side. Attain was too enormous to be called a mere individual. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that he was almost a godlike figure. From such a lofty position, he peeked into the lives of his reincarnated forms. On the other hand, Urin was human and he had seen into the mind of a god-like being. Attain definitely has a sense of what is right and wrong. In some aspects, this makes him scarier than someone that is pure evil. Wasn't Urin a victim? Didn't Urin have his fate violated by Attain's good intention? That is why Urin had the right to criticize Attain. There was only one person in this world that was qualified to criticize Attain. It was Urin. I was born through his experimentation. I suffered from the consequences of his errors. That is why I oppose him as a human. I oppose him as Urin Rizester. The fact that he was a reincarnation of Attain didn't matter, and it didn't matter that he had originated from Attain. He was a completely different person from Attain. Are you satisfied with my answer? It is enough. Azel nodded his head. Urin laughed. It was as if a big weight had been lifted from his shoulders. I'll leave everything to you. This is the end of the road for me. Finally, Uren's figure disappeared. It was as if he had melted into the sunlight. Attain asked a question. Why? Why are you fighting me? My future self. You are wrong. Uren accelerated. His clones couldn't be differentiated from his real body. He charged forward at frightening speed as he poured out his spells. I am Uren Rizesta. A massive wave of magical energy spread out as he kept summoning his dragon weapons in order. Come dragon weapons. Gatekeeper of emptiness. Sky's fortress. Volcano's giant. Urin could summon more dragon weapons compared to the current Attain. The two of them were sharing dragon weapons. If one summoned a dragon weapon, the other couldn't summon it. Therefore there was a limited supply of dragon weapons that could be used in the fight so the fight came down to who had the most magical energy and the most developed techniques. Urin had the edge. Above all else, Urin was becoming stronger even now. Atine's memories were still pouring into his mind. It contained knowledge about spells. It also told him of the optimal way to use his senses. It was all becoming a part of Urin. At the same time, Urin's sense of self was slowly being submerged by Atine's memories. He had memories that had accumulated over a massive amount of time. It transcended the span of numerous human lifespans. The emotions within these memories brushed past his mind, and it made Urin want to let go of his mind. He couldn't tell if he actually knew the people in his memories. 
It was becoming hard to differentiate between his memories and Atine's memories. Was Huron the one that became sad after killing someone or was it Atain? He was no longer sure. I, Huron let out an extremely sad laughter. If he lost a little bit of concentration, it felt as if he would be swallowed up by Atine's memories. It was true that Huron held control over his mind right now, but the amount of memories flooding into him was too much. It was overwhelming. Atain asked a question. These spells and dragon weapons. Everything here proves that you are Atain. You know your own identity, yet you reject it, as expected of a figment of an imagination. Your words are empty. Euron snickered. It felt as if his head would shatter. All sorts of human emotions were flooding him from all sides, so he laughed as he cried. He felt rage burn in his chest at the same, and at the same time, he felt warmth in his heart from happiness. It was hard to shed these emotions. It was too difficult to maintain who he was. There was only one goal that was allowing him to maintain his sense of self. Are you trying to say that the pain I felt in my life is Atain's pain? There wasn't true at all. Atain never felt Uren's pain. His life had been ravaged as a consequence of what Atain had done. The world was scarred, and the madness that had erupted from that wound had captured him. From the moment he realized this, Uren had been fighting against his destiny. I don't care who I was in my past life. My pain and loneliness is all mine. I was born in this era as a human, and this is the life I've forged. I have no idea why. Atain was confused. What did my future self think when he came up with this idea? What great despair did he face too? You'll find out soon. The body had been restored, and the reincarnated form of Euron had awakened. Atain's revival was close at hand. It was inevitable. When Euron exhausted his power and died, the true melding of the body and mind will start. There was only one method to stop this. This method could only be carried out by Euron. But, Euron's eyes was burning with tumultuous killing intent. I have to kill you here, so my friends have a chance. He had to destroy Atine's body with his hands. If he was successful, Atine's revival would be pushed to a later date. At that point, he was sure Azul's party would be able to make it so that Atain never wakes up again. Atine's expression hardened. I won't go down easy. Can you feel it? At this moment, Uren's power was truly overwhelming. Atain, Almeric and Regus could attack at the same time, and they wouldn't be able to win. However, the balance of power was shifting as time passed. The change was occurring within Atain. His reservoir of energy was noticeably increasing. So this is how you do it. In a flash, another Atain appeared next to Atain. It was a clone that held substance. It was incarnation. Euron groaned. Atain started using incarnation, and the situation changed rapidly. Shit. Was he also affected by the awakening? Euron was a reincarnation that held Atain's soul. The past Atain possessed the body of Atain, but his soul was like a shadow of the real Atain. The past and the future was gathered in one place. When one side started to awaken, the other side was affected too. The past Atain's outdated spells were changing form. His spells started to advance towards spells used in the modern times. Him. Now we can breathe a little bit. Almeric and Regus started to move after they gained some relief from the magic battle between Euron and Atain. Up until now, they had been busy defending, but they had the opportunity to attack now. You were amazing, brat. While Almeric took down Euron's clones, Regus had flown right next to Euron. As soon as Regus swung his soul hammer, a large door of darkness appeared in front of him. Ah, I thank you for treating me like a human brat. However, be gone. It was the gatekeeper of emptiness. Regus was sucked into the gate of darkness, and he appeared impossibly high and far in the air. A trap is the best way to catch a boar. After getting rid of Regus for a brief moment, he created a dimensional distortion. Endless plane. Almeric had planned on following up on Regus's attack, so Euron had used his spell to block him. However, at that moment, Atain interfered with exquisite timing. He destroyed the formation of Euren's spell. After letting the Compendium of Black Darkness fight the magic battle in his stead, Atain charged towards Euron. 
Uran had been successful in making Almeric retreat, but it created an opening for Atane. He charged towards Uran as he summoned a new dragon weapon. Come dragon weapon. Darkness engraver sword. Atane was the only being in history to train both magic and dragon arts to the extreme. The sword was made out of perfect darkness. It didn't reflect light. It sucked in light, and one couldn't sense its mass in space. This alien sword struck out towards Uran. Uran used a barrier spell to resist against the attack. In a flash, Atane changed his posture as he used a different technique. A murky darkness extended from the sword as it encroached on Uren's barrier magic. When Uren reacted to the attack, an invisible attack impacted his body. Amazing. Is this the level of cultivation reached by my future self? Is this a new dragon weapon I made? Atane had baited the barrier to respond to his spell. Then he used the dragon arts to pierce through the barrier. Both attacks were based on magical energy, but there was a qualitative difference in how the attack manifested. Atane had used this to exploit Uren's defense. Memories were flowing into Atane's brain too. It was an extremely small amount compared to the amount of memories received by Uren. However, it was enough to increase Atane's skills drastically. On top of that, Atane didn't have to fight to keep his sense of self. He willingly and aggressively welcomed the memories of the future. He tried to embody what his body was supposed to be. Uren was a bloody mess as he was gasping for breath. There were still countless spells clashing and swirling around them. The three dragon demons weren't rash in their attacks. They were carrying out a hit-and-run strategy. However, the result of this battle was already determined. At this rate, Uren's power would dwindle, and he would meet his destruction. Atain asked him a question. Why? You are still curious about that? Uren laughed as if he was baffled. On the other hand, Uren could understand Atain's feelings. Atain's memories allowed Uren to understand how the mind of Atain worked. It was as if he was reading the palm of his own hands. It is obvious. I disagree with Atain's goal. You know who you are, yet your opinions haven't changed. That's the exact reason why it hasn't changed. Despite being the reincarnation of Atain, I didn't live as Atain. I am Uren Rizester. Uren was firm in his conviction. He wouldn't reject his self, because he found out the whole truth. He had no plans on giving his support to Atain. I'm sorry everyone. I knew it would be, be difficult to kill Atain. But at the very least, I wanted to kill either Almeric or Ragus for you all. However, it turned out it wasn't something so easily done. Uren smirked. He wanted to kill some of their intractable enemies to smooth out the path of his comrades, but it wasn't as easy as he thought it would be. However, he didn't despair. He had done all he could do. All that was left was to believe in his comrades. What a mysterious feeling. Until he met Azel, he had been in a deep depression. If he died at that moment in time, he would have cursed his fate as he died. However, he felt unbelievably light-hearted right now. It was amazing. He had comrades that would fulfill his life's goal, and it made him feel extremely reassured. Was it like this during the Dragon Demon War when Azel left the future to his people? He could understand why Azel had chosen to pass on his dragon weapons to them. It wasn't too bad. At the end of the fight, Uren smiled as he closed his eyes. It wasn't a bad life. Across the horizon, a massive darkness connected the sky to the ground as it started to spread. Chapter 214. Stolen. Part 1. The believers of the god were waiting. They wanted a modern-day miracle. They wanted proof. The people of this world worshipped many gods. No one knew if their gods actually existed. Even if a god was able to prove his existence in this era, it would merely become a legend. It would become a page in the long history of this world. However, there was a god that was an exception to this rule. Oh my king. At that moment, all the dragon demon king worshippers of the continent were watching. There was a pillar of darkness stretching from the ground to the ends of the heaven. The day has finally arrived. Not all humans could see it. However, all dragon demon king worshippers could see it. It didn't matter how far it was. It didn't matter if the terrain or weather got in the way. Nothing could obstruct the dragon demon king worshippers from viewing it. All dragon demon king worshippers could see it, 
and they knew what it implied on instinct. It was happening just as the prophecy said it would happen. Dragon Demon King Atain was back from the dead. You really are alive again, Atain. At the land located east of the continent, an enormous dragon mumbled to itself. It was the very first dragon to win the Dragon Slayer's ritual to acquire his wisdom. It was Alberton. Him. I still have no idea what he wants to do. Will he conquer the world once again to bring change to the world? Alberton asked the question to a dragon with dark blue scales. Overall, it had a sleek form. It was a water dragon. It was known for its command over the power of water. It was much smaller than Alberton, but it possessed the size of a common dragon. It was Lebeton, who was the dragon to earn wisdom after Alberton. Alberton spoke. The only thing that is certain is that he is going to do something grand. Anyone could guess that. Alberton turned to Lebeton, who had scolded him. A dragon demon youth was walking towards the entrance leading to Alberton's dwelling. He looked disheveled, but he possessed an eye-catching blue-white hair. He possessed white horns like a mountain goat, and he had green eyes. It was the first-generation dragon demon Rishu, who had created the dragon soul. When Rishu arrived in front of him, Alberton asked a question. Are you planning on leaving? Yes. Atain is calling for me. Rihu and Atain had last met at the end of the Great Darkness. Bayon, who was known as a sage, was assassinated by the ugly intention of the temple. Bayon had been one of Atain's reincarnation. As Bayon's life ended, Atain had woken up, and he had tried to take care of any lingering attachments left behind by Bayon. At the time, Rishu had been concealing his identity as he protected Bayon. At the end, Atain asked for Rishu to participate in his cause. The human world was overflowing with tragedies, and Rishu had been disgusted by it. That was why he had accepted Atain's offer. He started believing in the idea that Atain might be able to solve the problem. Alberton spoke. We might be enemies when we next meet. Who knows? If it does turn out like that, I won't go easy on you. How scary. Rishu, do you really believe that you are making the right choice? At Alberton's question, Rishu mulled over the question for a brief moment. He shook his head from side to side. I have no idea. Then why are you going out of your way to help Atain? If he is wrong, the resulting situation might be ruinous. I really love this forest. Rishu let out a bright smile. It was a world where humans had gained supremacy. Alberton had created a demonic land called the Alberton Forest to protect the weak. These were beings that were headed for extinction. The weak fall prey to the strong. It was the rule of nature. It was logical for the strong to rule over the world. However, everything needed moderation and balance. Since humanity's greed had grown to an uncontrollable level, Alberton had taken in the weak that were chased out by humans. He established a land enclosed by a fence where the survival of one species was guaranteed. He had created Alberton Forest with such intention. However, it was also true that the Alberton Forest was more primitive and brutal than the outside world. The Alberton Forest also followed the law of the jungle. There was violence amongst residents, and they fought for power within the forest. Despite this fact, Rishu liked the forest. It was barbaric, but everyone followed the rules and they kept to the code of honor. You created a birdcage, old man. That isn't the answer I want. I still haven't found the answer in my lifetime. I decided to gamble on someone that might be able to find the answer I want. As a result, he would have to fight against his beloved homeland. Rishu didn't want to miss out on this opportunity. Suddenly, Alberton spoke. You'll have to fight Azel to the death. It is inevitable. Unfortunately, when Rishu spoke to Azel last time, he made it sound as if the fight between them was an uncertainty. However, Rishu already knew this truth at the time of the conversation. Azel couldn't forgive Atain. Azel had hesitated to fight Rishu. Azel's state of confusion meant that he had avoided resolving the uncertainty between him and Rishu. However, if Azel fought against Atain, it was inevitable that he would end up fighting Rishu. It is something I am willing to do. Rishu had already hardened his resolve. The Alberton Forest had become Rishu's home and Azel was his friend. Rishu would have to turn against them. 
He wouldn't go back on his decision. I should go now. I hope I do not have to meet you as an enemy, old man. Of course, that isn't up to me. Rishu ended his short goodbye, and he left. Atain opened his eyes. The darkness surrounding him dispersed, and his vision returned. It was as if he had awoken from a long sleep. Atain was in a haze as he looked at the world. How beautiful. It was a feeling that was very hard to express. His surrounding was devastated. Until not too long ago, this location had been a dense forest. There were only signs of destruction now. Everything was broken no matter where one looked. The trees and rocks were broken in a haphazard manner. The ground looked unsightly as if it had been dug up. Atain looked at the site as if he was mesmerized. It is still beautiful. His eyes headed towards the sky. The sky also didn't match his words. The sky was hazy. It made one feel depressed just looking at it. However, everything was eye-blindingly beautiful in Atain's eyes. These were sensations that could never be felt in the world of death. For a very long time, he had observed his reincarnation, while he was a step away from being alive. Now he was walking the earth in his own body. When he breathed in the air, the feeling evoked by the action moved him deeply. Suddenly, he heard someone's voice. Did his mind become affected because he was dead for so long? You are being rude to his majesty. How do we really know if he is the real king? First, we have to gain confirmation. Don't annoy me with talks about manners. You didn't really observe manners in the past either. I thought my way of speaking was courteous. It seems your memories don't match up with reality. I guess you were always like that even before you became an undead. It was Regus and Almeric. The two had been waiting for Atain in this desolate place. Atain put on a bright smile when he saw them. Regus and Almeric. It is good to see you again, my old friends. How long did it take for my body to become my true self? It just passed the 100th hour. Almeric responded in a respectful manner. Atain's eyes widened a little bit. It took that long. By my calculation, it should have taken about 30 minutes. It seems the will of a human, who is ready for death, is really strong. Are you talking about Euron Rizester? Yes, he was my last reincarnation. He was a human with a strong will. At Regus's question, Atain nodded his head. He had been the guide before he had woken up. He had watched Euron Rizester's life. He had learned a lot through Euron. He learned about his deification by the Dragon Demon King worshippers. He learned about their madness and how humans changed when gripped by this madness. He also saw what happened when a human was released from this madness. He saw how bright a human's resolve could be. Worry and fear. He was able to overcome both. His last struggle inflicted a great deal of loss on me. What kind of loss? Hundred hours. Atain spoke. If it went according to plan, my awakening should have lasted thirty minutes. Everything had been prepared, so it just had to be completed. However, Euron had interfered with that plan. While he remained alive, Euron used the techniques in Atine's memories. He had delayed Atine's revival as much as possible. As a result, Atain had wasted 100 hours in his revival. Regus and Almeric had to stay next to Atain in case of any unexpected problems that might arise. They had also been rooted to this spot for 100 hours. Amazing. If it wasn't for his interference, I would have been able to finish half of my tasks as soon as I was revived. I would have acquired Azel Karzak, and I would have been able to kill his party members. Azel Karzak was a human, who had killed Atain once before. Azel was a mere human that hadn't reached immortality. It was the first time a mere mortal had bested Atain. He was too dangerous to left alone. Atain had to subdue and acquire him at all cost. If Atain couldn't have him, Azel had to be killed. Almeric asked the question as if he was having a hard time understanding Atain. Your past self ordered us not to kill them. The past Atain wanted to subdue Azel. He had wanted to tether Azel to the great darkness, and if possible, he wanted to keep Azel's party alive. However, the revived Atain wanted to kill them all. It was quite confusing. Atain put on a smile. It can't be helped. My past self can't make the same judgment as my current self. Since a mistake could derail my plans, 
I didn't allow my past self to achieve my goals at all cost. I made it so that my past self maintained the status quo. This was why the past Atain had tried to subdue Azel, and he didn't try to mess with anyone else. It would be great if he could have left behind detailed instructions, but Atain could only freely interact with his reincarnations. However, it is something I insisted on doing, so I have to bear the consequences. I am thankful that I was relatively successful in overcoming death. I guess it is a luxury to expect more blessings. Him, since your majesty had been revived, it is only a matter of time. I do agree that Azel is a dangerous being, but that isn't true, Almeric. Atain shook his head from side to side. I know I will be hated by the world, so I'm prepared to be hated by the world. Azel Kazak is the knife forged by their hate. He is a blade created to stop me. Azel's battle capability and potential was high. However, he had grow way beyond what should have been possible for him. He had reached the zenith in his late twenties, because he had experienced all kinds of special experience. He had met special teachers that allowed him to maximize his abilities to the extreme. He survived fights with powerful enemies, and he earned new opportunities. His comrades entrusted the hope of humanity to Azel by leaving behind their superb dragon weapons to Azel. Atain believed the Azel really was the human chosen by this era. Even if I fight him with the experience I have now, victory isn't guaranteed. Of course, this time we'll be fighting under different circumstances. Still, I lost too much before I even started to move. It'll be hard to find a substitute. I have no idea what you are referring to. Almeric became puzzled. Atain let out a bitter laughter. Uran Rizester's last stand delayed my revival by 100 hours, and that isn't all. He also stole something very precious from me. What was it? It was. Chapter 215. Stolen. Part 2. Azul's party was able to escape the prospect of death through Uren's sacrifice. They earned time to regroup. It wasn't just Azel. Chiron and Leticia were also gravely wounded. This opportunity was worth its weight in gold. The party moved as far as possible, and they avoided locations that possessed access points to the Road of Emptiness. Then they received help from members of the Guardian Shadows to find a hideout. Healers were called in, and their wounds were treated. Atain had been revived. Suddenly, Azel mumbled to himself. Azel could feel it. The enormous darkness in the distance was contracting. Atain was the first and strongest magician, who was capable of changing the world with his power. He was Azul's mortal enemy, and he had woken up from a long sleep called death. Laura replied, I feel it. She was merely a traitor, yet she used to be a high-ranking officer in the Plane of Darkness. She had been connected to the Great Darkness in the past, and the remnant of that connection notified her that Atain had been revived. Azel spoke. All the thanks in the world wouldn't be enough for what Euron has done for us. He gave us so much time. Euron had delayed Atain's revival by 100 hours. In terms of days, it had been four days. If it wasn't for that time, Atain would have tracked down and killed Azel's party by now. On top of that, Euron had made sure to cut off the connection between the Great Darkness and the Vitans Chalice. They could no longer be tracked down through the Vitans Chalice. Even if Laura was killed, the Vitans Chalice would no longer return to the Great Darkness. In his limited time left, Euron had told the party about what measures he had taken. He told them why Atain wanted Azel. He told them about Atain's true goals, and what Atain was capable of achieving after his revival. The information evoked a deep fear within the party. In the past, Atain was tactically driven into a corner when he was separated from his army. The human alliance kept Atain's army in a gridlock, so Atain had to inevitably fight a one-on-one -on -one battle with Azel. He had lost. However, this didn't mean Atain's power wasn't endless. Instead of a one-on-one -on -one battle, his power was more suited for large-scale battles. During the Dragon Demon War, the human alliance had felt this truth to their bones. This was why the Human Alliance had sent Azel to keep Atain occupied. The one-on-one -on -one battle had been an attempt to keep Atain away from the battlefield. Azel, if you fight a one-on-one -on -one battle with the king, suddenly, Laura asked him a question. 
What is the probability of you winning? It is 50-50. It seemed Azel didn't even need to think about it before he gave her an answer. In terms of overall battle capability, Azel had recovered to his prime level. He was also able to dual band his eight rings of life. He had acquired enormous dragon demon magic from this process, so he had jumped past the limitations of his past. He now had a surplus of power, and any deficiency was filled when he recovered his lost dragon weapons. Laura tilted her head in confusion. The odds are like that even though we stole two dragon weapons from him, Euron had given him many large presents, and at the same time, he had harmed Atain to an appalling degree. Euron had stolen two of Atain's dragon weapons, and he had transferred it to Azel. It was the brand of Paradise and the White Flame Phoenix. In their past battle with Atain, Euron had decided that there were two dragon weapons that had to be stolen from Atain, and Euron had been successful. It truly was an admirable achievement. The brand of Paradise was a dragon weapon made by deciphering the power of the last arc. It was done by deciphering Reginor's power. The dragon weapon had the amazing power of being able to manipulate localized time. Even if Atain doesn't have this dragon weapon, he can still manipulate time. He could use a spell that can produce the same effect. However, there is a cost to using the spell that wouldn't be present when using the dragon weapon. Moreover, we still have to come up with a good idea on how I can put the brand of paradise to good use. Azel's power had increased, and Atain's power had decreased. This was a fact. However, both sides knew what powers each side had. It was basically a shuffling of the deck. The stolen dragon weapons couldn't be used as secret weapons that could take Atain unawares. The fact that we were able to steal the White Flame Phoenix will have a minimal effect in a one-on-one -on -one battle with Atain. It is merely a strategic gain. The White Flame Phoenix was like the Crying Phoenix. They were dragon weapons capable of fighting by themselves when summoned. The user didn't need to continuously concentrate on using the dragon weapon, and it had the capability of carrying multiple people across long distances at high speeds. This wasn't too much about what Atain had lost. It was more about enormous benefit gained by someone in Azul's party. One of Azul's party members had received the dragon weapon. Euron hadn't taken the white flame phoenix for Azel, who already possessed the crying phoenix. Euron had stolen it with the intent of someone else in Azul's party inheriting it. Azel spoke. Anyways, we have to kill him before he shakes up the world. How will we do that? At Laura's question, Azel bit his lips. If the revived Atain was by himself, it might have been a different story. However, he possessed a force called the Dragon Demon King Worshippers, so Azel's task would be truly difficult. Azel had recovered his battle capabilities, and it rivaled the power he possessed during his prime. He also acquired comrades that were strong enough to make a name for themselves during the Dragon Demon War. However, there was a limit to what a small elite force could do against an enormous organization. Azel let out a sigh. We'll have to find a way. Let's just leave it to the Duke to worry about that. During the Dragon Demon War, Azel had fought in the front line. He had no hand in coming up with the strategies. Azel was a fine blade. He needed a wielder that could maximize his effectiveness. During the Dragon Demon War, Carlos had been such a person, and there were others that had taken on that role. Currently, Chiron was in charge of that role. Chiron had already come up with a method that caused trouble for the Plane of Darkness. He now needed to come up with a battle plan for fighting Atain. I have to finish the blade that'll cut off Atain's neck. On their final conversation, Azel and Carlos had come to that conclusion. He had to be able to freely use the extreme extinction. Currently, Azel could manifest extreme extinction through the sun lightsaber. The requirements were too burdensome for Azel to manifest his best skill. He had to find a faster and easier way to manifest it. It was the key to becoming victorious over Atain. In fact, Atain's action was proof that Azel and Carlos had been right. Euron had spoken to him. Azel, Atain isn't trying to kill you. He is trying to acquire you for the extreme extinction. To be precise, Atain wanted two things. He wanted the Sky Splitter and the Extreme Extinction. 
Carlos had marveled at the fact that the Sky Splitter was a dragon weapon that transcended the common sense of this world. It was able to change matter into light, and light into matter. It was able to freely move between the material and the immaterial world. The dragon weapon had the power to eventually create a phenomena called the extreme extinction. It had astounded Atane. Atane had concluded that a certain problem of his was unsolvable, yet an answer to his problem had shown up in the form of extreme extinction. Atane wanted to change the fate of the world, and he determined that he needed the new possibility created by Azel. However, Atane knows about the existence of the extreme extinction. It is a matter of time before he is able to recreate it. If I ignore that possibility, I might be taken unawares. Since Carlos was dead, the only one that could use the extreme extinction was Azel. However, it wasn't a guarantee that Azel would have this superior card forever. Atane was a magician at the pinnacle, and he had changed the order of the world countless times. At some point, Atane would understand how the extreme extinction worked, and he would be able to recreate it. If he developed a way to defend against the extreme extinction, it would become a nightmare for Azel's party. We have to end it before that happens. We have to kill him while extreme extinction remains a deadly weapon against him. Yuren's death was an irreversible loss for Azel's party. Yuren had left behind a lot of Azel's party, but it couldn't replace his empty spot. Amongst all of them, Arietta felt the most responsibility settle upon her shoulders. No one demanded her to take on more responsibility, but she knew she hadn't been much help up to this point. This truth made her feel dejected. What if she had been able to awaken her dragon soul at an early date? Would the bat have turned out differently? Maybe, Euron wouldn't have died. When Arietta verbalized such thoughts, Leticia spoke. What a useless thought. You think so? At her ruthless answer, Arietta let out a weak laughter. Leticia watched Arietta for a brief moment before she spoke. You are blaming yourself for not being able to perform a miracle. It isn't foolish, but it is arrogant. There are tasks that can and cannot be performed by a person. There is a limit to how much you can expect from yourself. This is especially true for a fight where lives are on the line. If Euron was still here, he would have told you the same thing as me. He probably would have given a long-winded explanation. It wouldn't be long-winded. I think he would have told me those words in a kind manner. Those that love to talk like to package it in that fashion. At Leticia's words, Arietta couldn't help but laugh. This time her laughter sounded mirthful. Leticia spoke. In truth, I was surprised when you made your decision on the spot like that. Don't you have any lingering attachment towards the dragon soul? I would be lying if I said I didn't. However, I don't know when I'll be able to awaken my dragon soul. Our enemies might attack us soon, so I thought it would be better to choose a dragon weapon that I could use right now. Arietta had given up the dragon soul to become an owner of a dragon weapon. Euron had stolen two dragon weapons from Atane, and there was no reason why Atane should possess the white flame phoenix. Its function overlapped with the crying phoenix, so it would be useful to give the dragon weapon to another member of the party. This was why Arietta received a dragon weapon. When Azel suggested the idea to her, she had immediately accepted his offer. It surprised her party members. Chiron tried to dissuade her, since he thought she would be giving up too much in the process. However, she was sure of her decision. Euron earned this precious time for us, but we don't know when our enemies will attack us. Since Master, Azel and Leticia is injured, I need power that can protect us. Currently, their party didn't have the luxury to plan out their future in a laid-back manner. Arietta knew this truth well, so she had made her choice. However, Azel's suggestion had been unexpected. Azel decided to give her the Crying Phoenix instead of the White Flame Phoenix. Everyone was surprised, but Azel gave a clear explanation. If Princess was a magician, I would have given you the White Flame Phoenix. However, Princess is a spirit order practitioner, so you are more compatible with the Crying Phoenix. In truth, the Crying Phoenix was also a dragon weapon created by a magician. However, Azel had used it repeatedly after inheriting it. He had modified it to a point where it was a good dragon weapon to use for a spirit order practitioner. On the other hand, 
The white flame phoenix had been a Tyne's dragon weapon, so it was optimized for a magician to use. However, Azel would be able to bring out the potential of the white flame phoenix. It was like the time when he was able to use the Vitan's chalice. His past experiences would allow him to modify the dragon weapon more easily. This wasn't the case for Arietta. This was why Azel had transferred the crying phoenix to Arietta. He had received it from a dead comrade. It symbolized his comrade's hope for a better future. It had accompanied Azel for a very long time, so it was a big loss for him. However, he had made the right decision. The dragon weapon isn't a simple tool. Even if it was given up, the one that inherits it must treat the dragon weapon as if it's a clone of one's soul. First, you should keep using it until you are sick of using it. That is the starting point. Arietta faithfully followed his teachings. Her learning ability was outstanding, so a few days of training allowed her to use her senses through the dragon weapon. Of course, she was able to summon the dragon weapon way earlier than that. Suddenly, she spoke. Somehow, it feels as if I've cheated. What do you mean? It feels as if I've wronged Saiga. We are supposed to be in a competition as to who can awaken the dragon soul first. It was an unfair competition from the start, so who cares? I guess you are right. Arietta didn't deny Leticia's rebuke. From beginning to end, Saiga had to learn the dragon soul on his own. Arietta continued to be instructed by Chiron, so it wasn't a fair competition from the start. Suddenly, Leticia looked into the distance as she spoke. It is done. Afterwards, a light surged into the air, and a powerful wave of power spread into the surrounding. Arietta expressed her surprise. The fight was incredible, but the phenomena that occurs at the end was also amazing. I wonder if this phenomena occurs only when Azel goes through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Azel had gone through a Dragon Slayer's ritual far away from the party. After awakening in this era, this was his fourth Dragon Slayer's ritual. This fight appalled everyone. Azel's fight with Dragon had shaken the earth and the sky. Azel had challenged a Frost Dragon, who had free reign over the power of ice. However, it seemed this particular dragon was much stronger than a normal dragon. The party found this out after the Dragon Slayer's ritual had started. The reason behind this phenomena was how the Dragon Slayer's ritual was structured. The Dragon Slayer's ritual was a life and death fight between a dragon and a human. On top of that, it was a form of communication between two souls. If the dragon demon magic of the challenging human was strong, it was as if the dragon became stronger in response. This was why a Dragon Slayer's ritual never decreased in difficulty no matter how many one completed. Azel had put his life on the line when he attempted this Dragon Slayer's ritual he did it, because he thought it was a solution to the immediate problem his party faced. Suddenly, Arietta asked a question. Leticia, are you really going to attempt it again? It is needed. It wasn't just Azel. Leticia decided to attempt her second Dragon Slayer's ritual. She had completed her first Dragon Slayer's ritual in the Alberton Forest. It had only been four months ago. One had to completely consolidate the power taken from the dragon before one could go through another Dragon Slayer's ritual. If not, the dragon could steal that power. However, she didn't need to worry about that. Normally, she would have needed more time. However, she had continued to train in the Dragon Demon Magic training method devised by Carlos and Qua Nidal. She had already digested all of the dragon's power. Arietta asked her a question. Aren't you scared? You are asking the obvious. I am scared. Leticia didn't try to bluff. She gave a truthful answer. She had won once, but it was still scary to attempt another dragon slayer's ritual. The dragon was scary, and the prospect of dying here before the real fight was frightening. Despite such feelings, you are going through with it. I'll say this again. It is needed. Isn't it the same for you, Arietta? No one had asked Arietta to go through with the Dragon Slayer's ritual again. However, Arietta had already made up her mind. Leticia spoke. Azel is truly an ill-natured man. Don't you think so? I agree. He is a bad man. I guess that is why he was able to seduce so many women. Azel possessed the most power amongst them, yet he didn't hesitate to put himself in danger. He didn't hesitate to lead through action. 
He didn't tell them what to do with words. He did it first, and other followed his example. Leticia spoke. Well, let's go greet that bad man. Chapter 216. Stolen. Part 3. The plane of darkness was in a state of pandemonium. It wasn't as if the plane of darkness had been a model of stability before this. They were floundering as they fought an underground war with the organization called the Guardian's Shadow. They felt shocked when a being came looking for them that day. The feeling couldn't be compared to anything from the past. Dragon Demon King Atain had returned. My king. Ain Sarah spoke in an excited manner. When Almeric saw her face, he felt a feeling of deja vu. It was as if he was back in the past. While Ain Sarah carried out the role of custodian of the great darkness, her sense of self had wilted away. Her emotions had withered away. However, Atain had returned after the long years of waiting, and he was in front of her. Ain Sarah looked like a girl that had her dream come true. In the distant past, Ain Sarah had been rescued by Atain, and she had become infatuated with him. She had been part of a powerful clan in the north, and she was a member of the ruling family. Her clan had wanted an alliance with Atain, so her clan elders had pushed her to marry Atain. It started out as a political marriage, yet she became filled with burning and all-consuming love for Atain as time passed. From beginning to end, her love remained the same. She knew the price that she would need to pay when she became the custodian of the great darkness. She did it for Atain. She had carried out that role until now even though she had lost her humanity as a price. Was her love for the king the only thing that she was able to preserve? Ain Sarah looked as if she wanted to cry. Her face looked raw with emotion. It was as if Atain had made her awaken from a very old curse that had sealed away her sense of self. Ain Sarah. Atain let out a gentle laughter as he looked at her. I am sorry for being late, my beautiful queen. He elegantly grasped Ain Sarah's hand, and he kissed the back of her hand. Then he gently embraced her. In the past, it had started out as a one-sided political marriage, but it was different now. In the true sense of the word, she was a Tyne's partner now. She had become worn down over the years, and she had even lost her sense of desire. Now she had gained what she had wanted. It was a partnership she had always desired. I was able to revive thanks to you. You were making me blush. I just safeguarded what you gave me. I was too busy that I was neglectful in practicing the king's ideals. That wasn't your responsibility. It's the responsibility of those that used my legacy for their own selfish interests and desires. Atain was well aware of what the plane of darkness looked like right now. He was especially knowledgeable on the topic of how the members of the plane of darkness lived. He had learned it through Euron, who was his reincarnated self. The truth had been laid out in front of him. It is time to end this experiment. Atain spoke those words as he manifested his magic. The members of the plane of darkness felt something intrude into their mind. They flinched at this foreign feeling. There were those that rose to the ruling class of the plane of darkness over the long years. There were the young generation that had been nurtured by the ruling class. Then there were the humans that were at the bottom of the society. They had to sacrifice their lives as the labor force. The will of the individual didn't matter. They realized that they were put under the will of transcendent being. Gentlemen, I am Atain. As promised long time ago, I have returned from across the lake of death. Atain spoke in a low voice, but it didn't sound low to everyone. Everyone had felt the revival of the king, but they had never expected to be approached by Atain in such a fashion. They couldn't hid their surprise. From all directions, people continuously appeared as they felt shock and awe. Some were moved to tears. From their perspective, Atain was a god that had overcome death to guide them towards their utopia. The top members of the Plane of Darkness had been successful in raising Atain to godhood amongst their followers through the long years. Atain knew all of this through the great darkness. He closed his eyes for a brief moment to calm down everyone's emotions. Then he continued speaking. I'll be the one to confess first. I felt despair when I saw all of you. Atain's emotions became turbulent after it had reached a low. He started speaking again. There was a man that dreamed about a utopia. It was a world where everyone would be able to live happily. There would be no hunger, 
discrimination, oppression and stealing. He thought he could make a society where everyone would be able to live a full life as they respected each other. However, sacrifices were needed to make the world that way. He had to tear apart and rebuild the world, which had turned out wrong. He had to go through the process of conquering the world. He decided to fight the world, so he gathered those that shared his ideals. Then he conducted an enormous war. The Dragon Demon War feels like yesterday for me, but it had become a page in history for you all. We fought for the highest ideals. We wanted a better world. Many bled and sacrificed their lives to make a world where everyone would be happy. The war had swept across the continent, and countless people had died. The Dragon Demon King's army had precipitated the war, and countless number of them had died too. Even though we lost our fight against the world, our ideals hadn't died. It should have died. I believed that the ideal would become a guiding light for my descendants, who would have to wander the dark wilderness. That is why I made preparations for the future. There was the Dragon Demon Palace and the Plain of Darkness. He had started making preparations for his people when his side started losing. Even if they lost the Dragon Demon War, their enemies wouldn't be able to eradicate all of them. He couldn't win against the world, but he prepared tools that would allow his remaining force to work towards his utopia. Even in a severe environment, the Dragon Demon Palace would ensure the survival of the survivors of the Dragon Demon War. Then there was magical abilities of the survivors and the road of emptiness that allowed one to travel all over the continent. He believed it would be enough for his people to work towards the utopia. He couldn't change the entire world into a utopia, so he created a small isolated land where outsiders could not interfere. He had thought his followers would work towards making his utopia there. However, you threw away the ideals we had been pursuing. You purist your own greed and interests. You are the survivors, and you were once my comrades. I am saddened, but this is the truth. You all have become corrupt. While he was conducting the Dragon Demon War, he knew that there was a discrepancy between his ideal and reality. He realized that he had been wrong in believing in the potential of the Dragon Demon race. He admitted his failure, and he started preparing for his next attempt. As he was doing so, he didn't completely give up on the hope he had placed on his army. Atain had left behind the Plane of Darkness. It was his last hope, and it had also been another experiment. Even if he was dead, his followers might work towards bringing his ideals into life. He didn't care if they weren't successful in making the utopia. Atain's expectation and hope towards the dragon demons and humanity would have remained. However, the experiment ended as an extreme failure after 220 years. The utopia dreamed up by Atain couldn't be found in the plane of darkness. There wasn't even a trace. It was a false expectation. I'll make this clear. My past comrades are no longer my comrades. Atain was cold in his declaration. His tone of voice was calm, but the content of his words was stern. A state of unrest came over the influential people of the plane of darkness. At that moment, the emotions they were feeling was fierce and complex. It couldn't be put into words. What are you saying? We believed only in you. We waited for you to come back. We gave up everything to live in this black darkness, yet we continued to wait for this day. We doggedly held out for your return, yet you dared to say that we were wrong. A fierce sense of betrayal and anger arose within them. The being, who they had elevated to godhood, had rejected them. He had rejected their way of life. They couldn't stand the fact that they had been ruthlessly criticized. At the same time, they felt guilt and fear wash over them. They were well aware of Atine's ideals. Despite know it, they had made the plane of darkness into an organization composed of religious zealots. They politically crushed those like Sibane, who had wanted to continue working towards Atine's utopia. An extremely twisted class structure was created. Of course, Atain would be extremely angered by their actions. However, he was able to separate emotion from logic. He understood the truth of what had happened. Still, it didn't stop his followers from trying to justify their actions. How many people during that era truly believed in your ideals? We all followed our own greed. We followed you, so we could gain more for ourselves. We didn't want a world that was better for everyone. 
We wanted a world that was better for us. Their justification merely affirmed once again as to why he despaired for this world. However, they couldn't help but try to justify their actions. Attain listened to their emotions through the great darkness. He also listened to their spoken words. These beings had lived for the past 220 years by relying on the great darkness. From Attain's perspective, their actions were like prayers that offered their inner conflicts to their god. Attain continued to speak. However, at the same time, a part of me thanks you. Atain's words were unexpected, so everyone flinched as they tried to listen to him. I was able to get rid of any lingering attachments, thanks to all of you. I won't hesitate anymore. I came to the conclusion that I have no other choice. He had long come up with a plan that he would pursue after he revived. He had already prepared everything that he would need to carry out his plan. Despite having this plan, he had chosen to go through with an extreme method called the Dragon Demon War in the past. He had done so, because he had believed that humans and dragon demons could help create his utopia. He no longer thought that any more. He had thrown away his belief in humans and dragon demons. Attain was choosing to go through with his last option now. Let me make it clear to my old comrades and those that are called the Dragon Demon King worshippers in this era. I am not your god. The redemption you are searching for doesn't exist. It is merely an illusion that was created in the head of the corrupted beings. Attain denied his godhood in front of those that worshipped him as a god. It didn't affect the survivors of the Dragon Demon King's army. It was like a bolt out of the blue for the fanatics created by them. The fanatics had given up their souls in their devotion for Attain, yet they had been wholly rejected by Attain. I just want to give you the option to choose. Listen to me. Attain's words were like a whip to those that were shaken up. This world is wrong at a fundamental level. In the current world, utopia cannot be reached no matter how hard intelligent beings work on it. This world and those that live in this world were wrong at a fundamental level. From the beginning, there had been no path that would have allowed him to create a utopia. After countless failures, Attain was sure of this truth now. That is why I will change the world. If he had won the Dragon Demon War, he would have worked to change the world in a very humane way. He would have created a societal system that was based on consent from his constituents. However, he came to the conclusion that such a method couldn't work. It wasn't the right answer. He had no choice but to acquire an answer that transcended the system established by human culture. If the way of this world world didn't allow him to reach his ideals, he just had to change how the world worked. He had done this in the past. He had reset the relationship between the humans and dragons. He had unified the language of the world. Choose. Will you follow me or will you not follow me? For old time's sake, I will forgive the sins of those that use my relics for selfish interests. If you won't follow me, leave. On that day, Attain destroyed a version of his own divinity, which had been created by the plane of darkness. On that day, his followers met the true god that they should worship. However, not all agreed with Attain's wishes. Chapter 217. Stolen. Part 4. It has been a while, Attain. When Attain finished his speech, a half-transparent show white ghost of a girl had appeared in front of him. She possessed white blonde hair, and her horns were grey like that of a boulder. She was a dragon demon girl possessing slate grey coloured eyes and dragon demon stone. You're a correct, Kaalia. Attain wasn't surprised at her sudden appearance. He spoke to her. Almeric had flinched in surprise. After he had revived, this was the first time Kaalia had shown herself in front of Almeric. Attain continued to speak. We occupy the same world yet we cannot meet. That's right. I feel much when I am near you, yet I can never reach you. Kaalia moved closer to Attain. As she spoke, she placed her hand on his face. Attain's true essence was also within the great darkness. Kaalia was able to experience reality through the great darkness, so she was technically always with him. However, the two of them never met within the great darkness. Attain was always living in the current era through his reincarnated selves. Until he had revived, his consciousness had never been put to sleep. He had always been a step away from his reincarnated selves as he observed their lives. 
Suddenly, Kealia glanced towards Ain Sarah. Ain Sarah once again had a blank expression on her face. She was just observing the situation. Ani, no. Ain Sarah, you really lost all emotions that isn't related to Atain. Of course, Kealia was here as a false image. But her gesture towards Atain had been something one did to a lover. The past Ain Sarah would have raged. However, she wasn't showing any emotions. You did something you shouldn't have done, Atain. I won't deny that. I had no choice, but to rely on her. He could have chosen not to assign the custodianship of the Great Darkness to Ain Sarah. However, his gamble would have turned into a bigger uncertainty if he had done so. As her sense of self wilted away, Ain Sarah continued to be the custodian. It allowed the system called the Great Darkness to remain intact even to this day. Atain truly felt thankful towards Ain Sarah's sacrifice. It is what I wanted to do. You Majesty did nothing wrong. Ain Sarah stepped forward in defense of Atain. Her attitude was resolute. Kealia more sad as she watched Ain Sarah. It is unfortunate, but the Ain Sarah I knew is dead. There had been no love lost between the two. However, the fact that Ain Sarah was gone saddened Kealia. It was a novel turn of event. The Dragon Demon King's first queen Ain Sarah was dead. The only thing left behind was a ghost of herself. The only thing left within her was her love and obsession for Atain. Of course, she would be freed from her role as custodian of the Great Darkness now. The humanity, which had been worn away, might slowly recover itself. However, even if she recovers her sense of self, would it truly be Ain Sarah? Atain, I know that you weren't able to perfect my technique. You weren't able to maintain continuity between your lives. This is how it could all go wrong. Kealia let out a sigh of grief. In the past, she had partnered with Atain through a deal. Her human body had been dying, and Atain had provided her with a dragon demon body in exchange for her technique. In the process, Kealia had become known as Atain's pupil and third queen. She gained notoriety, and she had been feared by the humans. Kealia had been using her unstable reincarnation technique to live and die as a human. She had agreed with the ideals being pursued by Atain. However, there had been sacrifices in the pursuit to achieve this ideal. At one point, a human had saved her. He had spared her after he had intended to kill her. In the end, she had died with doubt in her heart. Then she was made to live in the great darkness by Atain. She had been asleep for a very long time, and she had been awakened by Ragus, who had awakened as an undead. You tried to fix the problem of my technique, and in the process, you wanted to make good use of the time it would take to pursue such an endeavor. That is why you kept reincarnating as a human. You guessed right. It was as Kealia had surmised. When Urin and Atain from the past had exchanged questions and answers, Urin had held back a piece of information. Atain had failed in fixing the problem within Kealia's secret technique. In the process of dying and being reborn as a different existence, one's sense of self deteriorated. The degeneration was inevitable. There had been no way for him to solve this problem. There had been two main reasons why one's sense of self deteriorated and changed in the reincarnation. The first problem was the fact that the awakening happened after the basic personality traits had been developed. That meant the past personality mixed with the current personality. The second problem was the fact that one's body had changed. The mind was influenced much by the body. An easy example was the change of a male mind when placed in a female body. In the end, Atain had given up being reincarnated as someone else. I can't choose to be reincarnated as someone else. Therefore, I had no choice but to revive my original body. It took a very long time, but he used the technique of Regina or the last Alp. He had restored his dead body. He wasn't reborn. He didn't have to worry about the change and deterioration of his sense of self that came along with being reborn in a different body. However, he felt it was waste of time to stay asleep inside the great darkness until his revival. I want to know about the humans. A large experiment called the Dragon Demon War had failed. Atain had realized that he was woefully ignorant about humans and dragon demons. After his revival, he would need to start a new attempt, and he didn't want to repeat his mistake. 
He needed to become more educated in that department. That was why he had started his reincarnation cycle, while he placed his sense of self within the great darkness. He observed his reincarnations from a perspective that was a step removed from their lives. He continued to learn information that he hadn't known before. Kealia queried him. You experienced living several human lives, yet your conclusion hasn't changed. Kealia, you already know what choice I've made. Atain knew this to be true through her tone of voice. Kealia also didn't deny the fact. Yes, I won't change my mind. You experienced your reincarnated self disagree with you after finding out the whole truth. Doesn't that affect your decision? You also know about Euron Rizesta. It seems you are much more than I had assumed. It seems you've become a transcendent existence. It isn't an uncommon occurrence. Yes, there are times when I labored to devise a plan, and it only resulted in trash results. On the other hand, there were those that exceeded expectation. Yuren's life was like that for me. What do you mean by that? His life was quite moving. He decided to throw away his own life for his comrades, and even after knowing the full truth, he was resolute in his beliefs. I was moved by his will. Amongst all of his reincarnations, Atain had interfered the most with Yuren's life. The reason was simple. His revival was getting close, and Azel had awakened in this era. Azel had overcome Atain's curse. He had learned through Yuren that his descendants were living in a state of madness, so he had awakened Yuren's consciousness. He pushed Yuren to betray the plane of darkness. He guided Yuren to become a member of Azel's party. Azel was able to kill him, and Atain wanted to know Azel the human. He wanted a deeper understanding as to who Azel was. He had made preparations long time ago. The fact that Yuren was Carlos' descendant was part of Atain's calculation. However, Yuren is an exception. He cannot shake my resolve. Even if his life was moving, it was merely one life. Yuren's life as a human had exceeded a time's expectation. This didn't mean Yuren's life could be used as an absolute yardstick for judgment. After Atain died, he had experienced 14 reincarnations. Yuren had merely been one of them. I gained certainty through the Dragon Demon War and my reincarnations. Even if there is an event or a being that leaves a strong impression, one or two outliers cannot overturn the tide. What if one person does good? and there are 10,000 people doing small wrongs. Which way should I adjust in such a situation? Should he adjust to the excellent and prominent person? It didn't make any sense. If he was making a small organization, it might be possible. However, it was possible in a society where many had to be embraced. Kealia, didn't you despair at what you experienced as a human? I did. But, him, wait a moment. Regus had been listening to the two talk but he butted in at that moment. When everyone's gazes were on him, he spoke. Your Majesty, there is something we need to talk about right now. It keeps being pushed backwards. It was unlike Regus. He spoke in a respectable manner. It was the same way he had spoken to Atain during the Dragon Demon War. Atain queried him. What do you want to know? Your Majesty's goal. No, I know that your goal is to make this world a better place. How are we going to accomplish that goal? Will we once again gather people for a war? No, I don't plan on using the same method. We've already lost once before. We also saw the madness caused by the war. We saw how the war could change the participants of the war. That is why I'm going to choose another method. What is that method? Surveillance and restriction. Him, when Regus tilted his head in confusion, Atain smiled. From Regus's perspective, Atain's smile somehow made him look like he wanted to cry. It doesn't matter what era one is in. Humans do not trust each other's goodwill. Atain thought about his memories from the distant past as he spoke. There might be trust between people that know each other very well, but as a race, humans do not believe in the goodness of people. At a basic level, the law of human society is based on self-interest and bad intentions. Humans assume that respect won't be had if one's opponent isn't afraid. Everything is built upon the assumption of fear. Him, you are suddenly talking about an academic subject. Will it take long? I guess you are bored, but this story needs to be said. Regus, 
You have already seen a part of my solution. Where and when did I see it? Guardian shadows. Him. It's a barrier capable of stopping our former comrades, who had been swept up by madness. We are enemies, but I can only express my respects towards Carlos Rizesta's ingenuity. We lost our precious friends Ornsors and Baldazark to him. Moreover, his machination made us lose Belrun and Ixeru. In fact, we should consider us to be fortunate that the damage had stopped there. I never expected him to bring about a part of my plan in such a fashion. Carlos didn't know about my plan, but he came up with the idea of creating the Guardian Shadows by researching the potential possessed by the Great Darkness. While I saw the Guardian Shadows in action, I felt indignant by the fact that I was a step behind him. During the Dragon Demon War, Carlos had surprised Atain several times. Carlos was like Azel. He was a human chosen by his era. His accomplishments couldn't be explained merely by his genius talent. In his twenties, he had reached the status of Archmage, and he was able to change the fate of the world at such a young age. The most surprising part about the Guardian Shadow system is the fact that they are able to seek out those that are called the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The Guardian Shadows were an existence with a foothold in the Great Darkness. However, when it came down to finding the Dragon Demon King worshippers, they used other beings totally unrelated to the Great Darkness. All the humans of this continent became informants that provided information regarding the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Carlos' magic had allowed him to transcend the restriction of the Great Darkness. The Guardian Shadows were established upon the foundation of the Great Darkness, but it was self-sustaining now. It had left an indelible mark on this world. My plan is similar to the Guardian Shadows. I want to create a system that can monitor the intelligent beings of this continent. No one will be free from the surveillance, and no action will be concealed. He already had a surveillance net called the Dragon Demon King Worshippers. If he wanted to, he could see anyone that was connected to the Great Darkness. He could even hear their thoughts. I'll create laws that need to be upheld, and I'll create peacekeepers that'll carry out the judgment. The peacekeepers didn't have to be alive. They wouldn't be influenced by emotions or human ties. They would become a part of the system where a judgments would be made based on logic. Those that break the law will be punished, and they will become part of the system. Those that broke the law will be turned into beings that won't be influenced by emotions. They will become something akin to the guardian shadows. They will transcend the restriction of time and space. They'll take on the role as peacekeepers. Beings that threatened the world will be ferreted out, and those that do something dangerous will be suppressed. We will no longer have to be dependent on the good wills of others. It will no longer be a gamble as permanent peace will come to this world. At its heart, this system didn't look too different from the system that made up the human nations. However, there was a fundamental difference. Humans and dragon demons couldn't interfere with the system. The system would be governed by an absolute value system that was unaffected by greed and emotions. If the system was described in an extreme manner, the humans and dragon demons would be cattles living within a fence. That means, Regus was struck dumb as he spoke. Atain, you no longer trust the humans and dragon demons. Are you planning on taking away the choice to do evil? Was he too surprised? Regus's way of speech had returned to normal. Instead of pointing that out, Atain answered with a blank expression on his face. That's right. It saddens me, but the transition of generations will occur soon. It is the only way to protect everyone from the confusion caused by it. Chapter 218. Renegades. Part 1. Azul's party did not remain in one place. They kept moving. Euron had disconnected the function that allowed their enemies to track down the Vitans' chalice. However, Atain had revived, and anything was possible with him. Normally, Azel was always vigilant in protecting his back from long-ranged attacks. However, he had never expected Atain to be revived at that point in time. From now on he couldn't afford to be careless. However, it is strange. Chiron revealed his misgivings. Euron had bought them 100 hours, then four days had passed. The party was traveling at a frightening pace, and they were carrying out the plan. Azel had performed the Dragon Slayer's ritual. 
Leticia was preparing herself to go through the Dragon Slayer's ritual in several days. Afterwards, it would be Arietta's turn. There was a reason why the two women hadn't attempted the Dragon Slayer's ritual as soon as possible. Leticia had been severely injured in her fight against Ragus. Black magic and the healing arts were used simultaneously to heal her, but she wasn't at peak condition. Arietta had received the dragon weapon Crying Phoenix not too long ago. Even if she possessed excellent talent, she would need some time to properly use the dragon weapon. This was why Azul's party avoided fights as they assessed the overall situation. Chiron became flustered as information kept streaming into him. What are the Plane of Darkness up to right now? They are a mess right now. The Plane of Darkness was fighting a fight on two fronts. They were fighting to protect the waypoints to the Road of Emptiness. They were also trying to deplete the strength of the humans, so they were carrying out plans to destabilize the entire continent. In the first case, the Guardian Shadows were slowly making progress. The Guardian Shadows were destroying the waypoints of the Road of Emptiness. In the latter case, the Plane of Darkness had been carrying out the plan for a very long time. The Guardian Shadows were trying hard to mitigate the damage, but they hadn't been seeing much success. However, the actions of the Dragon Demon King worshippers started becoming disorganized after a Tyne's rebirth. Even if one gained new information about one's opponents, it was hard to make alterations once the plan was enacted. It was hard to guide the events to one's desired result. One had to continuously work at it to keep the momentum and direction of the plan. The Plane of Darkness understood this, so they had made contingencies that would keep their plan on schedule. However, the members that were supposed to carry out this plan were no longer carrying out the duties. This allowed the nations, who had fallen into chaos, to slowly regain their footing. It seems the scale of the mess is so large that it'll take a long time for everything to be fixed up. Still, it is a very good development for us. The Plane of Darkness had created confusion in each nation. Each nation was in the midst of a war with each other, or they were in a civil war. Even if optimal conditions were provided to each nation, the state of chaos wouldn't be ended in a short amount of time. Still, it was true that the fortunes of this continent had taken a favorable turn. In some cases, it had been possible to capture Dragon Demon King worshippers alive. The existence of the Dragon Demon King worshippers became publicized, and it was crucial in bringing stability back to the nations. When Azel read all the informations, he spoke. It seems a Tyne's revival wasn't entirely beneficial to the Plane of Darkness. It seems their leadership group is in a state of confusion. That is the only logical conclusion that can be derived. However, why? Atain is like a godlike figure to them. I'm not surprised by it. Him. When Chiron became puzzled, Azel explained it to him. It was like that during the Dragon Demon War. Atain was a detached idealist. Those that gathered beneath him should have shared his ideals, but that wasn't the case. Him. It is as the Simplician Prince had said before. Currently, many exists within the Plane of Darkness that Atain wouldn't approve of. Wouldn't there be friction between Atain and those that possess power within the Plane of Darkness? Wouldn't it be inevitable? You bring up a valid point, but I'm wondering if it is even possible for a conflict to arise between them. What? Even if they possess rebellious thoughts towards Atain, will it actually lead to overt friction? Atain knows what they are thinking. If Atain decides to push his ideas onto them, they have no choice but to comply. It isn't about power. I see. Azel immediately understood what Chiron was trying to say. Atain was powerful, but in the end, he was one person. Those within Plane of Darkness spread madness for a very long time, and they had amassed power. If they decided to rebel, it wouldn't be a small matter. However, there was a problem. They would be tightening the noose around their own necks if they rebelled. They had acquired power by deifying Atain. Basically, their base of power considered Atain to be a god. On top of that, the entire society within the Plane of Darkness relies on the Great Darkness for survival. If one takes those factors into account, one shouldn't expect a conflict to occur. 220 years had passed for the survivors of the Dragon Demon War. Basically, it wasn't strange that those that held power in the Plane of Darkness had developed their own agenda. 
However, Atene had always possessed the lifeline to the plane of darkness. This had been true even before the survivors of the Dragon Demon War changed the plane of darkness for their own gains. If one compared it to human nation, Atene was like a king that had absolute support of his people. Moreover, he had the control over the supply of food and water. Even if Atene is a single being, his power is unconventional. He can't be overcome with power. Atene had support of the members making up the society, and Atene had absolute control over the system that allowed life within the plane of darkness. It was impossible to go against him. If this was true, why was there confusion within the ranks of the dragon demon king worshippers? Chiron furrowed his brows. It isn't an answer that we can find out by hypothesizing about it, but I can't help but worrying about it. However, let's worry about that at a later time. There are things we have to take care in the near future. Azel spoke those words as he looked downwards. He looked past the wings that were made out of white flame. The ground was very far away. Azel and Chiron was flying on the dragon weapon White Flame Phoenix. Arietta was flying a bit behind on her dragon weapon Crying Phoenix. Chiron looked behind as he asked a question. What do you think about Arietta? In the past, at his words, Azel thought about his first meeting with Chiron. You asked me a similar question before. I think she is a reliable comrade now. It means your opinion of her had been elevated compared to before. What if she had been in the era of the Dragon Demon War? She would have considered to be excellent even during that era. Duke, you were a good teacher. You were able to cultivate the fertile soil. Arietta was like a fertile soil. Just the act of spreading seed called secret techniques allowed her to bloom beautiful flowers. She was able to survive the Dragon Slayer's ritual without possessing a dragon weapon. Since she had acquired a dragon weapon, Arietta's battle capability was on par with Chiron and Leticia. If one thought about the abilities of Crying Phoenix, she would fare worse in a one-on-one -on -one battle. She would perform better in a large battle. Since a legendary hero is giving me a compliment, I don't know what to do with myself. Please don't speak in that fashion. Ha ha ha. I am truly happy. You have many different perspectives, since you've been taught by many teachers. I'm sure your standard for grading a teacher is pretty strict. I won't deny that fact. However, I cannot do a fair comparison between Duke's ability to teach with my teachers. Why not? During the Dragon Demon War, it was impossible to teach students at a leisurely fashion. Since the war had been going on too long, it was a luxury if one was able to learn the basics. One would learn a little, and if one was able to survive the battle, one was able to learn a little bit more. If you lived, you learned. If you died, you didn't. Azel didn't have a period in life where he had been able to distance himself from battles. He didn't have the time to learn his techniques in leisure. By the end of the war, he had spent more time in the Dragon Demon War than he had spent out of it. He had lived a harrowing life. It was the main reason why everyone didn't hesitate to share each other's technique. There was a common enemy called the Dragon Demon King's Army and your comrades changed each day. In the current era, the noble families and the military forces view secret techniques as privately owned property. If one thought like that during the Dragon Demon War, one's death could mean that techniques could be lost forever. This was why the ability to learn was valued more than how the abilities were fostered. If one had the time, it was preferable to teach in a calm environment. The accumulation of expertise occurred, and an education system shined in such an environment. However, what would happen if one had no knowledge yet one had to fight in the morning and afternoon on the same day? One had to teach techniques that can be used even if one didn't have a full grasp on the concept. One had no choice, but to wait and see if the person one taught had survived. In the end, luck and talent decided the outcome. Chiron shrugged his shoulders. Geez, are you boasting right now? Are you calling yourself a genius? I can't deny your claim, but it somehow twists my insides. There were many talented beings in the Dragon Demon War. I wasn't more talented than them. I was luckier. Azel didn't deny the fact that his great luck had allowed him to become a hero. It was true that he had talent, but it was as Atene had said. He was the chosen one of his era, 
and this was why he was able to reach such heights. Chiron spoke. I now understand the fundamental principles behind your actions. You failed to realize it until now. Him. There were parts that I couldn't understand. For example, I thought you were overdoing it in this venture. Atain could attack at any time, yet you decided to go through with the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Moreover, the reason you did it was to finish a technique. That is exactly why I went through with the Dragon Slayer's ritual. I don't have the time to leisurely learn my technique. Azel let out a bitter laugh. Chiron asked him a question. I'll ask again. What do you think about Arietta? Didn't I answer that question earlier? Not in the way I wanted. What answer do you want from me? Do you want me to say that she is a very beautiful and charismatic woman? I just want to know what you think about her. It seems you've branded me as being an irresponsible playboy. I'm not sure what your intention is in asking such a question to me. When Azel looked at him sideways, Chiron smirked as he spoke. Of course, my opinion on that subject about you hasn't changed. Unfortunately, Arietta said you seem like a decent man even with your past. She has such thought about you, so I wanted to hear what you think about her. If the princess learns about what you said, she'll consider it as you being meddlesome. Moreover, I don't have time to be attracted to a female. How can you not have the time? Wasn't it worse during the Dragon Demon War? At that time, didn't you bloom many flower of love? I was a bit young during that time. I didn't think beyond what was in front of my eyes as I lived my life, him. You speak as if you aren't young anymore. I had been on the fence, but I'm sure of it now. What are you talking about? Nothing happened between you and Laura. Cough. In a flash, air went down the wrong pipe. Sir Azel coughed. It was too powerful of an ambush from Chiron. Why are you bringing that up right now? It made me wonder if anything happened when the two of you traveled together. I bet something had occurred, and Leticia bet that nothing had occurred. I lost. Shit. Duke, can you not get it up? I mean I never expected you to act like a gentleman. Somehow, Azel wanted to cry. He never expected a day to come when he would be made fun of in such a way. Chiron cackled as he spoke. Well, it isn't as if I don't understand your actions. You saw the consequences of acting irresponsibly in the past. That is why you were refraining. Ha! This is quite annoying. Why are you trying to mess with the concentration of a comrade, who has a fight ahead of him? Are you saying my words are wrong? Of course. Shit. So please shut about that problem now. Azel growled. It was uncommon to see Azel annoyed, so Chiron was enjoying it. However, Azel spoke before Chiron could say anything more. Please get ready. I'm heading down. Afterwards, it was as if the flames had been extinguished. The white flame phoenix disappeared. Azel had unsummoned his dragon weapon. Chiron grumbled as he gave up on making fun of Azel. Chapter 219. Renegades. Part 2. It has been a while. It is an honor to be able to fight together with Sir Azel Kazark. Please forgive my rudeness from our past meeting. As he spoke those words, the member of the Guardian Shadows bowed his head. He was Chiron's best friend, Biorin Michael. Unlike their last meeting, Biorin acted in a completely different manner. His attitude spoke of true respect, Sir Azel also spoke in a respectful manner. It has been a while, since we last met. Let us speak as friends. There is no need for formalities. Ha ha ha. Chiron might be able to do that since he actually has an old mind. My body is old, but I don't think my mind has aged that much. That is why I'm having difficulty dropping the formality. The legendary hero passed on such precious techniques to me. So how can I not pay my respects? As a price, you made me this dragon sword for me. It is an honor that the legendary hero thinks so highly of me. Him. I don't expect anything else from you. However, could you drop the legendary hero title? Understood. Did you find my dragon weapon to be of value? I won't exaggerate in my assessment. Your weapon was the most surprising part about this era. This era had taken a step back when it experienced the plague called the Great Darkness. Moreover, they had lost all important knowledge through the machination of Plane of Darkness. As a martial artist, he couldn't help but feel disappointed at the current era. In terms of the art of war, it seemed the humans had made some advancement. 
human ingenuity was a surprising thing. Giles and Duran had epitomized this. Instead of expanding on their senses, they continued to progress using techniques based on their reflexes. It was the same for the techniques in creating the dragon weapons. If I had this dragon weapon in the Dragon Demon War, it would have been of great help. Dragon weapons were always too difficult to create during my time. Even if one was made, it was common to see the dragon weapons lost before they could be passed on. It really is the highest praise you can give me. Biorin let out a satisfied laughter. It was the first time they had met after they went their own ways in the Dukedom of Tarantos. However, Biorin had been continuously given the lost secret techniques through the Guardian Shadows. As a result, Biorin had been able to destroy couple waypoints to the Road of Darkness. He had conducted himself very well in battle. Biorin asked him a question. We've made all the preparations. We are ready to move. How are we going to attack them? I have to pay them back for what they did to me last time. Azel laughed like a mischievous brat. I plan on paying him back. After I accomplish this goal, we can move on to engaging them in battle. Suddenly, Azel spoke. Somehow, I miss it. What do you miss? When Laura asked the question, Azel answered her. I am reminded of the old days. You mean what occurred during the Dragon Demon War? When Atane and Ornsaurus appeared on the same battlefield, their abilities had a synergistic effect. It really was terrifying. This didn't mean any two archmages could be gathered in one place. A synergistic effect didn't happen. However, it was an entirely different story if the archmages possessed dragon weapons that controlled time and space. At the time, Atane used the Paradise brand. He created a massive spell before the allied forces of humans became aware of it. Before the human forces could do anything, Ornsaurus used dimensional distortion to deliver a time spell like a package. Azel planned on using the same method against the Dragon Demon King worshippers. Come Dragon Weapon. Brand of Paradise. A powerful wave of Dragon Demon magic started to expand outwards. A circle of light, which was as big as a person, appeared. There were 29 letters within this circle. It looked like a beautiful pattern. These letters were the written language used by the extinct Arps from the ancient times. Azel didn't know about the Arps. However, when he acquired the brand of Paradise, the information regarding the Arps started to unconsciously trickle into Artpi's mind. Accelerate. The brand of Paradise was one of Atine's top dragon weapons. It was able to produce an amazing power. Atane had analyzed Reginor's power to create this dragon weapon. It had the power to manipulate the flow of localized time. Since it was an item made by Atane, it was hard to bring out the full potential of the weapon as a non-magician. However, he did the same thing he did when he used the Vitten's Chalice. He used his past experience to use specific functions that he needed to use. Amazing. Laura unconsciously let out an exclamation. There were countless mirrors around the two of them. It was as if they were within a building made out of mirrors. It was the Vitten's maze created by Laura. Their target was a waypoint of the Road of Emptiness. The two of them were four kilometers away, and there was a mountain separating Azel and Laura from the waypoint. Currently, she was using the, the goblet containing the Heaven's Tears to gather sunlight within this space. This meant Laura had to observe both inside and outside of the Vitten's maze. This was why Laura was able to see the time affecting the two of them differently when compared to the outside world. The time within the Vitten's maze was accelerating. Azel had summoned his sky splitter early on, and he had transitioned it into its light form. All the sunlight gathered by Laura was absorbed by the sword, and the sun lightsaber was formed. This process took a long time but time outside barely moved as he completed the sun lightsaber. At the very least, it is fifteen times faster. Laura was observing both sides, so she shuddered when she saw the different flow of time. As a magician, the control of time was something beyond her control. It wasn't like controlling space. Time was under divine providence, yet time was being manipulated by the will of a human right now. She was seeing it for herself, yet she was having a hard time believing it. 14 seconds. Laura was counting the time that had passed outside. Once she created the Vitten's maze, 
A powerful wave of dragon demon energy would have rippled out. Their enemies would have sensed it in five seconds. The dragon demon king worshippers had suffered too much in recent days that they were on high alert. This was why they had prioritized searching out their enemies quickly. At that point, Laura had formed the goblet containing the heaven's tears outside of the Vitten's maze. She was gathering as much sunlight as possible. Their enemies immediately saw through what she was doing, so they immediately took action. The dragon demon king worshippers knew about the terrifying power of the goblet containing the heaven's tears. Their fastest elite troops shot out to kill Laura. However, it was useless. Merely 14 seconds had passed after the Vitten's maze was formed. However, the sun lightsaber was complete by then. Azel. Laura didn't even pay attention to those that were charging towards them. Even if they used instantaneous movement, it would take the dragon demon king worshippers at least 30 seconds to reach the two of them. Moreover, it wasn't Laura and Azel's task to fight the troops. Laura focused her mind as she used dimensional distortion. She connected point A to point B. Shoot. The distance of four kilometers was abridged as the dimensional distortion appeared at the entrance to the waypoint. Perfect. Laura. Until now, this was the farthest she had tried to use the dimensional distortion. Azel let out a smile of satisfaction as he shot his attack towards the entrance that had appeared in front of him. The countless swords of light was focused towards one point. The beam of light was slim. It had the circumference of an arm, yet the light was bright enough to sear one's retina. The beam of light pierced through the entirety of the waypoint. It didn't matter if there was a physical barrier or a barrier made out of magic. It pierced through everything before it dissipated. Extreme extinction. It was a technique Azel had created after he researched for a way to change the form of sun lightsaber. The sun lightsaber had a very large area of effect. This particular destructive light was created by focusing the sun lightsaber. The focused light was compressed to the extreme. All the potential energy was squeezed out to create the extreme extinction. If one looked at the amount of energy one needed to invest to cause such destruction, it was very wasteful endeavor. However, nothing in this world could block it. It was an invincible attack. Azel had insisted on going through more Dragon Slayer's ritual for this very reason. If he wanted to be able to use the extreme extinction freely, he needed a more pure source of dragon demon magic. The amount of power he had exceeded what he had possessed during the dragon demon war. However, it wasn't as processed as before. He had to rectify this problem in a short amount of time, so he had to go through the dragon slayer's ritual. He was able to create a more complete version of the extreme extinction through this process. No way. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were taken aback. It was an ambush, but no one had died. However, the waypoint had been destroyed. It was something they had to defend even if they had to give up their lives. The extreme extinction had pierced through a very small portion of the waypoint. It only disabled the waypoint from functioning. It could be repaired. However, Azel and Laura appeared in front of the surprised Dragon Demon King worshippers. This is the end for you guys. After shooting the extreme extinction, the two of them had remained in a different flow of time. While Azel recovered from the backlash of using the extreme extinction, Laura had prepared all kinds of spells. As soon as they exited the dimensional distortion, she had unleashed all the spells at once. Rage of the Frost Dragon. A pure cold energy exploded in front of their eyes. A roar rang out as the cold energy washed over the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The Dragon Demon King worshippers froze in place when the explosion of extremely low temperature reached them. Those that were a bit away from explosion were in a better situation, but that only lasted three seconds. Coo! The distance to the attack and their reflexes had saved them. They had survived, but the attack had frozen half their body. Unfortunately, they were attacked with a second wave of attack. The first wave was extremely powerful, but Laura had been meticulous in preparing her spells. Her first spell had enclosed the whole area with ice, and her spells were the worst when used in an enclosed space. After the third wave detonated, the nearby location turned into an ice cave. Everything was frozen. It was as if time and sound had been trapped within the ice. 
Laura broke the silence when she took a step forward. It was a light step, yet it sounded like a thunderclap in the silence. When the sound rang out, a part of the ice started to break. In a flash, some of those within the frozen statues broke free. There was no one alive left. However, the waypoints were originally stationed with undeads and metallic golems. Various weapons had been dispatched there. Excellent. Laura had known this, so she had put in a powerful curse within the cold energy. She had wanted to destroy all of them. However, some of the undeads were able to survive the magic. The undeads were skilled, but the ambush had taken them completely off guard. They shouldn't have been able to survive against her great spell. However, Laura's spells were blunted to a certain degree by the magic spells placed over the waypoint. It had resulted in some of Undead surviving her attack. Traitor Laura, a dragon mage and undead warrior was being supported by two undead magicians. The dragon mage and undead attacked Laura. Even if she was a high-ranked magician, a vacuum was created in her magical energy when she used a great spell. This was why the dragon mage and undead used his instantaneous movement. He tried to stab Laura before she could even exhale the air in her lungs. Die. However, Laura had already put up a barrier. She didn't blink an eye as she spoke. Thank you for leaving out the Ornsaurus part. The two magicians immediately changed their magic pattern in an attempt to break through her barrier. It was a spell that created an explosion at close range. However, Laura was faster at casting her spell. She mumbled her words as if she was sighing. You can go now. Afterwards, the dragon magin couldn't believe his senses. He was sure Laura had been in front of him. Yet why was he seeing his allies? Why was he seeing the frozen undead magicians? As a reflex, he checked if his senses had been tampered with. It took him half a second to come up with an answer. Vitten's chalice. The half a second of confusion decided his fate. Azel had rushed forward from behind Laura. Azel swung his sword, which was surrounded by pure white flame. The undead found Azel standing amongst the broken pieces of his body. He let out a horrifying screech. Azel Karzak, you know your stuff. Azel struck out with his sword at the same time as he replied. The blue sword in his hand turned into white light. The undead's consciousness was put to rest forever. Chapter 220. Renegades. Part 3. It was a feint. The elite forces had jumped out of the waypoint to attack Laura. However, a powerful dragon demon magic erupted from behind them. The extreme extinction's scope of destruction was much smaller than the sun lightsaber, but the same amount of energy was needed to use either technique. The dragon demon king worshippers had already gathered enough information on their foes. This was why they had a good idea as to which attack was being used. However, the dragon demon king worshipper also knew that there was a powerful magic placed over the waypoint. It would protect them. No matter how powerful Azel and Laura were, they would need time to gather enough power to decimate all the dragon demon king worshippers near the waypoint. The male dragon magin, who was leading the force from the plane of darkness, tried to immediately turn back. However, he had to quickly jump to the side before he could even turn around. Boom! A beam of light had planted itself where he had been a moment ago. It had missed him by a whisker. He realized that they had entered into a trap. The enemies, who had hidden themselves until now, revealed themselves. He's a dragon demon officer. It has been a while since we caught a big fish. An old dragon mage and magician with a face full of wrinkles spoke as he let out a sly smile. It was Beorin Michael. In the plane of darkness, dragon demons were ranked higher than dragon magians. Beorin had fought a very long time against the dragon demon king worshippers, but he had rarely had the opportunity to fight a dragon demon officer. The male dragon demon possessed blonde hair and dark blue horn. He also had deep blue eyes and dragon demon stone. He raged. You bastard. You are merely an old half-breed close to his deathbed, yet you want to fight me. Oh, that was quite the original taunt, young man. No, you might be around the same age as me. I am very envious of your youthfulness. The dragon demon officer appeared in front of the grinning Beorin. He looked as if he was about to lose his mind from anger, but it had been a feint. 
He used instantaneous movement to bridge the distance, and he ambushed Biorin. However, Biorin had been ready for his ambush. As soon as the sword of the dragon demon office was brought down, a beam of light struck him from behind. The dragon demon officer almost fell to his knees, but he able to ignore the damage. He finished his attack. Flames. Roar. His cantrip made his dragon demon magic increase in an explosive manner. However, an explosion occurred beneath his feet before he could do anything. It was merely the start. The dragon demon officer was barely able to dodge this new attack. Beams of lights and thunderbolts kept flying towards him. It was as if magic traps had been placed all over this region. Shit. I'm being played by a half-breed. The dragon demon officer frantically defended against the attacks as he moved all over the place. As he did so, his anger was reaching its zenith. It wasn't because he was moving according to Biorain's design. It was part of the reason. The main reason for his anger was the fact that half of Biorain's attacks were false attacks. It was being disguised to look like real attacks, and that angered him. This is why I like attacks that are flashy and noisy. It really gets the job done. Biorin kept letting out his sly laughter. Most of the forgotten techniques passed on to him by Azel dealt with the mind. It didn't matter if it was the spirit order or the dragon arts. There were many methods that dealt with the mind. Moreover, the defense of one's mind was the most important part of the lessons he had learned. He also learned how to circumvent such defenses. Biorin had always enjoyed using magic that amplified the effectiveness of his spell by using illusions. In the past, this method hadn't worked well against the elites of the Plane of Darkness. This changed when he learned the secret techniques. It worked so well that he had a lot of fun using it. Currently, the Dragon Demon Officer was a very skilled opponent. If it was his past self, Biorin would have had a hard time fighting this foe. However, he was using disruptive spells to aggravate the dragon demon officer's sight and hearing. It allowed Biorin to manipulate the mental waves of dragon demon officer. On top of that, he was manipulating the wave of magical energy to cause confusion to his foe. How long do you think this trickery will work on me? The dragon demon officer yelled out in anger. It was obvious that Biorin was an expert in offensive magic. His attacks were a bit too strong to ignore yet it was weak enough that one didn't need to dedicate oneself to defending against it. Biorain's attacks had a weird sense of balance that snowballed the annoyance being felt by the dragon demon officer. However, the dragon demon officer was slowly picking up on Biorain's intention. He is purposefully easing up his attack from one side. He is trying to make me move towards a certain direction. The other members of his party isn't attacking me, so a trap should be hidden in that direction. Biorin wasn't the only one fighting. Biorin's disciples were fighting against the subordinates of the dragon demon officer. Biorin was a high-ranked magician, and his strong point was being able to use a high quantity of offensive spells. This was how he restricted the movement of the dragon demon officer. He stopped the dragon demon officer from attacking his disciples. While he was doing this, Biorin was slowly easing off his attack from one direction. He was purposefully giving the dragon demon officer an out towards a particular direction. Since the dragon demon officer didn't have the ability to break through Biorain's assault, he had no choshi but to be follow Biorain's lead. When he reached a certain spot, a death trap would be sprung on him. It is a trap that is befitting a high-ranked magician. I admit it. You are worthy enough to be called dangerous. If his skill was lacking, the dragon demon officer would have been dragged around according to Biorain's will, and he would eventually die. However, he had a secret card. Of course, there was considerable risk to using his secret card. The problem was determining if it was worth it to take that risk. It happened at that moment. One of his subordinates let out a scream as he fell in battle. What happened? His subordinates had been holding out pretty well. The warriors and magicians had been working well together to hold back the enemies. When the dragon demon officer had realized that it was a faint operation, he had focused on defense. He chose to wait for reinforcements. The one that was short on time was the guardian shadows, not them. However, a variable had appeared in his calculations. We shouldn't drag this out too long. You are too old. 
Your body doesn't have the stamina. Chiron spoke as he shook off the blood on his sword. Biorin had asked Chiron to stay back. He was told only to intervene when it was absolutely necessary. Chiron determined he could wait no longer. Dragon Sword Duke. He is here too. Since the situation turned out like this, the dragon demon officer didn't hesitate. He immediately made the decision. I request it through the blood contract. You are my soul's sworn brother. Give me the power to change my fate. Biorin became tense when a massive amount of dragon demon magic emanated from his foe. What happened next was beyond anything he could have imagined. Come dragon demon weapon. Fire dragon's claw. The dragon demon officer held his long sword in one hand, and a dragon demon weapon in the other hand. It was shaped like a fire sword. His dragon demon magic was amplified, so he ripped away all the spells that was sent towards him by Biorin. Then he let out a fierce attack. The explosive flames swallowed up Biorin. Afterwards, the dragon demon officer didn't put his guard down. He ran towards Biorin's location. High-ranked magicians were terrifying, because they were like a walking castle. They were capable of defending and attacking. His dragon demon weapon probably took Biorin by surprise. But he couldn't guarantee that his attack had fully penetrated through Biorin's defense. On the other hand, he was sure that Biorin didn't have enough power to block his charging attack. The dragon demon officer had a rough idea as to how much magical energy remained within Biorin through their last engagement. He had made his calculations, and he was going to end this fight. Humph! You are too late, Dragon Sword Duke. The dragon demon officer let out a smile of satisfaction. Chiron was taken by surprise, so he was just starting to move. It had been a mistake to spectate the fight. It seemed they had been too confident in Biorain's abilities. The dragon demon officer pushed through the flames as he brought down his sword towards Biorin. Oh no! Biorin looked rattled as he watched the attack fall towards his head. However, something stopped the dragon demon weapon, which was surrounded by fire. It was a white staff. It was floating in the air. You are a possessor of a dragon demon weapon. I would have been dead if I hadn't put in a contingency plan for such a possibility. This is. The dragon demon officer's eyes opened wide. He knew what this staff was. Dragon weapon. Chiron and Biorin had played pivotal roles in making the dragon weapon. It wasn't a dragon demon weapon, but it was a tool that was capable of storing and using dragon demon magic. He hid this from the beginning. Did he predict this situation? From the beginning, Biorin had hidden his staff inside the trap spell. He triggered the trap spell when the dragon demon officer charged forward with his dragon demon weapon. When the dragon demon officer used his final attack, the dragon demon magic stored within the dragon weapon exploded as the trap magic was sprung. The dragon demon officer's dragon demon magic was suddenly stalled, and it felt as if his energy pulse was about to be ripped apart. Pain washed over him. Biorin spoke. Goodbye. It is a shame that I cannot take the dragon demon weapon from you. You can trade it for currency when you reach the underworld. The dragon demon officer wanted to express his anger, but he could only scream. Biorin shot a beam of light, and his head was obliterated. 5. When the guardian shadows attacked a waypoint to the road of emptiness, the basic plan was for an all-out surprise offensive attack. If reinforcement came through the waypoint, it would most likely be figures like Almeric and Ragus. These were dangerous foes that had to be avoided. This rule held true even when Azul's party had joined them. This fight had been intense, but it took them 10 minutes to wipe out their enemies. The battle was short, but it didn't mean that the fight wasn't exhausting. It was a fight where one could lose one's life at any moment. The fear and nervousness ate away at their energy even if the fight was extended for a couple seconds. I am really envious of you. You are only old in the inside. Biorin breathed in the medicine that had been burned into gaseous form. He grumbled. It was a recovery medicine that calmed Biorin's nerves. It also returned some vitality back to his body. Biorin was an archmage, and his magical energy was powerful. However, his body had aged. If their situation was a bit less desperate, it might have been a different story. However, they were fighting a life and death battles against powerful foes. 
His stamina was lacking. Chiron spoke. You are old. Yet you overdid yourself. You aren't some reckless teen. You pushed yourself. Too far. Because you wanted to show off in front of the legendary hero. If you had let the Guardian Shadows participate in the battle. It would have been an easy victory. We won. So why are you complaining so much? Biorin and his disciples fought without the help of the Guardian Shadows. If they had fought normally, the battle would have been ended without them taking on so much of a burden. It is unfortunate. Azel watched Biorin. It truly was unfortunate. Biorin was such an excellent magician that the Plane of Darkness had put him on their watch list. Moreover, he had improved to a point where he could fight a one-on-one -on -one battle with high-ranking officers from the Plane of Darkness. He had been in the, the same boat as Chiron, Arietta and Saiga. He possessed excellent basic foundation. He overcame the loss of techniques though experience gained from real battles. By learning the lost techniques, his overall ability had steeply increased. Even if one counted those within the Plane of Darkness and the Alberton Forest, Biorin would rank as one of the top ten magicians alive. He focused solely on magic to reach this level at his age. However, he is already showing signs of old age. In terms of raw power, Azel possessed a similar amount as Biorin. Since they had lost Urin, it was logical to fill the empty spot with another magician. However, he was too old. He was a dragon magian, so he possessed more vitality than a person his age. However, he wasn't someone that could keep up with Azel party's rigorous schedule. His disciples are also excellent but they aren't at a level required for what I need. Azel's party hadn't intervened in the fight either, because Biorin and his disciples had requested it. They wanted to prove their worthiness to Azel. In the end, Azel came to a conclusion that they were excellent. However, they were also found lacking. They were unsuitable to join his party. Atain had revived now, and the hole left behind by Euron was too big to fill. We need another magician. Laura was an excellent magician, yet it wasn't enough to only have her. For example, the party had decided to, to split up, and Laura had been unable to support both party. Suddenly, Chiron had an odd expression on his face. Him, this is. I'm not sure what is going on. What are you talking about? It seems there is internal strife amongst them. What? Everyone became surprised. They turned to look at Chiron. Chiron was holding the staff of the Guardian Shadows. Half the Guardian Shadows were monitoring the waypoints. When they sensed a change, they had contacted Chiron. The sight being seen by the Guardian Shadows were being transmitted to Chiron's mind. He mumbled his words. They are fighting each other. Moreover, the ones being chased are pretty big fishes. Chapter 221. Renegades. Part 4. Atain, who had been revived had given his declaration. Afterwards, a fierce maelstrom of confusion and chaos swept over the plane of darkness. The leaders of each faction hadn't made their intentions clear yet. They knew it was useless to hide, since the great darkness existed. Despite knowing this, the leadership group went underground to avoid the eyes of Atain. They held a meeting, and a fierce debate was still ongoing. The leadership group was supposed to give orders to the outside members, yet they were in a meeting. Of course, confusion erupted amongst the outside members. The Guardian Shadows had caught sight of this, and this was how they were able to detect the fracture occurring within the Plane of Darkness. After Atain made his intentions clearly known, he remained within the Dragon Demon Palace. He wasn't showing any signs of moving. In his heart, Atain knew how the leadership group would act. He could see deep down into their heart, yet he gave them the opportunity to make their own choice. If this happened during the Dragon Demon War, the Dragon Demon King's army would have been torn asunder. Originally, Atain had focused on gathering Dragon Demons, who had their own kingdom. That was how he had created his alliance. Currently, Atain was a living god to the Dragon Demon King worshippers. The leadership group within the Plane of Darkness had propped up their power structure by relying on the worship of the Dragon Demon King. If they left the Plane of Darkness, they would have nothing. In the end, their decision had been made for them. The leaders of each faction knew this truth, yet they were hesitating to take that last step. She's so spirited even in this mess. 
Is this the difference between the young and the old? The one to ask the question was a dragon demon undead magician. He had been a tall dragon demon. Only his skeleton was left, and he wore a fancy robe, which he had worn when he was alive. A darkness appeared in front of him. A frightening wave of dragon demon magic was emitted from his dangerous spell. However, the dragon demon undead looked relaxed. It is true that she possesses excellent abilities compared to her age. However, she is still too green to be called his heir. Her talent is excellent, yet her achievements are unremarkable. As expected, the fault lies with her teacher. The spells that he was manifesting at high speed were neutralized by the darkness. Another dragon demon undead spoke to him. Stop acting so high and mighty. If you were by yourself, you would have fallen. She is skilled, and we shouldn't be treating her like a cub. She really lives up to the reputation of being his daughter. If I still had my dragon demon weapon, I would have been able to fight her one on one. No, I would have been able to take her down if the princess didn't possess his dragon demon weapon. All three dragon demon undead, who were conversing, were magicians. They were fighting against a dragon demon female with long black hair. It was Nibirus. After the revived Atain gave his declaration, it had shocked everyone within the plane of darkness. Nibirus' mind had went blank for a while. She couldn't even think. It allowed her to have a devastating moment of enlightenment. What have I been doing up until now? She considered it her duty to fight at the front line since she carried the blood of the dragon demon king Atain. As she waited for a time's return, she put her life on the line to fight in his name. It had been a point of pride for Nibirus. She had built her entire life on a belief system, yet her faith was denied by none other than Aten. She had been tormented since Azel had brought her Sybane's message. She could no longer take it. She had put her life on the life for the cause, yet she knew that everything she had worked towards had been all a lie. How could she not despair? I want to meet my father. She had abstained from food and drink for the past couple days. On impulse, she ran away from the plane of darkness. She didn't have any plans when she made that decision. It didn't take too long for the pursuers to appear. Of course, it resulted in her wiping out her pursuers. However, another group of pursuers appeared before Nibirus could arrive at the Alberton Forest. They were powerful foes that would be a little bit too difficult for her. They are strong. The dragon demon undead magicians were very skilled. When they became undead, they had lost the dragon demon magic. However, in terms of quantity of magical energy, they were on par with Nibirus. Moreover, they were a bit more skilled in using their magic. Nibirus was able to last against these three opponents, because she possessed the Book of the Dark Soul. Moreover, they had probably been ordered to catch her alive. If they had attacked her with the intent to kill, she would have been dead already. As expected of those that had participated in the Holy War, they are skilled. These were beings that had been part of the Dragon Demon King's army in the Dragon Demon War. They believed Atain would be revived someday, and they had wanted to greet him when Atain returned. They had turned themselves into the undead, and they had put themselves to sleep. When the waypoints to the Road of Emptiness started being attacked, the leaders of the Plane of Darkness became desperate. The undeads were awakened. Unlike those alive, they didn't feel any moral dilemma. They just followed Atain's will. They were part of the group that had turned the plane of darkness into a cult of madness. However, they were unlike those that had spent their time collecting power within the plane of darkness. They believed Atain to be the absolute being. The method to reach Atain's ideal had changed a bit from what they attempted during the Dragon Demon War. However, they would willingly give their powers to the cause. You are starting to getting tired, princess. This might hurt a little bit, but this is the consequence of you not giving up. While two fought a magic battle with Nibirus, the third magician took his time to prepare a great magic. Nibirus used her Book of the Dark Soul as she tried to interfere with their spells. She tried to overwhelm them through sheer number of spells, but their defense was like a steel wall. Followers of the Black Death Nibirus had seen this spell in the records of the Dragon Demon War. However, she hadn't been allowed to inspect or learn this great spell yet. Evil energy gathered from the nearby region, 
and it formed into twelve giants wearing armor. It was the black magic familiars called the corrupted beings. Niverus used it occasionally. If there was a difference, these corrupted beings didn't possess a physical body. They were made through the essence of magic, and a very powerful spell was placed on them. The corrupted beings raised their enormous swords as they headed towards Niberus. It was as if they were sliding across the floor. They moved at a surprisingly high speed. Niberus sent a fireball towards them. After halting their charge, she planned on sending out consecutive spells. Ah, the result was so far off target that Niberus paused for a brief moment. Her flames just slid past the surface of the corrupted beings. The sound of an explosion rang out as her barrier magic shook. She had been startled, and it created an opening. The undead dragon demons to attack her. As expected, you haven't fully learned this magic. You don't know the effects of this magic either. Niberus desperately restored her destroyed barrier magic. As she did so, she activated the spells stored within the Book of Dark Soul. She attempted to block the movement of the corrupted beings. However, it was useless. She had tried to unravel their essence by sending curses towards them, but they were all swallowed up. Moreover, any magic that created physical damage slid right off the surface of their skin. Niberus observed the phenomena, and she came to an answer. This magic is used when trying to hunt down a black magician. The power of the curse and destruction were eaten by the corrupted beings. The power was purified, and it was pumped into the corrupted beings. Flames and lightning, which created physical damage, were deflected by the anti-magic spell placed on their skin. This black magic constructs were created with the purpose of capturing a black magician. It was the worst type of attack for Niberus. Her power was based on darkness, and she was most skilled in black magic. Of course, there were limits to their abilities. However, the twelve corrupted beings were moving as one, and three magicians, who were as skilled as her, were supporting the corrupted beings. She was being quickly overwhelmed by their number. Give up, princess. We do not want to harm you. If you let us subdue you. It happened at that moment. A vivid red flower petal floated past them. It was a sight that was disparate from their surrounding. Him, this is. They had participated in the dragon demon war. They were taken aback by the unexpected development, but they immediately realized what was going on. Blood Flower Garden. Afterwards, several thousand red flower petals invaded their surrounding. It was dizzying. It is the bleeding star. Did the descendant of General Baldazark turn traitor too? If they were normal beings, they would have died from the ambush. However, they had seen countless instances where the power of the bleeding star during the Dragon Demon War. It is too bad. I put a lot of effort in preparing this, yet it was all for naught. The two undead magicians quickly formed barriers to slow down the completion of the Blood Flower Garden. The third magician used the extra time to finish his spell, then he flicked his finger. Afterwards, two corrupted beings exploded. The wave of magical energy swirled like a storm as it blew away the flower petals, which had been forming the Blood Flower Garden. When the completion of the Blood Flower Garden was thwarted, Kieran appeared from within the petals. You really look like General Baldazark. The dragon demon undead magicians were surprised when they caught sight of Kieran for the first time. Unlike Kieran, the undead magicians continued their attack. A cursed beam impacted on top of Kieran's defensive magic. At the same time, a corrupted being closed in on Kieran. You dare! Kieran responded with rage. He detonated the ground as he flipped over the corrupted being. He followed this up by sending a lightning bolt towards the dragon demon undead. The surprise attack obstructed the view of the undead magicians, and red petals started to appear around them once again. The dragon demon undead magicians revealed their surprise. Shit. Did he already acquire blood before coming here? Dragon demon general Baldazark's bleeding star controlled the nearby blood. If one bled from a wound, the blood would float into the air, and it would be sucked into the bleeding star. The absorbed blood was used as a source of magical energy, and an overwhelming amount of spells could be formed using this method. In other words, the bleeding star couldn't display its full potential, unless a source of blood was obtained. 
During the battle between the dragon demon Undead and Niberus, all life around them was destroyed. Not even corpses were left behind, so the dragon demon Undead assumed that the Bleeding Star wouldn't be able to use its true power. However, Kieran had conducted a mass slaughter before he came here. He already had a reservoir of blood. This was why his dragon demon magic was continuing to climb higher. It was as if his dragon demon magic was uncapped. We are in danger. It was the most dangerous technique that could be used on a battlefield, they were able to block the Bloodflower Garden, but Kieran was too powerful. If he teamed up with Niberus, it was up in the air as to whether the dragon demon undeads could win again them. Suddenly, one of them spoke. Aldrit. Are you sure you'll be okay? I'll have to sleep for a while, but it'll be worth it if we are able to retrieve the dragon demon weapons. At the time of the dragon demon war, the dragon demon undeads had learned all kinds of technique from Atain and the dragon demon generals. Even if one wasn't a disciple of the dragon demon generals, it was easy to learn techniques from them. It had been like that during the dragon demon war. The young generation of the plane of darkness had grown up with the techniques forbidden to them. They only gained access depending on their achievements and rank. The dragon demon undeads possessed a broad breadth of knowledge. One of the dragon demon undead used a spell that had been hoarded in this era. No way. Niberus' eyes widened when she saw it. Unlike the followers of the Black Death, she knew this spell very well. Queen of Darkness. It was of the great magic that Niberus could manifest, but she needed to borrow the power of the Book of Dark Soul to accomplish it. When the Queen of Darkness was completed, a tidal wave of darkness washed over them. In the middle of the darkness, she saw the dragon demon undead, and its eyes was emitting light. Hoo hoo. It might be different for those that are alive, but we are dead. We buried our essence in the great darkness, so it is possible for us to borrow its power like this. The Queen of Darkness explosively amplified the power of magicians that used magical energy of darkness. It was such a powerful magic that it took a very long time to manifest, yet the dragon demon undead was able to complete it in short order. It was completed way too quickly. It wasn't as if the dragon demon undead possessed a dragon demon weapon. As a magician, he wasn't superior to Niberus. It meant that he had given up a great cost for being able to manifest this magic. If their previous conversation was any indication, it seemed the dragon demon undead would lose time. He would have to go back to sleep for a while. On the other hand, the cost incurred by the dragon demon undead didn't help Niberus and Chiron in any way right now. Kieran looked tense as he spoke. Chapter 222. Renegades. Part 5. Kieran looked tense as he spoke. Go, Niberus. Kieran. Niberus was so surprised that she called out his name. He had wordlessly appeared out of nowhere. The fact that he had come to save her was surprising. Kieran was probably shocked by his own action, yet his attention remained fixed on Niberus. He was worried about her. Are you planning on meeting Sibane Nim? How did you know? We've known each other for a long time. Of course, I know about it. Kieran glared at the dragon demon undead magicians as he spoke towards his back. He didn't want to show Niberus his sad expression. I'll block them here. I can buy you enough time, so you can escape from this place. I refuse. What? At Niberus' firm reply, Kieran became surprised. He turned to look at Niberus. The dragon demon undead, who had manifested the Queen of Darkness, attacked Kieran at that moment. The sound of an explosion rang out as Kieran was pushed backwards. He had been so surprised that he had opened himself to an attack. He had almost died. The one to block the attack was Niberus. It is my selfish wish to want to meet my father. I won't be able to forgive myself if you are sacrificed in the pursuit of my selfish wish. Niberus was firm with her words. Darkness started to appear around her like wildfire. They've experienced the holy war. She greeted the darkness, which arose like a tsunami. I acknowledge that you are powerful. However, we also fought on the front line in this era. We won't go down so easily. Him. All the dragon demon undead became surprised. Something unexpected was occurring. The dragon demon undead had created the queen of darkness, 
but Niberus was slowly absorbing the magical energy of darkness created by this spell. Is it the Book of Dark Soul? I'm pretty sure such a function doesn't exist. The magic hidden with the dragon demon weapon called the Book of Dark Soul was creating a change within the great spell. Niberus glared at them with cold eyes as she spoke. You have been asleep for over 200 years. Did you really think my father would have done nothing during that time? The dragon demon undead groaned. Niberus. Kieran looked at Niberus with a truly complicated expression on her face. He felt resentment and frustration by the fact that she wasn't following his will. On the other hand, she had made it clear that she wouldn't sacrifice him. He felt admiration and love for her. His mixed emotions made him speechless, and it caused confusion within him. It doesn't matter what I want. It'll be meaningless if I obtain what I want through objectionable means. Kieran, if you want me to meet my father. Niberus spoke. Let's fight together. Let's defeat them. Ha! Her words were brazen, yet he couldn't help but laugh. Ha 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 ha! Splendid! His shoulders shook as he laughed. He looked unburdened as he spoke. Yes, this is the Niberus I know. I'll do as you wish. This is why they are cubs. The dragon demon undead just shook their heads. There was a gap of 220 years between the two groups, yet they clashed once again. In a fight between high-ranked magicians, it all came down to how much resources one had. The quantity of magical energy, and the ability to manifest spells was important. However, the outcome usually came down to how effective one's specialty magic was in the battle. Moreover, it depended on how much preparation one had made beforehand. These factors greatly influenced the outcome. An analogous example was a fight between two armies with same number of soldiers. The outcome of the fight depended on which army was better equipped and supplied. This was why the result of this fight was already determined from the start. The bloodied Kieran fell in place. A hand of a skeleton grabbed his head before he could fall on his face. Excellent. In the end, you pushed all three of us to this state. The fight between the two young dragon demons and the three dragon demon undead had been fierce. In the end, all three undead chose to sacrifice their time. They decided to use the great magic that would significantly amplify their power. It also meant that they would have to go back to sleep for a long while after this fight. Despite using this measure, the dragon demon magicians had lost all their corrupted beings of black death. Moreover, the body of the two dragon demon magicians were half destroyed. If they were living foes, the dragon demon undead magicians might have lost this fight. However, they were undead. The destruction of their body didn't even decrease their power. These weren't fatal wounds for them. The power of the curse slowed down their recovery a little bit, but the broken bone fragments were returning to their body. Their original form was being restored. Suddenly, one of the dragon demon undead spoke. How about this? Let's negotiate, princess. Unlike the fallen Kieran, Niberus remained uncaptured. Her fighting spirit was still alive. However, the Book of Dark Soul had been unsummoned, and she was injured. She was breathing hard. The dragon demon undead held up Kieran towards her. The princess must be kept alive, but that isn't true with the young Baldazark. He does look like General Baldazark. I do not want to kill his descendant, but I'll do it if it'll allow us to recover his dragon demon weapon. Niberus raged. She glared at him with scorn in her eyes. You bastard. You are trying to take him as hostage. As someone that participated in the holy war, do you have no pride? My pride means nothing to me when compared to the king's great cause. I'm suggesting the most peaceful solution I can come up with. Even if we continue this fight, the result is predetermined. However, we can ill afford to hold back anymore. We might kill you by mistake, and we want to avoid such an ending. Niberus bit her lips. She knew the dragon demon undead was sincere in his words. Her bloodline had little to do with their problem. If one looked at it objectively, Niberus' Book of Dark Soul wasn't under the control of the Great Darkness. It could only be passed on through her will. She had to voluntarily hand over the dragon demon weapon. On the other hand, Kieran's bleeding star would be returned to the dragon demon palace when he died. These powerful figures hadn't tracked down Niberus, 
because of her station within the plane of darkness. The Book of Dark Soul was what they wanted. The dragon demon weapon was worth too much to let it go. Nibiris was being crushed by the enormous pressure of her current situation. I have no choice. The problem was the fact that the outcome was fixed. Nibiris felt humiliated. Her body shook as she opened her mouth. All right, if I accept your proposal. It happened at that moment. Found. Target acquired. Secured. Nibiris was shocked. She swiveled her head. It sounded as if little kids were whispering from every direction. Nibiris could never forget these voices. White phantom-like beings were rushing towards them. They slid across the ground. They kept appearing and disappearing like mirages. It was the guardian shadows. How did they find us? The dragon demon undead were taken aback. Around 30 guardian shadows had approached them without being noticed. The guardian shadows capable of long-ranged attacks focused their attack on the dragon demon undead magicians. The guardian shadows capable of melee used this time to get close. Shit. We have to protect Sir Baldazark and the princess. The dragon demon undead sounded annoyed as they decided on a course of action. Since they were in an uninhabited region, they had no idea as to how the guardian shadows were able to find them. Still, they knew the guardian shadows' sole purpose was to wipe out the dragon demon king worshippers. They were probably going to attack everyone here. That's what they thought. What the hell? What's going on? The guardian shadows ignored Nibiris and they only attacked the three dragon demon undead. Moreover, they even took possession of Kieran when the dragon demon undead retreated in shock. The guardian shadow threw Kieran towards Nibiris. She reflexively used magic to catch him. Afterwards, a guardian shadow slid towards her, and a familiar voice was heard from the guardian shadow. Him, I never expected a day to come when I would have to save you, Nibiris. Cold-blooded queen. It was Leticia's voice. Leticia's voice had answered Nibiris. Yes, we don't have the time to for a long conversation. Also, I don't want to have a long conversation with you either. I'll buy you some time, so fuck off. There isn't many on our side, so we won't be able to hold out for too long. In terms of controlling the Guardian Shadows in a fight, Leticia was much better at it than Chiron. Even if she was good at it, the number of guardian shadows gathered in this location was too low. She was limited in what she could do. Nibiris was confused only for a brief moment. She spoke. I'll pay back this debt someday. I'll remember that promise. Nibiris left behind that voice, and she escaped with Kieran in tow. Shit. That felt dirty, Leticia grumbled, while she kept her eyes close. Chiron had assigned half of the Guardian Shadows to the waypoints of the Road of Darkness. They were placed there to keep surveillance. This was why they had caught sight of Nibiris using the waypoint near the Plane of Darkness. They saw her head towards the Alberton Forest. The number of Guardian Shadows sent to rescue Nibiris was low. The location of the waypoint was to blame. They had placed enough Guardian Shadows to observe a waypoint, but they hadn't placed enough to act as a fighting force. Chiron let out a bitter laughter as he spoke. I understand why you feel that way, but it can't be helped. Laura was the first one to suggest that they rescue Nibiris. She had spoken with her heart, not her head. The party quickly debated their next action, and in the end, they decided to save Nibiris. Leticia spoke. I understand that. That is why I'm trying my best. Anyways, these bastards are quite skilled. They are tired, yet. The three dragon demon undead had fought Nibiris and Kieran, so they were in a rough state. Despite this fact, they were able to easily withstand the fierce attack of the guardian shadows. Suddenly, Leticia furrowed her brows. Him, what is it? Chiron asked her a question. Leticia's expression hardened as she spoke. We are in trouble. What happened? It seems our efforts will be for naught. Again, what is going on? Ragus has appeared. Chiron flinched. Since Ragus had appeared, the Guardian Shadows wouldn't be able to buy any time. Nibiris and Kieran would be caught in no time. Shit. Chiron struck the tree next to him. Leticia had a defeated expression on her face, but her expression changed. It changed into a peculiar expression. Wait a moment. Something weird just happened. What is it? 
It seems Regis wants to talk to us. 10. When Regis showed up, the fight between the three dragon demon undead and the guardian shadows came to a halt. Regis acted as if there wasn't a fight going on. He just walked in between them. Him. Stop for a brief moment. The guardian shadow had shot a pillar of light, and the dragon demon undead magicians had shot a fireball. Regis took on both attacks with his body. He was hit full on, yet he continued to walk as if nothing had hit him. Both sides stopped when they saw this. Hey, Moor's Ice, are you still watching us? We've had such fun battles against each other, so I'll feel a bit hurt if you ignore me. Well, it is said that a woman's bashfulness is a virtue. It can't be helped. Please wait a moment. After he spoke those words, he turned to look at the three dragon demon undead. Will you grant my request? What is your request? The dragon demon undead were nervous. They could tell that something was off with Regus. Just go back. I know why you guys are here. You want to reclaim the dragon demon weapons possessed by Sybane's daughter and the descendant of Baldazark. I want you to give up on that. I want you guys to return. What if we can't we can't acquiesce to that request? Well. Regus scratched his cheek as if he was reluctant to do this. You'll have to fight me. If they were still alive, they would have stopped breathing. However, the three of them were undead, so they just flinched as they froze in place. Regus spoke. I don't want to fight against those that I fought alongside with in the past. Above all else, I don't want to fight those that have already died against the humans. You guys look raggedy, so I don't think it'll feel good killing you guys. Therefore, you guys should just leave this place. Sir Regus, are you? Do you plan on going against his will? It somehow turned out like that. Regus didn't deny it. My temperament doesn't go well with what Atane is trying to do this time around. I do owe him for reviving me, but I died in his service during the Dragon Demon War. I'll just count this revival as repayment for that service. Regus was an undead that was subordinate to the Great Darkness. However, his will wasn't under the control of Atane. When the revived Atane spoke his goal, Regus had decided he wasn't going to serve Atane as his king. Atane probably knows about it already. Still, I didn't want to stab him in the back so soon after his revival. It isn't manly. I want you to deliver this message to him. When the stage is set, we can have a ball fighting each other. You'll regret this. I never regret my actions. You say such words despite knowing my personality. In the end, the three dragon demon undead gave up on their hunt. They retreated. After seeing him off, Regus turned to speak to the guardian shadow. Well, Moor's Ice, will you let me hear your voice? I have something important I want to talk to you about. Chapter 223. Old Revenants. Part 1. The waypoint of the road of darkness within the dragon demon palace couldn't be used by anyone. It was possible for anyone to leave the Dragon Demon Palace using the waypoint, but there was a rigorous procedure that had to be used for incoming traffic. One had to possess great authority to use it. Of course, those in charge of guarding the waypoint knew who possessed such authority. All of them boasted high rank in the Plane of Darkness. The backlash would be immense if the guards mistakenly misidentified one of them. It is a cold neighborhood. When I heard it was called the Dragon Demon Castle, I expected it to be majestic and stylish. It is big, but it is bleak. It isn't that great. Someone had appeared from the waypoint, and he was mumbling to himself as he surveyed his surrounding. The guards didn't recognize his face at all. The first thing one noticed was his hair. Everyone's gaze naturally went towards the Dragon Demon's hair. He had shaggy hair, and it had a metallic blue color to it. It was eye-catching. His eyes and dragon demon stone was green. The horns above his ears resembled the horn of a ram. The horn was gray, but it also had a bluish tinge to it. He didn't look nervous at all as he strode forward. When he did so, a soldier armed to the teeth got in his way. Halt! The dragon mage and swordsman, who was the captain of the guards, spoke. The invader with the blue metallic hair tilted his head in puzzlement. Him, why are you blocking my way? Did they not deliver the news yet? Who are you? I am called Rishu. He was the dragon demon youth called Rishu. After leaving the Alberton forest, he hadn't been in a hurry. 
he had traveled through the Alberton forest. Then he crossed the Atazan mountain range to arrive inside the plain of darkness. The journey had taken couple days. After he observed the confusion within the frozen land, he used the nearest waypoint to enter into the dragon demon castle. You've lost your mind. I want you to get on your knees, and put your hands behind your head. If you do so, I won't take your life. Rishu sighed at the hostility shown by the dragon magen. Rishu looked as if he felt awkward about his situation. He called me here, yet this is how he takes care of his business. Geez, Atane. Well, it's all right. I just have to wait here for a little bit, and this issue will be resolved. Before that happens, Rishu had a playful smile on his face as he took a step forward. I want to test the elite troops that are guarding the dragon demon castle. Let's see how useful you guys are. Kill him. The dragon mage in commander didn't hesitate as he gave the order for an attack. Aside from his hair color, Rishu looked shabby and loose. However, one could get a sense of his power when one truly looked at him. There was a powerful strength within him. One couldn't judge him by the cover. All the troops that were guarding the dragon demon palace were elites. The troops were a bit confused by the current situation, but they immediately attacked when their commander gave the order. The magicians activated all the spells they had prepared beforehand. After a beat later, the warriors charged forward. The commander had already spoken to his subordinates through whispering, so the elite soldiers didn't take their opponent lightly. The warriors staggered the use of their instantaneous movement as they charged forward. It didn't matter how powerful a warrior was. One shouldn't be able to withstand against such an attack. If the enemy was weak, he would die immediately. If he was someone that was skilled, he'll try to dodge to either side. Their strategy took both possibilities into consideration. The enemy would eventually reveal an opening when dodging their attack, and at that moment, he would be dead. However, in the next moment, a dull sound rang out in the commander's ears. Him, the commander became a bit confused when he heard it, and in the next moment, he heard a similar sound ring out in succession. Two, the sound wasn't originating from the same location. The sound was so fast, and the interval between the sound was so short. The only reason why he was able to hear it was the fact that the sound was following one after another. When he realized this fact, an unbelievable sight was seen by him. The warriors, who had staggered their instantaneous movement, were all flying in the air. No way. As the commander looked on with shocked eyes, Rishu walked towards him. He had an apathetic expression on his face. For a moment, the commander just watched Rishu with a dumbfounded expression on his face. His subordinates, who had been sent into the air, fell to the ground. It created a loud din. Oh, you guys are pretty well trained. You'll be able to kill most opponents in an instant. How? The commander was so surprised that his mouth kept opening and closing like a fish. The warriors, who had been taken down by Rishu, were the first column. There was a second column that had been held back just in case. It was the commander's job to order the magicians and the second column to mobilize. However, the event that had occurred in front of him had paralyzed his thought process. Rishu's movement had been so fast that the commander had a hard time understanding what had occurred. He was a step too late in realizing what had happened. He was able to use the pure copper technique. He was able to imbue this technique to various parts of his body. He was actually able to use the segmented pure copper technique. The commander was also a high-ranked dragon arts practitioner. This was why he was able to discern half of Rishu's movements, and he was able to piece together what had occurred. In the beginning, Rishu took on half the spells by strengthening his body. He let the spells hit him. The other half was deflected using his hands. Afterwards, he stood in place as he faced the warriors using the pure copper technique. He hit the body of the first warrior before the warrior could fully swing his sword. Another swordsman moved up from the side, and Rishu had broken the sword in half. Then he struck the swordsman's head. He foiled the attack of each soldier in succession. None of the soldiers could react to Rishu's movements. It was as if Rishu was moving in a different timeline from them. They had accelerated their body to the fullest extent, yet each of them was struck down by Rishu. Impossible. 
segmented pure copper technique could be called the pinnacle amongst the body movement technique. One created an explosive acceleration as one used a body movement technique in conjunction. It was a lethal attack technique that could be considered a divine move. This technique was rare, but there were couple people that were capable of using it. Azel was one of them. However, none of them used this technique on a body part. It was usually used on a weapon. It was used when an archer shot an arrow. It could also be used when a warrior throws his weapon. It was usually used to accelerate an inanimate object to an unusual degree. Common sense said it was impossible to do use this technique on one's body part. Even if one possessed a sturdy body, one's body shouldn't be able to withstand the backlash. Rishu had done it as if it was nothing. Rishu just shrugged his shoulder as he queried the commander. You want more of this? You look a bit better than your subordinates. If you have one, why don't you take out your dragon demon weapon? You guys should end it there. At that moment, a voice brimming with power intruded in on them. The commander looked back, and he yelled out in surprise. General Almeric, a large dragon demon that was over two meters tall was walking towards them. Almeric spoke to the commander. He is a guest invited here by his majesty. I'm sorry for not giving you an advanced notice. I, I see. I thought he would contact us before he came here. I'm sorry. It is nothing. The commander was letting out cold sweat. He wasn't being timid, because of Almeric's presence. He had just realized that Rishu hadn't killed anyone. Everyone that had charged towards Rishu was still alive. In fact, none of them looked seriously injured. It meant that there was an overwhelming gap in skills between Rishu and his men. How is this possible? Is he perhaps on par with the dragon demon generals in terms of skill? Rishu was so strong that it made the commander have such thoughts. Rishu grumbled. Geez, you called me here. So why is the reception like this? His majesty is busy right now. I apologize for not being quick in taking care of this business. As he spoke those words, Almeric stared at Rishu's face. It is the first time meeting you face to face. It is nice to meet you. You are right. I look forward to working with you. Almeric and Rishu shook each other's hand. Until the revived Atane had told spoken to him. Almeric hadn't known that Rishu was a new ally. At the time of Dragon Demon War, Atane had taken only Ornsaurus to the Alberton Forest. This was why they had never met each other. However, it felt as if they knew each other since they heard about each other through Atane. When Atane imparted information, he didn't do it through words. Atane made it so that the information was vivid. I can see why Atane chose you. You are very skilled. Thank you for your compliment. In terms of age, Rishu was much younger than Almeric. However, both had mutual respect for each other based on the skills they possessed. Almeric casually exited the place. Rishu followed after him. He asked Almeric a question. Ah, how's your descendant doing? I did hear about you saving him. Thank you. In the past, the Keeper of Prophecy Iota had attacked the waypoint being guarded by Jeffers Almeric. He had almost died in the defense of the waypoint. The one to save Jeffers was Rishu. He had been on his way back to the Alberton Forest after roaming the world. At the time, Rishu had dyed his hair black. Rishu followed Almeric, and they met Atain deep within the Dragon Demon Castle. Welcome, Rishu. It has been a while, Atain. It really. Do I look weird? Rishu had an odd expression on his face when he saw Atain. Rishu furrowed his brows as he answered Atain's question. Him. It's nothing. When I saw you last, you didn't look like that. I know you are the same person, yet. It is truly an odd feeling. Rishu had met Atain during the end of the plague called the Great Darkness. At the time, Atain hadn't looked like his current self. He looked like Bayon. To be precise, Atain had been moving the corpse of Bayon like a puppet. Now he had the appearance of himself during the Dragon Demon War. It made Atain feel like a stranger to Rishu. I see. You are comparing my appearance to the one fifty years ago. It seems you haven't transcended the limit of your lifespan. You can tell just by looking at me. I can't tell at a glance, but I've seen you intermittently over the past two hundred years. I've observed your change. I don't know if you can feel it, but you've aged. 
In terms of human age, you've aged around two to three years. Him. Even amongst the first generation dragon demons, a very few had been able to transcend their lifespan. Wasn't that the reason why Kaali had developed her reincarnation technique? Even after living a very long life, Atain hadn't seen many that were capable of transcending the limitation of their lifespan. In terms of those that participated in the Dragon Demon War, only Atain and the Dragon Demon Generals had transcended their lifespan. I see. Still, I'm still in my growth period. If you were a normal Dragon Demon, you would be considered to be in the twilight of your years, yet you are saying you are still in your growth phase. Of all people, you shouldn't be saying that to me, Atain. Anyways, you didn't look so great last time I saw you. How are you doing? Not much has changed. I see. Will you give me your answer? Will we really be able to eliminate tragedy and corruption from this world? I'll do so right now. Atain willingly told Rishu about his idea. On that day, Rishu joined a Tyne's camp. He became the new dragon demon general, and he filled the void created by Ragus's defection. Chapter 224 Old Revenants. Part 2. The Dragon Demon King worshippers were unable to dig themselves out of the chaos caused by Atine's revival. Azul's party took advantage of this. They pushed hard against their enemies, and they continuously achieved result. An orange-colored flame raged. A frightening amount of heat was dominating the surrounding. In the middle of all of this, a dragon magin girl with long white hair raised a white sword. It looked as if the sword was carved out of a bone. Rage. Roaring fire. The dragon magin girl had polished her words of power through the dragon arts. It amplified the wave of dragon demon magic emitted by Arietta. At the same time, the fire that had been radiating in all directions gathered in a single location to turn into an incandescent flame sword. The flame followed the trajectory of the sword. It sliced through the barrier around the magician-like butter, and his body was cut into two. The heat was so concentrated within the flame sword that it instantly cauterized the wounds. There was no blood shed from the severed body. She had killed the troublesome magician with a single blow, and a dragon magin warrior used this chance to rush her from behind. The flame around her was gone, so he thought this was his golden opportunity. He used his instantaneous movement. Arietta blocked the thunderous attack that had been unleashed from behind her. Was she out of balance? Her stance faltered as she was pushed backwards. I will take you with me, dragon demon princess. The dragon magin warrior was confident in his victory. He kicked Arietta, who had lost her balance. He brought down his sword towards her from above. At that moment, a sphere made out of fire hit the dragon magin warrior from the back. He was sent flying. He died without being able to scream. A fiery silhouette descended upon him. It was shaped like a bird. Soon, the flame burned the dragon magin warrior. The body was burned black as it collapsed into ashes. As expected, I cannot be careless. When Arietta checked that the battle was over, she caught her breath. A phoenix that was as big as her was circling around her. It was the dragon demon weapon called the crying phoenix. It was capable of fighting on its own, and its power was on par with a dragon. The dragon weapon was able to move freely as it emitted fire from its body. Since Arietta was excellent at manipulating fire, her overall power had made a drastic jump. Impious sinners. Suddenly, she heard a voice next to her, so she turned her head. It was the magician she had cut in half with her flame sword. Was it because his wound hadn't bled? He hadn't died instantly. Still, his life force was slowly extinguishing. I'll make it painless. Even if he was an enemy she had to kill, Arietta didn't enjoy causing unnecessary pain. That wasn't her style. You are all foolish. You might think you have won. Rejoice in that assumption. The magician was dying, yet he snickered as he spoke. Maybe, the pain of having his body severed in half was making him lose his mind. We aren't dying his apostles. This world will once again. He gasped for breath. He mumbled the words as he died. Arietta furrowed her brows. Apostles. Is something wrong? The one to ask the question was Leticia. Azel and Laura were destroying the waypoint from within. Arietta, Leticia and Chiron remained outside. 
They were killing the soldiers that were lured outside. Arietta spoke. He spoke some ominous words before he died. What did he say? It was a religious story. He said he isn't dying. Basically, he said he'll come back to life as a Tynes apostle. That was the gist of his story. I want to say you shouldn't worry about such nonsense. But, Leticia furrowed her brows. It does make me worry. We'll have to tell the others about this. A Tynes revival had taken 100 hours. Two weeks had passed from that event, and Azul's party had destroyed 11 waypoints. That wasn't all. The members of the Guardian Shadows from all over the continent sent reports stating their victory. The good news didn't end there. Nibirus and Kieran had left the Plane of Darkness. Regus turned his back on Atain. Despite all the good news, Azul's party couldn't shed the ominous feeling. There are 144 waypoints left. Chiron mumbled to himself. After Atain had been revived, they had pushed themselves a bit harder. In total, they had destroyed 80 waypoints to the Road of Darkness. They had greatly reduced the mobility of the Dragon Demon King worshippers. So why hasn't Atain and Almeric stepped forward? In fact, none of the high-ranked officers are coming out. I believe they are trying to stop us with outside members only. When Azul's party attacked a waypoint, the Plane of Darkness couldn't send any reinforcements. In the beginning, Azel used Extreme Extinction to disable the waypoint, then their party started the attack. They hadn't failed once using this strategy. However, it was a different story when the other members of the Guardian Shadows attacked a waypoint. Even if they tried to end it quickly, one or two mistake gave the other side enough time to bring in reinforcements. I can understand why Atain isn't coming out, but Almeric isn't coming out either. We haven't seen any high rank officers recently. I can't believe this, but it seems they're no longer prioritizing the defense of the waypoints. Why? There are two possibilities. I wonder what function the Road of Emptiness serves. Maybe, the Road of Emptiness isn't important to Atain's plan. If what Euron had said was true, Atain didn't plan on recreating the Dragon Demon War. His goal was to create a world where no one would be able to carry out evil. Chiron spoke. If Atain has a substitute for the Road of Emptiness, Euron wouldn't have gone through the trouble of stealing the White Flame Phoenix. I agree with you on that point. Atain didn't have a dragon demon weapon that boasted excellent mobility like Azul's storm dragon's wings. Atain could imitate the abilities of the dragon demon weapons with his magic, but there was a clear limit to what he could do. Above all else, he wouldn't be able to take his companions along. The difference in what he could do was stark, depending on the presence or absence of the dragon demon weapons. Chiron spoke. As expected, it means he doesn't care if the road of emptiness is destroyed. I believe so. I am unsure as to the reason why that would be true. This is a tricky situation. I'm also unsure as to whether we should modify our strategy. If he isn't fixated on saving the road of emptiness, we might be wasting our time. I disagree with that opinion. Why? At Azul's question, Chiron explained his reasoning. Let us say he is letting us destroy the waypoints in order to buy time. Even if that's true, that plan only makes sense if we are capable of invading the plane of darkness right now. Him, Atain might be enacting a massive magic ritual within the plane of darkness right now. Would they be able to stop Atain if they went to the plane of darkness right now? It would be impossible. If it was possible, they would have already invaded the plane of darkness before Atain was revived. Unless they were able to take the road of emptiness, it was almost impossible to lead a large force there. It was a land of intense cold, and not many would be able to survive the journey there. On the other hand, numerous dragon demon king worshippers lived within the plane of darkness. As the great darkness as foundation, countless defensive magic had been erected over the years. A magician's power depended on how much resource one had. A magician's power changed in thousand different ways depending on those resources. When one considered that Atain was within the Dragon Demon Castle, his power would be impossible to assess. Above all else, it would be impossible to create a scenario where Azel would be able to fight a one-on-one -on -one battle with Atain. Chiron spoke. We have to continue our original plan. We'll destroy the waypoints to decrease the mobility of our enemies. 
The only difference is that we'll speed up the timeline. Let's take advantage of their new approach. The goal of Azul's party hadn't changed. They would decrease the elbow room of their enemies by destroying the waypoints. Then they would take advantage of their newfound freedom to destroy the pillars of darkness. It doesn't matter what Atane is planning. In the end, he has to rely on the large magical system called the Great Darkness. Our enemies will come out once it is threatened. At that time, we'll use the remaining Guardian Shadows to overwhelm our enemies with numbers. That's true, but, Chiron spoke correctly. Despite knowing this, something didn't sit right with Azel. Chiron spoke to Azel, who was deep in thought. There is something that also worries me. Are you talking about Ragus, who seems to be a friendly force? He said someone will come towards us in the near future. He didn't reveal the identity of this person, and he never said when this person will come to us. When Leticia mobilized the Guardian Shadows to save Niberus, Ragus had appeared. He told Leticia that he had left a Tynes camp. He also explained his intention. I'm not saying we should join sides to fight Atane. I don't care if we do, but I'm sure you guys are hesitant to do that. Maybe, Azel might believe me. On the other hand, you guys might be suspicious that I might be unwittingly a pawn in a Tynes plan. I'll follow the young lady to the Alberton Forest. My party member, who wants to be your ally, will search you out. What do you mean by that? You'll have the pleasure of finding it out on your own. I want to tell you, but this person doesn't want me to say anything. I'll let you discover it on your own. After he spoke those words, Ragus had left. They hadn't heard any news in regards to Ragus after that. Chiron spoke. Do we need to go to the Alberton Forest? I'm thinking about it. What do you think, Duke? I think there are two reasons why we have to go there. Him. Are you talking about Ragus's whereabout? No. Ragus's whereabout isn't that important. We don't have to actively search for him. Why? When Azel became puzzled, Chiron gave an explanation. We are already keeping surveillance on the waypoints. If Ragus runs into trouble with the Dragon Demon King worshippers, we'll know immediately. The more urgent task is to track down the whereabouts of Rishu. Hmm. Azel ruminated over Chiron's words. He knew that the possibility of facing Rishu as an enemy was real, but he didn't want to bring that issue to the fore. As someone that learned the dragon soul from him, I don't want him to be our enemy. However, it wouldn't surprise me if we found out that he is working with Atane already. I don't want to be taken unawares like the time when Atane ambushed us. You were right. Azel had been sniped by Atane, because he had been taken completely unawares. A part of the reason was the fact that Atane had sniped him with a very high-ranked spell. However, the bigger share of the blame lie with the fact that he hadn't worried about the possibility of Atane being revived at that point in time. It had been a near-fatal mistake. He couldn't make the same mistake again. We have to check if the worst possible scenario has come to fruition. Alberton might agree with Atane's cause. There is a possibility that Alberton might have become our enemy. Do you really think that'll happen? Azel became surprised. It was a possibility that Azel hadn't thought about. From Azel's perspective, Alberton had never been his enemy. During the Dragon Demon War, Alberton had been steadfast in being a neutral party. What if Alberton had become their enemy? It would be an unimaginable calamity. Chiron was in charge of coming up with strategies, so he had thought about the worst-case scenario. I want to ask you a question in response. Azel, what do you think he'll do? You know about Alberton more than me. Him. Azel had a serious expression on his face as he mulled over the question. This was too important to do otherwise. I cannot say that the possibility is zero. The current situation differs from what occurred during the Dragon Demon War. As expected, you think so too. The world Atane was trying to create didn't clash with Alberton's ideals. Every member of the society would be monitored by the enormous system. Their thoughts and actions would be under surveillance. As soon as someone broke a law, a punishment would be given out. Basically, the weak beings being protected by Alberton would be guaranteed their survival. It is as you've said, Duke. We have to check this out as soon as possible. I don't want you to go by yourself. If Alberton has decided to work with Atane, your life will be forfeit by going there. 
I already know that. You don't have to do that. Suddenly, a voice intruded between the two of them. It wasn't a voice of a living person. It was more like a message that was delivered through magical energy. In a flash, the chairs fell over. They unsheathed their swords in a flash as they got into a battle stance. However, the two of them couldn't find their foe. The voice was so close, yet they couldn't feel the gaze or the magical energy of this being. I'm over here, she spoke towards the two tense men. Somehow, Azel thought the voice sounded familiar. Can it be? In front of the shaken Azel, a form rose up from the ground. She was like an illusion as she passed through the earth. Azel became shocked when he saw her. You are. It has been a while. In human standards, she looked like a 14 or 15 year old dragon demon girl. She had long white hair, and grey horns. Her eyes and dragon demon stone was slate grey. However, everything about her had no substance. She was translucent as one could see through her. She looked like a ghost or an illusion being projected by magic. Azel knew very well as to who this dragon demon girl was. Kealia, you remembered me. She was a Tyne's third queen, and she had possessed magic that made her on par with the dragon demon generals. She had made the human allied forces shake in fear. She was such an existence, yet she was laughing in front of Azel like a shy girl. Chapter 225. Old Revenants. Part 3. In the final battle at the Dragonhorn Fortress, Azel had defeated Kealia. He didn't personally defeat her. Azel was tasked with the important task of occupying Athene in an one-on-one -on -one battle. This was why he had joined forces with his comrades to fight Kealia, and she had received a grievous wound. After they were able to mortally wound her, Azel felt something was off. It had been too easy. Even if he received support from his comrades, she hadn't been alone. The soldiers of the Dragon Demon King's army had supported her. Despite his fight against Kealia, Azel hadn't received any wounds from the fight. She had attacked him with fearsome force. There had been several close calls during the battle, but if one considered the skill displayed by Kealia in this past, the battle had ended quite easily. Originally, he was going to leave his comrades in mid-battle. He was supposed to disengage and head towards Athene. However, the battle had gone too well. He had been dumbfounded at the time. Azel queried her. As expected, you didn't die that time. I died. Him, do I look alive to you? Kealia raised her hand as she spoke. He could see through her. She looked like an illusion. Azel spoke. You don't look dead. You look like a projection that can be created by a magician. I cannot tell if you are dead or alive with the information available to me. I see. Ragus Opa was confused by my form. But you immediately recognized it. Ragus Opa. Azel's expression turned peculiar. Kealia cackled. I've already died once. I have no plans on playing the part of a Tyne's queen. That is why I call him Opa now. I really want to discuss what you stated, but we aren't in a cordial relationship. May we change the relationship between us? As I've said earlier, I'm already dead. You want me to trust your word? I never expected to run into such a problem. Maybe, the person next to you might trust my words a little bit more than you. At her words, Azel looked towards Chiron. Since he was still guarded against Kealia, he didn't turn his head. He used a spirit order technique to look at Chiron. When he did so, he saw that Chiron had an odd expression on his face. Why are you making such an expression, Duke? Azel, please speak. I'm not sure what relationship you had with her in the past. Even I've heard of her name, but she saved your life before. What? It was when Ragus almost killed you. She was the one that rescued you. If it wasn't for this young lady, we might have been wiped out right then and there. Azel became surprised. At the time, he had lost consciousness, and he had lost track of things. He had never bothered to get a detailed account on what had happened. Still, he had never expected such a thing to have occurred. Kealia fidgeted as she let out a bright smile. Geez, you referred to me as young lady. It has been a while since I've been called that. There wasn't a single ounce of tension in her attitude. He couldn't keep up his hostility towards her. The current Kealia was entirely different from the Kealia from the Dragon Demon War. 
It almost made him skeptical as to whether she really was Kealia. When Azel faced her on the battlefield, she had an icy expression on her face. As a magician, she had been as powerful as Ornsaurus and Baldazar. Her might had made the humans tremble in fear. However, she was currently acting like a young girl. He couldn't get used to it. In fact, when he lost to Ragus, he had heard someone's voice before he had lost consciousness. He remembered white clothes billowing in front of him, and he had heard the voice of. It was you. Yes, I was being fair. I saved both of you once. You were the one that saved Ragus. Azel picked up on the small hint within her words. He was able to assess the situation. Kealia let out a light laughter. That's right. All right. For now, I'll believe that you aren't hostile towards us. Azel retracted his hostility. There was a voice in the corner of his mind that said she was a danger to him. He was having a hard time suppressing that voice, but she had saved him once before. This was why he couldn't chase her away without hearing what she had to say. Still, you referred to Ragus as Ragus Opa. I don't know about that. From what I heard from Carlos, you used a reincarnation technique to continue living multiple lives. You've lived longer than Ornsaurus. All four dragon demon generals had lived for over a thousand years. The oldest of the bunch was Ornsaurus. When Azel compared Kealia to Ornsaurus, she jumped up and down in indignation. Ah Mu Mu, what are you saying? Ornsaurus lived for over two thousand years. How can you compare a young woman to such an old man? My previous experience in life is passed on to my next life. However, I'm always born as a different being. I'm always different from my past selves. Moreover, I've stopped reincarnating for a while now. Him. Well, let's just say I believe you. It isn't about believing me or not. I'm stating a fact. All right. All right. Azel raised both his hands in surrender. Then he asked her a question. I guess it is time to hear why you've searched me out. Didn't you hear it from Ragus Opa? Him, perhaps. Are you the other person that wants to be our ally? That's right. I parted company with Aiton like Ragus Opa. Is it really unbelievable? In truth, I'm having a hard time believing in it. What do we have to do to make you change your mind? I knew this would be a problem when coming here. However, I don't have a good idea as to how to solve this problem. During the Dragon Demon War, Kealia had killed countless people from the Human Alliance. How could he forget about his grudge against her? It would be asking too much of him to accept Kealia as an ally. In the case of Laura, the situation had been different. Unlike her, Kealia had lived within Azul's era, and he had built up enmity against her. Kealia looked at Azel for a brief moment, then she spoke as she sighed. Let's change the topic for now. I have other things I want to talk to you about. What do you want to talk about? I'm talking about Alberton's choice. Are you saying you know his answer? If you don't believe me, you can go confirm it with Alberton. One of my reasons for coming here was the fact that I had to inform you about Alberton's stance. I took on the role of a messenger. Of course, I have my own business with you too. Azel and Chiron had no choice, but to pay attention to what she was saying now. Kealia spoke. Alberton plans to stick with the stance he had during the Dragon Demon War. He'll maintain his neutrality. Yes. However, the situation is completely different right now. If Atain achieves his goal, Alberton Forest won't be able to remain free. Even if Atain had won the Dragon Demon War, the Alberton Forest would have remained off limits to humans. The Alberton Forest would have continued to be one of the demonic lands. Of course, Atain might have united the whole continent, and he might started a war with Alberton at a later date. At the very least, the Alberton Forest had been free from the conflicts that arose during the Dragon Demon War. However, the current situation posed a different problem. Atain was trying to change the laws that govern the whole world. He developed a countermeasure to that problem. How? Do you remember Carlos traded away a Tyne's technique? Technique? Do you mean the curse that allows one to subordinate others to the great darkness? Yes. How is that a countermeasure against what Atain is trying to accomplish? The technique is also how one creates the great darkness. What? In a flash, Azel and Chiron became surprised. He had heard something unimaginable. Kealia spoke. 
Atain sealed the immortal transcendent beings as pillars when making the great darkness. One needs a firm home base and long years to create the system. One has to continuously supply resources to create it. This is why one can't recreate the great darkness in terms of size and completeness. This doesn't mean it is impossible to copy the system called the great darkness. Carlos had reverse engineered Aten's technique. Carlos had done so to free Azel from the curse that would have subordinated him to the great darkness. This was how Carlos was able to create the guardian shadows. Since he didn't have the time or the resource to create the great darkness from scratch, he created his system by leaning on the power of the already existing great darkness. Alberton was also an archmage that had lived for a very long time. He had accumulated many techniques and resources during this time. In his deal with Carlos, he was able to receive a Tyne's curse from Carlos. On top of that, Atain had installed the Road of Darkness as a gesture of good faith during the Dragon Demon War. Alberton researched both techniques, and he was able to come up with a way to copy the Great Darkness. Unlike the Great Darkness that surrounds the continent, this copy will only surround the Alberton Forest. Alberton received support from the residents of the forest, and they had invested in this system for the past dozen of years. At the very least, the system would be capable of remembering information about magical energy and the beings making up the system. At most, it would remember souls like the Guardian Shadows. If Alberton uses this, he might be able to resist the laws that'll be forced up on the world. He'll be able to create an independent territory. I see. Since Alberton secured an exit strategy for his people, he no longer cares about the outside world. However, that has been Alberton's stance since the beginning. It can't be helped. Alberton didn't interfere with the human world, and he prevented the outside world from interfering with his forest. Alberton had always had this attitude. Azel had used Alberton's territory to his advantage, so he couldn't disparage Alberton's choice. Still, I was very surprised by it. Are you talking about Alberton's skill in magic? It doesn't surprise me. He lived less years than Atain, but he is still a mythological figure. This is why he was able to make the Alberton Forest. I'm not admiring Alberton's abilities. Then, I'm talking out the part where Carlos Rizester was able to decipher a Tyne's curse. Alberton wouldn't have been able to grade the copy of the Great Darkness if he hadn't made the deal with Carlos. I was able to find out what kind of life, Carlos had lived after the Dragon Demon War. He really was amazing. At her words, sadness and longing was reflected in his eyes for a brief moment. Any amount of thanks wouldn't be enough. Carlos had dedicated his life to saving Azel, and he had suffered through hellish pain to protect the future. He had done it voluntarily. If he hadn't been there, Azel wouldn't have been able to reach this point. Carlos. It wasn't just him. His descendants had suffered tragedies, while he was asleep. Euron was a Tyne's reincarnation, yet he sacrificed his life to open up a path for Azel. He had incurred so much debt that it was beyond description. There was only one way to honor his fallen friends. It was the same during the Dragon Demon War where his comrades had entrusted the future to him. He had to defeat Atain. The only way to repay all of them was to end this long fight. It's all good. Alberton will keep his neutrality, so the worst case scenario will not come to pass. However, him, can I talk to you about myself? All right, go for it. He was about to say, I cannot accept you. However, Kealia preempted him. He had to give her the opportunity to speak. It is as I've said earlier. I died during the Dragon Demon War. Kealia started her story from the point after her death. Regus put his hammer on his shoulder as he spoke. You are pretty good. As expected, the young ones are full of fighting spirit. You really are amazing. There was a middle-aged dragon mage and warrior sitting on the ground. He had white hair, and he possessed dark blue eyes, horn and dragon demon stone. One of his leg was broken, so he used his sword as a crutch to get up. It was Havan. He was the one that had requested a duel with Azel when he came to the Alberton Forest. After a sparring match with Regus, Havan admitted his defeat. It wasn't just Havan. Other inured dragon mage and warriors were strewn about on the floor. When they heard Regus had arrived, they wanted a match with him. 
Regus never turned down a fight, so he agreed to every single match. He enjoyed it. Would you have done this if I wasn't here? You guys are too reckless with how you treat your body. The one that was grumbling was Cybane. Aside from him, no one had extreme healing ability within the forest. Before he had awakened his dragon soul, magicians had acted as healers. However, the process had been slow compared to what Cybane could do now. Regus spoke after he put down 20 consecutive dragon mage and warriors. This place is quite fun. I like it here. This place is well suited for you, Sir Regus. I'm not a dragon demon general, so you don't have to call me by my title. You can just refer to me as Regus. Weren't you a king of a nation before you became a dragon demon general? It is old news. I don't plan on becoming a king in the near future. You make it sound as if becoming a king is as easy as snapping your finger. It isn't hard. You just periodically kill people that you don't like, and you'll easily become a king. Regus had also lived for a very long time. He was over a thousand years old. Before he served Atane as his king, he had reigned over a region of this continent as a ruler. There was a time when he had fought against the forces of Almeric. Anyways, you are looking better. It seems life here suits you. I won't deny that fact. Also, Cybane hesitated for a moment before he spoke. I want to thank you for bringing my daughter here. The little miss decided to come here. I just followed her. I didn't do much. Regus waved his hand. Cybane smirked. You are always the same. Somehow, that is comforting. You've changed a lot. I like your current self much more than your past self. Thank you. If I am not overstepping the bounds, could you tell me what you are planning to do now? 